Order, please. We'll now begin with the daily routine, beginning with presenting and reading of petitions. The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to table a petition asking the government to analyze the effects of free ambulance rides in various jurisdictions to determine the effect of eliminating ambulance fees, and I have fixed my signature as well. Petition is tabled. Presenting reports of committees. Tabling reports, regulations, and other papers. Statements by ministers. Government notices of motion. The Honourable Minister of African Nova Scotian Affairs and the Public Service Commission. Mr. Speaker, may I make an introduction, please? Permission granted. Thank you. Joining us today in the gallery opposite, or in the East Gallery, are staff from the Irving Shipbuilding, as well as the coordinator and students from the Pathways to Shipbuilding program. I'd ask them to please rise as I call their name. Ms. Audra McCreesh, Mr. Tom Ornsby, Ms. Shelley Fashion, Mr. Juno Beals, and Ms. Satina Dobb. I'd like the host to give them a round of applause and thank you. Honourable Minister of African Nova Scotian Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas in September 2018, 20 African Nova Scotian participants took, pa took part in the Pathways to Shipbuilding, which is a two year program to study welding and secure careers with the Halifax shipyards. And whereas Pathways to Shipbuilding is a collaborative collaboration between government, Irving Shipbuilding, Nova Scotia Community College, the Nova Scotia Apprenticeship Agency, East Preston Power Empowerment Academy, and the CWB Welding Foundation. And whereas this June, all 20 participants will be graduating from the Nova Scotia Community College and will begin work on building the Royal Canadian Navy Fleet. And so therefore be it resolved that members of this House of Assembly join me in congratulating the Pathways to Shipbuilding participants in wishing them the best of luck in their future careers. And I'd like to add one other thing. They are going to be the first to work on the new William Hall when that is finished. So thank you. Yeah. I ask for a waiver of notice on passage without debate. There has been a request for waivers. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Lands and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the wildfires in Australia continue to burn, threatening forests, ecosystems and homes, and whereas the Department of Lands and Forestry has some of the top wildlife wildfire fighting expertise in the country available in our department who are ready to support efforts to fight the wildfires burning across Australia and are proudly available to assist other countries that may need help in an emergency. And whereas we recently had three firefighters return from Australia, Paul Schnur from the Shubenacadie office, Terry White from the Windsor office, and Kirk Webster from the Kentville office, and have six more currently deployed in Australia, Bernie Morrissey from the Waverley office, Jamie Brown from the Milton office, Jacob Penny from the Lunenburg office, Matt Gallant from the Parsborough office, Brennan Ash from the Bible Hill office, and Jim Rutterham from the Milton office. Therefore, be it resolved, all members of the host of assembly thank the Department of Lands and Forestry staff for their diligent work and extensive experience in helping battle the wildfires in Australia. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Lands and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Nova Scotians are reflecting on the importance of wildlife and biodiversity on World Wildlife Day, and whereas the theme of World Wildlife Day for 2020, sustaining all life on Earth, encompasses all wild animal and plant species as critical parts of our planet's ecological health, 
And whereas Nova Scotians continue to be engaged in conservation and recovery efforts such as public forums and presentations on species at risk, therefore be it resolved all members of the House of Assembly celebrate World Wildlife Day by recognizing the importance of biodiversity and the need for shared stewardship of our natural resources and by engaging Nova Scotians in conservation efforts. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver, notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Contrary minded nay. Motion is carried. Now move on to introduction to bills. The Honourable Minister of Finance. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting Certain Financial Measures. The Honourable Minister of Finance begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting Certain Financial Measures. Bill number 243, an act respecting certain financial measures. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Schedule A of Chapter 1 of the Acts of 2018, the Education Act, respecting mental health wellness kits. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Schedule A of Chapter 1 of the Acts of 2018, the Education Act Respecting Mental Health Wellness Kits. Bill number 244, an act to amend Schedule A of Chapter 1 of the Acts of 2018, the Education Act Respecting Mental Health Wellness Kits. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill titled An Act to Dissolve the Brookside Cemetery Commission. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg West begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Dissolve the Brookside Cemetery Commission. Bill number 245, An Act to Dissolve the Brookside Cemetery Commission. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. We'll now move on to notices of motion. Statements by members. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This year marks an incredible 100 years that Kinsmen Clubs throughout Canada have been operating under their motto of serving the community's greatest need. It goes without saying that this wonderful organization is a national beacon of charity and selflessness. The Liverpool branch of Kinsmen is one of Nova Scotia's oldest chapters of this club and will celebrate its 75th anniversary in November. To commemorate this special occasion, kinsman Gary Levy, Brian Godfrey, Chad Bourgeois, and Earl Lawrence recently visited elementary schools in Queens County to visit with students and pass out free treats of milk, balloons, and tattoos. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize the generosity of the Liverpool kinsmen and thank them for all they do for their community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. I was grateful to attend the launch this morning of the North End Community Health Centre's new mobile outreach street health mobile clinic, a shiny purpose-built van with headroom, an examining bed, a sink, a refrigerator and technology to connect with electronic medical records and more. It's quite an upgrade from the red Toyota van that Mosh began with 10 years ago. This new clinic is funded by TELUS through its Health for Good program. With a yellow sunflower on its back door, the clinic pays tribute to the founder of MOSH, the late Patty Malonson. Her family were there this morning, still grieving her loss and celebrating her impact. Her workmates and collaborators are still being inspired by her example to serve individuals experiencing homelessness with dignity and humility. With the upgrade to the MOSH clinic, they're now also dreaming and scheming about doing dental outreach, mental health outreach, and food delivery with their health centre colleagues. The North End Community Health Centre, like many nonprofits, is constantly innovating and connecting with new funding sources like TELUS, where government funds fall short. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Hans East. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Have you ever wondered what to cook that's quick and easy after a long day or wanted to try something new for dinner but not just sure what? Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, Robert Richardson has rec created a wonderful, wholesome Facebook page that can help with both these dilemmas and more. East Hands, cooking, East Hands Recipes and Cooking was an idea Robert had that came to fruition in May, and since its inception, over 6,000 members have joined the page. Each day, he asks a question of the day that is related to food and gets the group comment communicating with each other in a positive way and giving many new ideas to try in the kitchen. Every day, people post pictures of delicious food and others use the recipes, creating meals that they never would have otherwise. And the mm. feed feedback is very positive. The page often feels like you're sitting around a Sunday table with family and friends. Robert's desire to bring the community together through food not only shines through his Facebook group, but he also organized a sample night where members came together to try all the lovely dishes they had posted about. He organized some baking in December to give out to seniors who no longer have the ability to bake for themselves, and it was a huge success. I would like to thank Robert for creating a safe spot and uh, give him the warm welcome of the uh, warm regards of the House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with the unanimous consent of the House, we'd like to revert back to um, presenting and reading petitions for the NDP. Is it agreed? It is agreed. We'll now revert back to petitions. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, may I make an introduction? Permission granted. Uh, in the gallery opposite is Megan Boudreau, who's joined us today. Uh, Megan is a third-year psychology student at St. Mary's. After seeing anti-choice protests outside the Women's Choice Clinic at the Victoria General Hospital, she started this petition all by herself to fight for bubble zone legislation. I'm honoured to table that petition today. Please join me in welcoming Megan to the Legislature. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to table a petition regarding the implementation of a bubble zone law. The operative clause of which reads, we the undersigned ask the Government of Nova Scotia to pass bubble zone legislation to put a safe distance between protesters and patients. The legislation should prohibit interference within a defined access zone to be determined by regulations around a hospital, a clinic, a service provider's office or residence, or a premises prescribed by the regulations. I believe there are 150 signatures, and Mr. Speaker, I have affixed my signature to the petition as well. Petition is tabled. We will now go back to statements by members. The Honourable Member for sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Robert Rockwell, owner and publisher of the Parent Child Guide <coughs> newspaper. Robert and his team have been publishing the Parent Guide Child Guide newspaper since 1995, and on April 22nd, they will celebrate their 25th anniversary. Parent Child Guide newspaper is one of, if not the oldest and largest, locally owned family newspaper in Metro. The newspaper contains positive, helpful, and informative articles written by local professionals, including doctors, psychologists, counselors, educators, and health consultants. Topics include general health, self-help suggestions, and child safety, to name a few. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask that all members of the House of Assembly join me in congratulating Robert and his team at Parent Child Guide on the success of serving the community for over 25 years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Uh, we have with us in the East Gallery a very special and unique um, young, young woman that I've known since she was 10 years old. She has survived many scary encounters with wild animals in Africa, including elephants, zebras, rhinos, and hyenas. We, uh, she is joined today by her mother, Nancy Sievert, and her father, Kirk Sievert, and George Crocker. Please stand up and receive the welcome of the House. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Mr. Speaker, in recognition of the International Wildlife Day, I rise today to recognize the work of a very special young woman from my riding, Olivia Sievert. I have known Olivia since she was 10 years old. She is a very accomplished young woman. She has a master's with honors in conservation and ecology. 
She has been working uh, in Africa for the past five years with, African, with Africa Parks, uh, the largest NGO in Africa. She has recently received a great promotion as a wildlife research and conservation manager in Malawi. Olivia's main objective has been to reintroduce endangered cheetahs back into the wild in Malawi. Mr. Speaker, I ask that the members of this house join me in applauding Olivia for her unique talents, stamina, genuine concern for the conservation of wildlife in Africa. Thank you. The Honorable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pardon me. So I rise today to congratulate the ILE Community Radio, members of its planning committee, and the many volunteers for their recent presentation of Inspiring Women in Song, a concert to celebrate International Women's Day. The concert, Mr. Speaker, showcased several award-winning Nova Scotian female artists and enthusiastic music fans were treated to an evening of original music and entertainment at the Spats Theatre. Over the past two years, CIOE Community Radio has presented regular concerts and community events that have all promoted talent of Nova Scotia artists. I'd like to thank all the members of the House of Assembly, or I'd like to ask that all the members of the House of Assembly join me in congratulating CIOE Community Radio and their volunteers for all the hard work and dedication to the arts and culture that they've shown towards province of Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just a correction for the record, the Honourable Member was from Sackville Beaverbank, not Sackville Cobquid. My apologies. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, February 19th was I Read Canada Day across the country, which is an annual event started by children's author Eric Walters, dedicated to getting kids to read at least 15 minutes of a book by a Canadian author. And the spirit of I Read Canada, I want to celebrate just a few of the amazing authors we have right here in Nova Scotia. Authors who have in written incredible books for kids, Shantae Grant, Budge Wilson, Sherry Fitch, and May Ann Francis. Fiction writers like the amazing Amy McKay, Alexander McLeod, and Amy Spurway, who released her debut novel Crow this past year to great acclaim. Non-fiction writers like Rebecca Rose, Stephen Kimber, and Chris Benjamin. Poets from all over the province, Alison Smith, Rebecca Thomas, and Sue Goyette, to name just a few. Catherine Banks, Hannah Moskovich, uh, Josh McDonald, and Michael Melsky all write for the stage, and their work has been seen all over North America and beyond. I'll go further and say I read, no, uh, uh, I read Dartmouth North and celebrate authors John Pierce, Robert John Schwartzman, and Guy Lee Johnson, who have each published books in the last year or so. Mr. Speaker, there's an incredible array of writers in Nova Scotia and many excellent book publishers. Let's celebrate them and challenge ourselves to read at least 15 minutes of a local author the next time we pick up a book. The Honourable Member for Guysboro, Eastern Shore, Trackety. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in recognition of the work of Tara Reddick and Tanya Pelly, who are doing, uh, are doing with the circles of support and change in support of the African Nova Scotian communities of Sunnyville, Lincolnville, and Upper Big Trackety. Circles of Support and Change is a five-year initiative of the Antigonish Women's Resource Centre focused on community-based and community-led support to women in underserved rural communities. The project has hosted a community information session in Sunnyville and an advisory committee meeting in Upper Big Trackety. There was also a social at the Lincolnville Community Centre with the theme honouring the black women of our communities, which by all accounts was a fun and empowering evening. Circles of Support and Change is an ambitious, much needed project and Tara and Tanya are definitely the ladies for the job. Most importantly, they're listening to the community and what it wants and needs, encouraging anyone interested in participating in any context to contact them. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank Tara and Tanya, Tanya and wish Circles of Support and Change much success. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize and thank the Coal Harbour Parks and Trails Association for all of the dedication and volunteer hours its members give to our community. After Hurricane Dorian, there was some damage to the Salt Marsh Trail in Coal Harbour, a trail spanning six and a half kilometres from Coal Harbour to Lawrencetown. These repairs happened with the generosity of Jason Rafuse of Rafuse Excavating, Emergency Funding from HRM, and the Trans-Canada Trail Foundation. And of course, with our association chair, Michael McFadden, and many other members and non-member volunteers. 
The trail sees over 30,000 visitors annually, and the association prides themselves on making the trail as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in thanking the Coal Harbour Parks and Trails Association and all of their volunteers for all that they do for our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Armdale. Mr. Speaker, I rise to recognize John McGowan for his invaluable contributions to our school communities. Mr. McGowan, as he's known to students, is a physical education and core French teacher at Springvale Elementary School. He's a lifelong athlete and passionate about promoting good health and well-being. John has taught after school karate at Springvale, helped launch Kids Run Club at the school for over 15 years, and has been a driving force behind the school's yearly fundraisers for the Terry Fox Foundation. In past years, John has helped encourage donations from the school community by promising to dye his hair pink once their donation target was met. This fall, the buzzer claimed all of his hair at the High Five Assembly as the school raised $12,000 for the foundation. Mr. Speaker, that brings the Springvale Elementary community's donation over the last 15 years to over $130,000. That's an incredible amount for a great cause. I ask all members of this House of Assembly to join me in thanking John McGowan for his efforts and the difference he makes to enriching our communities. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge the life of the late Captain Joshua B. Paris, who was taken from his family and friends far too soon. Joshua per Paris had a distinguished military career with the Air Cadets, beginning his career with the 689 Hanley Page Cadets in Parisboro and spending many summers at CFB Greenwood Training Centre. Captain Paris assumed command of the 154 Amherst Squadron on September 15, 2015, but sadly, six months later, on March 15, 2016, he passed away in a tragic car accident. <clears throat> to memorialize Joshua's dedication and passion for the cadets, the fourth annual Memorial Golf Tournament will be held this year to raise money for bursaries for students in the cadet program who wish to pursue post-secondary education. Please join me in recognizing and honoring the life of Captain Joshua B. Paris for his dedication, his service, and the legacy that continues through his bursary and through his family. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to celebrate Tribal Boxing Club, located on the upper level of Farrell Hall in Dartmouth North. Owners Bridget Stevens and Jim Maloney have built an incredible community of amateur and professional boxers, including many young people from the North Dartmouth community. While Bridget holds several different levels of classes, she doesn't want anyone to not try boxing because of financial difficulty. Tribal offers free training to any Indigenous person, any youth from the neighbourhood, and anyone who is facing unemployment or underemployment. As Jim explained, many who come to the club treat their boxing like medicine. It's healthy and healing. I got to train at Tribal last week. While there, I witnessed boxers younger and older with an incredible diversity of abilities and backgrounds. There was a baby crawling and a dog running around, and everyone shared the space as a big extended family. Bridget expertly guided us in warm-ups and skills training and was supportive and encouraging, fun and challenging. Mr. Speaker, my jab-jab power hook has never been better. I am grateful for what Tribal Boxing gives to the people in our community and thank Bridget Stevens and Jim Maloney for their generous commitment to the boxers there. The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize Ben and Michelle Jolie, owners and operators of Joel Carr Security Services in Timberley. Ben and Michelle have worked hard to build a company based on attitude, integrity, and service, and have always been generous and charitable with their support to the local community. I am pleased to report Michelle and Ben are once again extending their generosity by donating security guards to Shelter Movers, an organization that assists predominantly women and children escaping domestic abuse in Halifax. Sadly, three to four families require assistance every week in HRM to relocate because their safety is at risk. The key components to ensuring a safe and smooth transition for women and children who access this service is to find a safe place to live and a safe way to get there. The Joel Carr security guards offer a safe passage to a new environment for these families. Mr. Speaker, I'd like the members of the House of Assembly to join me in acknowledging and thanking Michelle and Ben for donating their expertise to assist and care for vulnerable citizens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to commend Jason Church of Church's and his family of Church's Value Foods and Marion Bridge, who scheduled traditional Cape Breton winter activities for their employees. Church's Value Foods employs several of Cape Breton University's international students from India who have not had the chance to experience winter activities. 
For many of them, this is their first Canadian winter. Jason and his family took the group ice fishing and tobogganing, which was a first for all, not only in this great example of an employer initiating team building with their employees, but it went a step further as it introduced the group of international students to our cultural traditions. I stand here today, Mr. Speaker, to praise Jason and his family for taking the time to go above and beyond as an employer and encourage him to continue with these exemplary acts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sydney, Whitney Pier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise in my place to congratulate uh, Cape Breton teacher Carter Chesson, who uh, has been named the 2020 Music Counts Teacher of the Year. Uh, Chesson uh, is a teacher at uh, Alison Bernard Memorial High School, and he was the teacher behind the program uh, that saw Emma Stevens uh, perform Blackbird in Mi'kmaq. Uh, both Emma and uh, Carter have traveled around the world as a result of that, uh, and Carter is involved with a number of other uh, initiatives within the school to revive the Mi'kmaq language. So as part of the award, uh, he receives $10,000 and a $10,000 uh, donation uh, to uh, the school. Uh, so I'm, I rise my place today and, I, and I ask all members of the host to congratulate Carter on this amazing accomplishment uh, and uh, his continued success. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise today in the legislature to recognize Russell McIntosh and the great customer service at Century Saw Marine Limited in Glasgow, a company that opened its doors in 1967. There are companies that are known for good customer service, and then there are companies like Century Saw and Marine Limited that take service to the next level. Their experience, dedication, and commitment to customers is remarkable. Customer loyalty is Russell's ultimate goal. Customers come first in everything the company does, and every employee values their relationship with all customers. Employees go above and beyond to help customers find what they need. McIntosh has always known that good customer service encourages customers to remain loyal. It's undeniable that a well-trained, positive customer service team can make your company the best version of itself. Owner Russell McIntosh has always known that there is great value in ensuring you deliver a positive customer service. Russell's service philosophy is a model to emulate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Waverly Fall River Beaverbank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 25 years ago, Raymond and Joanne Kelly Duenell began a community food drive to honor Joanne's sister, Ruth Ann, who had passed away from cancer. Lakeview area children, accompanied by adults, go door to door collecting donations for the Lions Christmas Express, helping those in Lakeview, Windsor Junction, Waverly, Fall River, and Wellington areas. Mr. Speaker, this will be the last food drive organized by the Duenelles and they were, recogn and were recognized by the community for what they have done over the last two years, or two and a half decades. Following uh, fellow residents have st stepped in forward to lead the drive for next year. Mr. Speaker, I invite all members of the legislature to join, join me in thanking Ray and uh, Joanne Kelly Dunwell for creating a community tradition and honoring her sister, Ruth Ann. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to recognize Don Ferris, Lisa Emery, and Michelle Harrison, organizers of the International Women's Day Luncheon in Amherst, which will be held next Monday at 12 noon at the Lion's Den. There will be a free meal with guest speaker, Cumberland YMCA CEO, Trina Clark. This year's theme is hashtag each for equal and will help bring awareness to the contribution of women in our community as well as gender equality. These three women, among many others, are very active in our community on committee and volunteer work. They're a great example of strong women who want to make a difference in our community and who stand up for gender equality. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank them for their continued work and dedication to this cause, and I encourage all women and men to celebrate International Women's Day, a day, and recognize the importance of equality and respect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge the work of Don Ostrom at the Dr. Kingston Memorial Clinic in Lordways. As the project coordinator of the Mind Body Spirit Grant Program, she delivered workshops and organized activities such as Music Care Level 1 training, which uses music to improve the quality of life of patients. The program also created Villa Vignettes, bringing students and seniors together through storytelling. Mr. Speaker, these valuable programs, which are community-based and volunteer-led, helped improve 
improve the quality of life for seniors in Richmond County by strengthening the importance of inclusiveness and social relationships. Mr. Speaker, Dawn is now in pursuit of new projects. I call upon all members of this House to wish her well. May she continue her valuable work improving the lives of people of all ages, reminding us how feeling socially connected plays an important role in our mental and physical well-being. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Thanks so much, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to take the opportunity to wish my best wishes to the graduating class at Madeline Simons Middle School. Uh, this year they've been busy fundraising for their grade nine trip. Uh, they're headed uh, out of province. They're going to uh, New Brunswick and PEI. Um, next year they're going to be uh, grade 10 students in high school and I just want to wish them all the best in their future academic endeavors. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dermot East. Mr. Speaker, permission to make an introduction? Permission granted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the West Gallery, we have members of the Nova Scotia Healthcare Crisis Group. Uh, their Facebook page currently has 9,421 members. In the West Gallery, the West Gallery, we have Leslie Tilly, Paula Minikin, Joan Hawkin, Janie Andrews, Cindy Moxham, Sabrina Thurlow, and Scott Parks. Please uh, receive the warm welcome of the House of Assembly. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize Dartmouth East entrepreneurs Colleen Farrell and John Gold, business partners at Colleen's Pub. On December 16, 2019, Colleen's Pub opened for business and has been thriving ever since. Colleen and John have built a business where anyone in the community feels like family as soon as they walk through the door. Just off the Waverly Road, customers step into a home away from home. And in true maritime spirit, Colleen's Pub features local talent through community events, such as an open mic kitchen party. Whether you stop in for a drink or a meal, Colleen's Pub is always a place to be surrounded by old and new friends. Mr. Speaker, local businesses are always appreciated in our community. Through Colleen and John's hard work, Dartmouth East is truly lucky to have this business in our backyard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Fairview, Clayton Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize two Fairview residents, Wanda and Andrew Allenbach, on the creation and success of their unique small business. In 2014, Wanda and Andrew started a family business called Sense and Sensibility. The name of their business is aptly named, given their passion for literary classics and their love for tea. The goal of their business is to recreate tea blends from various historical time periods using research and descriptions in novels. According to Wanda and Andrew, they want everyone to not only enjoy an excellent cup of tea, but to also learn a little bit of history in the process. Consumers have been enchanted with this unique product, and in 2017 and 18, Sense and Sensibility won bronze in the Best of Halifax Best Tea and silver in 2019 in the same category. So Mr. Speaker, I ask the members of this host to join me in congratulating Wanda and Andrew on their continued success and their gr continued growing business. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadamid Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since 1980, the Wild Blueberry Producers Association has added a new name each year to the recognition book. This year's inductees were Jim and Judy Burgess, who operate Glenmore Farm in Middle Muscadabit. The Burgesses do not limit their resourcefulness to growing blueberries, although 70 acres of their 200-acre property is devoted for this. A retiree from the Department of Natural Resources, Jim also taps maple trees for syrup and grows and sells Christmas trees, while Judy manages farm logistics, bookkeeping, quality control, and the storefront. Strong believers in pollination, they have served on a joint pollination committee with beekeepers. The couple's leadership in entrepreneurial innovation, sustainable environment, and community economic development is highly deserving of recognition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, I rise to acknowledge the Shift Equity Conference taking place in Halifax March 6th and 7th. This free public conference is dedicated to advancing conversations about equity and accessibility and inequity and lack of accessibility in public space. It is organized annually by students in the Dalhousie University School of Planning. 
Saturday's conference street will happen on Goddard Street in the Halifax North Memorial Library and will investigate themes of racist inequality and exclusion in modern planning and the impacts of short-term rentals on affordable housing. Keynote speakers include Ted Rutland, Concordia professor and author of Displacing ba Blackness, Planning Power and Race in 20th Century Halifax, as well as David Walksmith, McGill professor, investigator and co-author of Short-Term Cities, Airbnb's Impact on Canadian Housing Markets. I encourage members of this House and members of the public to consider attending and engaging with these important issues facing residents of Halifax, Needham and beyond. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take a moment to recognize Kennedy, Ryan and Sherry Hensby for their outstanding childcare that they give to many in our community. Sherry provides daily care at home and treat Amber, Jacob, Quinny and my beautiful baby girl Isla with love and respect. The kids are forming lifelong part or friendships and Isla looks forward to going to Sherry's house every single day. Sherry's daughter, Kennedy and Ryan, or Roro as she's known, have become like family and babysit anytime we ask. So thank you to the Hensby's for all you do for just not just my family, but all the families in our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. If you look, if I'll... Uh, uh, bring the members' attention to the uh, West Gallery, where we have a familiar face joining us this afternoon, uh, the former member for Argyle Barrington, uh, and uh, Nova Scotia's best member of Parliament, my friend, <laughs> Chris Dontremont. So welcome, Chris, back to the House. The Honourable Member for Air Argyle Barrington. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président, un des grands piliers du développement économique et communautaire de la communauté acadienne et francophone de la Nouvelle-Écosse, Monsieur Noël Després a été nommé chancelier de l'Université Saint-Anne en novembre 2019. Monsieur Després est le président et chef de la direction de Como Seafoods, une entreprise influente dans le sud-ouest de la province. D'ailleurs, très impliqué dans le monde des affaires et dans sa communauté de Claire, Monsieur Depré a toutefois été impliqué auprès de Saint Anne comme président, euh, comme membre et président du Conseil des Gouverneurs, ainsi que le président de l'Association des Anciens des Amis. En 2016, Monsieur Depré fut présenté un doctorat honorifique en sciences administratives de l'Université Saint Anne. En tant que chancelier, il continuera d'être un actif ambassadeur pour Saint Anne. La cérémonie officielle d'installation aura lieu en mai euh, 2020 lors de la collation des grades de l'université. J'invite tous les membres de cette Assemblée à se joindre à moi pour féliciter M. Noël Després pour sa nomination comme chancelier et lui souhaiter plein de succès dans ce nouveau rôle. Merci, M. le Président. The Honourable Member for Northside Westbound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize North Sydney native Chris Lawless. In December, it was announced that Chris would be receiving the Carnegie Medal later in 2020. The Carnegie Medal is the highest honour for civilian heroism in the United States and Canada. On July 22, 2017, a tourist and her daughter were overwhelmed by rip current in Inverness, Nova Scotia. The woman's husband was soon followed by Chris. By the time Chris caught up, the husband was pulling his daughter in, but the wife was swept out further into the deeper water. Chris continued out 300 feet from shore, where he found the barely conscious woman. He brought her to the shoreline, where she received first aid treatment and transport to hospital. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members of the legislature to applaud a fellow Nova Scotian, his bravery and his selflessness. Nova Scotia is stronger because of people like Chris and the example they set for all of us. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to thank the New Germany and the Area Alliance Club for their support of the Canadian Blood Services donation clinics in their area. During the clinics, volunteers such as Deborah Featherby and Mike Kroos offer support in several ways. As well as welcoming people, they work the refreshment table to ensure that those who donate blood receive nutritional support once their donation was complete. Should donors have any challenges once they give blood, the Lions Club volunteers alert officials but are also trained to assist the themselves. 
Blood donor clinics are an extremely important part of our health care support system and would not always be possible if it was not for the work of volunteers. Mr. Speaker, I would ask that you and the members of this House of Assembly please join me in thanking the New Germany and Area Alliance Club for their ongoing support of blood donor clinics of, for the Canadian Blood Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as we near International Women's Day 2020, I rise today to express my belief that education is paramount in the prevention of sexualized human trafficking and sexual exploitation in our province. It is reported that Nova Scotia has the highest rate of sexualized human trafficking incidents in the country. The impact of this ruins communities and destroys lives. Mr. Speaker, educating young people about what sexualized human trafficking is and giving them the tools to combat it is crucial to saving lives. We can only stop sexualized human trafficking by ensuring our youth know the facts, know the signs, and know where to turn if confronted with situations that may result in sexual exploitation. Mr. Speaker, province-wide, consistent, factual education is the key to prevention. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Bridgewater Daycare Centre is celebrating its 50th anniversary this October. Over 20 dedicated staff work hard to fulfil the organization's mandate to provide families with a high-quality, affordable, caring and challenging environment. Many of the faces you see working there today are the same ones from 30 years ago. This is truly a testament to how much they love and are committed to their work with the children of Bridgewater and area. Mr. Speaker, the Centre continues to be a part of the community, visiting seniors at Hillside Pines, baking muffins for Seoul Harbour, fundraising for muscular dystrophy, collecting food for the food bank and packing shoe boxes for, for Samaritan's Purse, to name a few. Their children also experience art, music, literature, science and physical activity. Congratulations and thank you to the staff and board of directors for their commitment, kindness and enthusiasm. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Queen's County resident Judy Francis, who personifies the expression going above and beyond. Judy has worked at the Liverpool Bowling Centre for an impressive 40 years. She is not thought of as simply an employee, but is known as Judy of all trades, having been instrumental in the organization of many leagues at the centre over the years. She has worked tournaments, served as their statistician, facilitated the youth league, operated the lunch counter, and so much more. She is truly an icon in the bowling community. Mr. Speaker, I ask that members join me in applauding Judy as an unsung hero in Queens and thanking her for her tireless dedication to her job. She goes beyond what's expected and has most certainly left her mark on many generations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Colchester North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Lisa Patton from North River Colchester North grew up on a cattle farm in Onslow and was a member of the Onslow Belmont 4-H Club. She is the daughter of the late Ed Lorraine, Liberal MLA for Colchester North and one-time Minister of Agriculture. As a 4-H member, Lisa took part in goat, horse and beef programs. While still a teen, she milked a herd of 11 does each day. When her own children began to participate in 4-H, Lisa became involved again, and this time as a leader. She has, a set, she has set an excellent example for her family. Both of her daughters, now 21 and 19, are still involved in 4-H activities. When she first began volunteering, the North River Club had 33 members. They now have 75 and three additional leaders. Lisa, who now serves as president of the Colchester County 4-H Council, was chosen as the 4-H National Volunteer Leader of the Year. She says the honour is especially rewarding because she was nominated by the co-presidents of the Truro Club. She received her award at the National Arts Centre in Ottawa on February 10, 2020. Lisa firmly believes in a phrase coined by her late father, 4-H members today, community leaders tomorrow. She has proven herself to be an excellent example of this philosophy. On behalf of the members of this Legislative Assembly, I wish to offer Lisa our congratulations for receiving such a prestigious award and thank her for her volunteer work, which has been of benefit to so many young people in Colchester County, including the town of Turrell. Sure. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to take this opportunity to talk about the on-call palliative care unit at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital. 
It opened in 2008 and is a nine-bed acute care unit. Patients spend their final days with loved ones on the unit, and it is through those doors that people receive the most exceptional care. It takes a special person to work on this unit, one who will act as a nurse, a friend, and even family. They go above and beyond to make everyone feel as comfortable as possible, not only responding to the needs of the patient, but of other family members as well. It is such a vital part of the hospital and our community, and I commend all the workers and volunteers on this unit. I would like to stand here today, Mr. Speaker, to encourage all members to take a donation to the palliative care in their area. Every donation has a profound impact on their community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Preston Dartmouth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize Dr. John Smith, MD of Mineville, Nova Scotia, who graduated in 1978 with his medical degree, thus beginning many years of service as a family doctor, surgeon, and medical examiner. Whereas Dr. Smith served as base surgeon at Statacona, Deputy Commander Surgeon Atlantic Canada, Commanding Officer, Canadian Forces Hospital Halifax, and Medical Examiner. He provided exceptionary medical care to the residents of Lake Echo, Mineville, Preston, and surrounding communities, culminating in the establishment of the Mineville Health Centre in 2012. I recognize and congratulate Dr. John Smith on a stellar career and a vision for providing excellent medical care for the residents of our community. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to recognize Jennifer Hines and the Viking Food Pantry at the Amherst Regional High School. This program has been around for about two years and has been providing students in need with the option to bring food back home to their families. Mm -hmm. This program has grown and students are now joining to, joining to come to the pantry to have snacks and lunch, building a community through this pantry. Mr. Speaker, the pantry has recently even started providing clothing to students as well. I would like to thank Jennifer Hines for the work that she has put into this program and giving her heart back to students. And although I commend Jennifer Hines for her efforts, this highlights, Mr. Speaker, the need for us in government to focus on finding solutions to the underlying problems that are causing hunger in our communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kings West. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate the club-level winners of the annual Kingston Lions Peace Poster Contest. The 2019 Kingston Lions Club International Peace Poster Contest served as an opportunity for students in grade six to design a poster relating to the theme of Journey to Peace, promoting the message of peace, tolerance, and international understanding. This year, students from Pine Ridge Middle School entered the contest with Mercedes taking home fourth place, Ryber earning third place, Emily coming in second, and Jill Ann who earned first place. Jill Ann's poster was selected to advance to the Lions District N2 level competition where she won third place. Mr. Speaker, but I ask that all members of the House of Assembly join me today in congratulating all students who, for participating, including the four winners, and to our local Lions Club for continuing to annually provide this wonderful opportunity for our youth to further their understanding of peace. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize and congratulate Mike and Monica Black. Back in 2009, Mike and Monica opened the Black Spoon Bistro on Commercial Street in North Sydney. Almost from the moment it opened, the Black Spoon became a fixture and must place to eat in North Sydney. But word soon spread, and customers came from all over the CBRM. In being a few short steps from Marine Atlantic Terminal, the Black Spoon has delighted many a visitor over its past 11 years. In January, Mike and Monica proudly completed an expansion of their bistro to almost double its capacity. When the Spoon first opened, they employed six people. With this recent expansion, the Black Spoon now has 27 employees. Mr. Speaker, entrepreneurs like Mike and Monica make downtown North Sydney a little more vibrant. I would like to thank Mike and Monica for all of their hard work and congratulate them on the opening of this new chapter of the Black Spoon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Honourable Member for Hans East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Dedicated and committed to advocating for her community describes Kim Burns of Kennecook. She plays an active role in the Hans North Food Bank. The Hans North Recreation and Development Association has been a board member of the local soccer association and sat on the board for the Kids Action Program, to name a few. Kim, now the direction of the Kids Action Program, advocates for those who do not have a strong voice and helps youth to strengthen their voice with soft encouragement. She's a vocal advocate for the reduction of child poverty and supports those in her community with a quiet determination. As one participant told, shared with me, Kim encouraged her to take part in the Starting Point program. It gave her a renewed purpose and it gave her the tools to not only be successful in the workforce but to be a better mother. Kim helped her to find the power to use her voice. Kim's strength lies in her ability to, t to not take no for an answer. She quietly encourages and is willing to see a project through no matter how tough the going gets. I would like all members of the House to join me in thanking Kim for her dedication to her community, to improving the lives of family and being an advocate for all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate members of the Albion Amateur Boxing Club who participated in the 2020 Brampton Cup with several medals in tow. Four of the club's boxers won medals in the 52-kilogram weight division. Tyver Stewart and Sadie LeBlanc earned gold medals. Noah Thompson earned a silver medal. Cameron Monroe took home a bronze. In the 49-kilogram division, Carson Scholes earned a gold medal, as well as Rob McLeod earned a bronze in the 94-kilogram division. Mr. Speaker, please join me in congratulating all the boxers who trained for the Brampton Cup. In particular, congratulations to those who were successful in winning their matches. I would also like to congratulate Coach Walter Linthorne for the wins and thank him for his dedication to the young people and to the club. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Guysboro, Eastern Shore, Trackety. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to cheer on the St. Mary's House League Hockey Program and their children's team, the Coyotes. The new Coyotes recently played their first public scrimmage against one another at the RecPlex during the Keith Jordan Memorial Hockey Tournament. House League hockey programs are an amazing way for kids and community to enjoy Canada's national pastime and to make the most of our northern winters. Recreation opportunities and sports are so important for all of us, but especially for our young people. And it's so wonderful to see such talented, eager young athletes start on a path of fitness and sportsmanship at such a young age. It must be said, of course, that athletic opportunities don't happen on their own, and so I'd like to take a moment to thank their coaches, sponsors, and community for supporting these young athletes. The kids especially love for the community to support them by coming out and cheering them on. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask everyone to join me in giving the St. Mary's House League Coyotes our sincerest congratulations. Go Coyotes. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to celebrate the ingenuity and hard work of the Passage players, members and society. They've been practicing for months and are about to proudly present a tribute to Broadway, a celebration of musical theatre through the decades. Their March 5th, 6th and 7th shows are nearly show, uh, sold out at the Cow Bay Buffalo Club. The members for this particular tribute are Brittany, Kate, John, Sherry with a Y and Sherry with an I, Mandy, Danielle, Megan, Trish, Wendy, Elvie, Kathy, Julie, Mitch, Kennedy, Bailey, Kaylin, Liz, Faith, Elvie, Christine, Rachel, Noah, and Cheryl, Nev, Kelly, Ann, Charlotte, Luke, Barb, and Shannon. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in recognizing these amazing artists, their volunteers, the Board of Directors of the Passage Players, and all of those who support them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Armdale. Mr. Speaker, keeping our Seniors connected to active learning and doing is an important priority for government. It's also the core mission of a local organization coming up on a big milestone. This June, Shabakto Links will celebrate its 25th anniversary at St. Agnes Church. Shabakto Links is a registered charity that provides programs, services, and opportunities for older Nova Scotians in our communities. Their programming keeps seniors busy and engaged, offering occasions for crafting, shared meals, low-impact exercise, and opportunities for day trips. Mr. 
Mr. Speaker. Every time I visit their annual 90 plus birthday celebrations, I'm impressed by the warmth and community they've built up in our area. This year, through their Smitten for Mittens initiative, the ladies of Shabakta Links made 679 mittens and 67 tokes for 11 elementary schools in Halifax, Dartmouth. I want to thank Shabakta Links staff Jan Boswell and D. Ann Mitchell and their board and volunteers and congratulate them all on their quarter century milestone. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I recognize Troy Golden. Troy is a lifelong resident of Timberley and was recently appointed store manager of the Sobey store that opened in Timberley in November of 2019. Four weeks prior to the grand opening of this eagerly waited store in our community, there was nothing more than an outer shell of the building. After assembling a team and full complement of staff who proudly live and work in the BLT area, Troy managed the enormous task to ensure the store opened on schedule. Working feverishly every possible hour of the day, six to seven days a week, Troy guided his team with the daunting task of setting up and fully stocking the store. He successfully managed resources, coordinated staff, and ensured equipment and products were received on the shelves and in place for the grand opening. Mr. Speaker, I ask the members of the House to join me in congratulating Troy on the tireless work to ensure every detail was in place for the grand opening of this new amenity in our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, earlier this year, the Dr. Brendan Carr, the new CEO of Nova Scotia Health Authority, was asked about the major challenge facing the health authority. And um, in his response, he said that ch his, the major challenge was changing the very critical nature around healthcare in this province. And some, sometimes words aren't clear, Mr. Speaker, but I would have thought that maybe one of the major challenges might have been a shortage of healthcare professionals or the endless stream of code criticals or ER closures or the major issues with the one patient, one record system. There's, a, there's an endless list of issues that could have been deemed the major challenge the, facing the healthcare system, not the narrative about healthcare in this province. But I'd like to ask the Premier, uh, I'd like to ask the Premier what the Premier thinks is the major challenge uh, facing healthcare in Nova Scotia. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the for the question. Uh, uh, one of the major challenges facing healthcare uh, in this province, Mr. is the continued negativity uh, around the entire system, Mr. Speaker, much being put for political fodder. Uh, the reality of it is we continue to attract uh, physicians across the country, Mr. Speaker. The very numbers they put on the floor that they said were 100,000 without a family physician is now below 50,000. We're continuing to move uh, to provide support. They've been opposed to the investments we've been making, Mr. Speaker, in the infrastructure, in uh, uh, in the capital part of our province and in Cape Breton and the collaborative care centres across the region. It would have been much nicer, Mr. Speaker, if when the last time the Conservatives were in power, they would have actually done something to improve the infrastructure of the health care system so they continue to attract people forward, Mr. Speaker. And I'm really happy the fact that after seven years, we're beginning to see uh, some positive movement, Mr. Speaker, in the delivery of health care system, not only, quite frankly, for this generation, but for the next one. The Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, it's just a perception issue, I guess, indeed. Uh, uh, meanwhile, with all the infrastructure the Premier's been talking about, physicians and frontline workers are, raging ma are raising major concerns now. Dr. Bradley uh, raised his concerns. He, ra he, he, he made his voice clear on the concerns he had about the move of the can cancer centre. But I understand that many other oncologists have been silenced by the Health Authority. And we know, according to the uh, September 2019 org chart from the NSHA, there are 38 staff in the communications department, 38 people whose job it is to possibly convince Nova Scotians that they are in fact receiving sufficient health care even when they know they're not. And we hear, the, we, hear the Premier, we hear the Premier saying that it's just a perception problem, it's just a negativity problem. I'd like to ask the Premier, if 38 uh, professional communicators haven't been able to affix, to fix the alleged perception problem, What's the number that it will take to fix it? Is it 42, 55? How many people is it that can change the perception of health care and put it to the uh, Premier's perception, which is not reality? Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Again, the Honourable Woman stands up and criticizes the fact Dr. Bethune, who heats cancer care across our province, came to government and said it makes no sense. 
to leave the Dixon Centre where it is and send the sickest patients who arrive at this facility and move them back and forth in ambulances, Mr. Speaker, when you're making an investment for a generation, do the right thing for Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker. That's what our government is doing, not trying to make a political statement on everything that comes forward. Mr. Speaker, the reality of it is we are listening to the cancer care people in this province, and Dr. Bethune believes this is a good move, Mr. Speaker, and so do the families of people suffering with cancer, Mr. Speaker, and so do we. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Oddly enough, the Premier would have me criticizing somebody whose name I never mentioned. The name I did mention, though, was Dr. Bernie Bradley, who has raised a number of concerns about the move. I'd like to ask the, I'd like to ask the, the, the Premier if he can... Um, maybe I'll just ask a simple question. Um, Premier, is Dr. Bernie Bradley wrong in the, in the concerns he raises? I'd like to remind the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition to direct his questions through the Chair. The Honourable Premier... He's retired, right? Mr. Speaker, uh, the physician the Honourable Member was talking about is retired. The reality of it is I'm dealing with Dr. Bethune, who's delivering the services across the province and leading cancer care in Nova Scotia. He has a long-term vision about how we deliver, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, services to some of the sickest patients in our province. Why is the Honourable Member think it's okay that we put those patients in an ambulance and drive them down the street, give them treatment, drive them back? Oh, for I forgot, Mr. Speaker's annual meeting, he thought the best way to deliver primary care was for all of us to sit in our living room and call a doctor. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Uh, thank you. Mr. Speaker, my questions on a different subject are for the Premier. Um, a man named Derek Tobin in North Dartmouth had $1,300 worth of damage to his car when he went into a mega pothole at the uh, Lancaster intersection coming off the 118. And a woman named Karen Cole had a similar experience on a different road, but as a result of it, she had to replace all four tires on her car. Now, if this were extremely rare, it would be one thing, but it isn't. Does the Premier agree that our roads should be in better shape than to be causing so many thousands of dollars damage to people's cars? The Honourable Premier. Who, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Minister of uh, Transportation uh, and his department, and the men and women all across our province, Mr. Speaker, to continue to deal with uh, highway infrastructure. I'm proud of the investments that we continue to make. Uh, as the Honourable Member would know, there's, uh, this time of the year, we, through all, uh, Mr. Speaker, all governments, uh, continue to deal with the issue of potholes. Uh, the Honourable Member, I, I don't know specifically the cases that he's referring to. There is a, a loss claim prevention they can go through the department that will be analyzed, uh, and I would encourage uh, the names that he's mentioned to do so. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is exactly that program that the Premier mentions which is the problem. The program, the Road Hazards Claim and Investigations Program, is intended to compensate people whose cars are damaged by provincial roads, but last year, 910 claims were made, and of those, only 47 resulted in a benefit to the driver. In the last five years, the percentage of successful complaints every single year has declined. In 2014, almost 8% of claims were successful, but only 5% of claims were approved last year. Mr. Speaker, what is the point of a program that almost no one seems to be able to benefit from? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to thank the for the question. He, uh, I think the importance of this program, Mr. Speaker, is that uh, Nova Scotia Motors want an, an avenue when they feel uh, that their vehicles have been damaged, Mr. Speaker, based on the road conditions, based on uh, the fact that something hadn't been addressed. They need an avenue to come into government. We think this is an important step. In terms of uh, the ratio, why certain ones have been done over the last year, not this year, Mr. Speaker, I, can't have, I don't have an explanation for it, but I will endeavour to find out uh, for the Honourable Member and uh, be able to answer that question for him. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you. I want to suggest that part of the answer to this problem is the way that the program is set up and uh, the way that its current rules give the government all the cards. Uh, once the department is made aware of a hazard, the department decides on the time that needs to be uh, uh, allowed before that hazard needs to be fixed, after which uh, uh, there will be liability for damages incurred. But this information is never made available to the public. Will the Premier agree to develop a system where road hazards and repair time frames are publicly listed, so as to increase the transparency and therefore the success of the Road Hazards Claims and Investigations Program. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate uh, the, uh, the question. Uh, I don't know all the details as he described, so for me to commit to that on the floor of the Legislature, but I, I do think in his, uh, in his uh, preamble to that question, 
the issue about whether or not there's a third party that can determine whether, who's right and who's wrong and whether or not the, the government has used all of the data in front of them, I think merits uh, consideration. And uh, I would endeavor, I would uh, tell the honourable member that I will raise the issue with the department to look at is there a way to adjust this program that provides motors with a better feel that they're being uh, treated more, more equitably when it comes to their complaint. Uh, and if there is a, a disagreement between the government and them that we have a third party that can actually adjudicate and determine uh, which is right. Down the leader of the official opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on February 20th, during question period, uh, the Premier repeatedly refused to disclose the amount of money taxpayers have been forced to pay for high-priced Bay Street lawyers in the Alex Cameron case. The next day, during question period, the Premier walked back a little bit on his refusal and said, I will attempt to get that number for you. He repeated the same commitment uh, outside to reporters. Uh, for clarity, Mr. Speaker, I'm talking about fees paid to two partners at a major Bay Street law firm, plus one associated, at least three lawyers at that Bay Street firm. One of those uh, partners, their, their whole bio is three words that they defend reputations. Isn't that ironic, Mr. Speaker, considering the Alex Cameron case? Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question for the Premier, uh, why hasn't he disclosed the amount of money taxpayers have paid the Bay Street lawyers to keep details of the Alex Cameron case secret? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as the Minister of Justice uh, told the Honourable Member, uh, as critic across the uh, Mr. Speaker, we have been served uh, notice. It will be before the court, and this item is still before the court. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know the uh, Premier has been served notice on the, quite a number of cases where his government will be brought to, uh, brought to court, but in this particular case, it's, it's over. And legal ex expert uh, Wayne McKay says there's never actually been, there's never been and isn't now a legal reason to keep the cost of this case secret. And I'll table, I'll table that for the, for the Premier. In fact, the refusal to disclose pay, uh, fees paid to lawyers seems to be a relatively new development for this government. Uh, in 2015, a FOIPOP request, the government revealed the amount that it paid to uh, uh, lawyer Jack Graham, $130,000. I can table that FOIPOP. Another one from 2016, uh, they, they, they uh, disclosed the revised procurement proposal for uh, a process for Mr. Graham up to 440. So this is a new development. I'd, ask, I'd, ask the, I'd like to ask the, the Premier, through you, Mr. Speaker, why would the government uh, ref refuse to release the amount uh, it paid in the Alex Cameron case, but willingly release information about the amounts it paid to lawyers in the past. The Honourable Premier. Speaker, he, he answered, uh, Mr. Speaker, answered his, uh, his own question in, uh, when he asked me the question, Mr. Speaker. Those matters were finished with the court system. This one is not. As the Honourable Member, we've been served. Notice we're going back to court. The Honourable Member for Victor West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Seniors are the fastest growing population in Nova Scotia. Dr. Robert Strang, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, says that seniors are at a higher risk for needing hospital-based care. The threat of COVID-19 is increasing worldwide, and it seems only a matter of time, Mr. Speaker, before, before we have our first case here in Nova Scotia. The recent budget reports that uh, over $900,000 will be cut from communicable disease and prevention under programs and services and we already know that flu season is a strain on our health care system. My concern is that funding does not reflect and prepare us for what is happening in the real world. So my question to the Minister of Health, are people actually expected to feel that they are protected with these cuts and what is being done to prepare currently? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank uh, the member for the question. Uh, uh, there's a lot of work uh, being done uh, throughout uh, both the public health uh, as well as our partners in the health authorities uh, in response to the uh, COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, the response plan that is in place, uh, which is being followed uh, and which uh, really results in escalated uh, preparedness uh, as the uh, situation uh, globally and nationally uh, evolves. Uh, at present time, the the threat uh, risk level in Nova Scotia does remain low, uh, although we do see uh, growing um, cases uh, throughout uh, the uh, world. In Canada, nationally, we do see that the cases are being constrained quite well. Uh, although the cases increase, they are uh, very much uh, traceable to uh, uh, countries of origin and people are being uh, self-isolated uh, and treated, uh, not seeing community-based transmissions. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer. He did 
indicate yesterday in estimates that he has been briefed on this, but that there was no discussions around long-term care are most vulnerable. So the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recently declared the first diagnose without relevant travel history or exposure to another patient. The unknown origin increases the risk of transmission by a considerable amount. So my concern is that we do not, Mr. Speaker, have the capacity right now to manage a serious outbreak in Nova Scotia if it was to happen. So my question to the Minister of Health, does Nova Scotia in his opinion, have the capacity to properly test for COVID-19, and what hospital is actually responsible for the testing here in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess there's a, a lot of information to respond to in 45 seconds, but I'll do my best. Uh, first and foremost, uh, further uh, update. Uh, the member referenced uh, estimates uh, commentary. Uh, in fact, uh, I believe what I said was I did, didn't recall uh, having uh, information, so I couldn't uh, confirm if those discussions within the continuing care and long-term care sector had taken place. Uh, following estimates, it has been confirmed that uh, that outreach uh, had already begun, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, so uh, that is part of that. That escalation. I believe in that estimates discussion. Uh, I did highlight that uh, we were at that stage of the uh, planning preparedness, uh, that we are broadening the uh, sphere of engagement uh, outside of just our healthcare system uh, directly. Uh, so that work is ongoing. Uh, again, uh, the preparedness, as I've stated uh, previously in estimates and uh, elsewhere, is that uh, they are following the uh, planning protocol that's been in place and modified based upon SARS H1N1 outbreaks. It's going along very well, and health officials uh, throughout our health authorities and public health believe we're in a far better uh, preparedness now than we were a decade ago based upon those planning materials being in place. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. The question is for the Minister of Education. In response to the growing concerns about COVID-19, as the Minister is aware, it was announced on Sunday that the Acadian School Board uh, would cancel overseas trips. The CSAP has withdrawn their approval for overseas trips, and we know students are staying home. We also know, Mr. Speaker, this is a disappointment to those students, but the school board must feel the risk of infection from COVID-19 is such that this move is in everyone's best interest. Mr. Speaker, my question to the minister is this. Does the minister agree with the CSAP on this measure, and will we see cancellations for other schools? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I support the uh, CSAP in making the decision that they believe is best. The, um, Every, all three of those trips that were cancelled were heading to uh, Europe where there's a higher risk uh, of infection at this particular point in time. Uh, not every trip in the province is to Europe. Uh, we are in the process of having our regional executive directors uh, meet with school communities, parents, principals uh, to get a real sense of what the front lines uh, would like us to do and that may impact a, a province-wide decision in this matter. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and certainly we recognize that there's different itineraries for various trips. Um, and we know, Mr. Speaker, under most cancellation insurance, the decision has to come from higher than the school level. CSAP students with cancellation insurance will receive their payouts because a cancellation at the board level triggers the insurance. Now, as I understand it, Mr. Speaker, a cancellation by the principal or a decision by parents to stay home does not entitle them to access the cancellation insurance. Now this creates a double standard, unless for those who don't fall under a school board, which is every English student uh, in the system, in our province. So can the minister provide some clarity uh, whether trips cancelled at the school level will be eligible for cancellation insurance payouts? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the situation varies from uh, travel provider to travel provider, but in the, in the cases where uh, a decision is made uh, to cancel a trip, um, we will make sure that all the steps are taken so that parents can recoup the costs through insurance when that, that option is available. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Lately, when pressed on the growing number of Nova Scotians who are facing rent hikes in the hundreds of dollars a month, the Premier has insisted that rent control does not work. But across many jurisdictions, rent control is giving some certainty and protection to renters and some stability and livability to communities. There is no significant evidence that it stymies housing construction, and in fact, the policy is in place and working well in Manitoba, Ontario, Prince Edward Island, Quebec, and British Columbia. 
Yet the Premier has decided that rent control won't work for Nova Scotians. Will the Premier table the analysis that his government has used to reach that conclusion? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to rise today. I appreciate the question from the Honourable Minister. I want to talk a bit about housing. Mr. Speaker, we know there have been challenges over the years. We've continued to invest over the years. Another great example, that was our commitment yesterday to the folks in the Taiwak organization, Mr. Speaker, and the commitment we've made to them. $7.3 million in the first three years, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to work with organizations like Tawak, our private industry, Mr. Speaker, co-ops and organizations as such, not-for-profits. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Mr. Speaker, this government, in fact, sees rent control working well enough in order to bake it into agreements that it reaches with landlords under its housing programs. When negotiating the terms of rent supplements or through the Rental Rehabilitation Assistance Program, rent increases are indexed to the Consumer Price Index, commonly for periods of 15 years at a time. Mr. Speaker, if rent control doesn't work for the people of Nova Scotia, how then does it work when the government is the one paying? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member mentioned a couple of great programs. Mr. Speaker, not only did we uh, put forward a $400 million program signed with the national government, the, the, the rehab program she spoke of, Mr. Speaker, $70 million over and above that that this government has invested in Nova Scotians who need repairs to their homes. Much more, Mr. Speaker, $20.5 million announced in the budget this year to, to create homelessness, uh, housing workers, Mr. Speaker, right across this province. The government is working hard to solve issues and concerns around those in need of housing in this province, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The mental health and addiction wait times were updated just a few days ago. Again, the Eastern Zone is the only zone where wait times were increased overall. Youth in the Eastern Zone had their non-urgent wait times increased by 50% or more compared to the data from July to September. My question is for the Minister of Health. Why is the Eastern Zone the only zone with no net improvements in wait times overall and keeps getting significantly worse? Thank the you, Honourable Mr. Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member for uh, the important question. Uh, as we've uh, discussed uh, many times on the floor of the legislature, uh, the uh, efforts to support uh, mental health and addiction uh, services and expand those services. Uh, we've uh, continued to invest in this year's budget uh, the highest uh, amount of money uh, dedicated uh, throughout uh, government towards mental health and addiction services. Uh, we recognize uh, that, uh, as the member referenced, the Eastern uh, Zone, uh, some of the challenges with uh, uh, recruitment re uh, of uh, some vacancies uh, within the uh, community. We continue uh, with our partners uh, to uh, recruit to fill those vacancies. At the same time, we've instituted uh, new uh, engagements with uh, other zones to leverage telemedicine and other initiatives, Mr. Ch Speaker, uh, to help support and increase uh, access to the uh, supports and services that are needed while the recruitment efforts uh, continue and are ongoing. The Honourable Member for Sydney River Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Within the Eastern Zone, non-urgent adults and youth in industrial Cape Breton are the worst in the province. 309 days for adults, 313 days for youth. The benchmark for non-urgent mental health wait times is 28 days. A 28-day benchmark, a 313-day result. Nine of 11 areas failed to meet this benchmark for youth, and 13 of 16 failed for adults. And $550,000 is all the new money this government is willing to spend. My question for the Minister of Health, is he satisfied that this year's investments in mental health will start to fix the failures in mental health service delivery seen in this province? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the investments, uh, increased in investments this year builds upon uh, many years of uh, increased uh, investments. Uh, the investments uh, noted uh, are uh, just those investments uh, within uh, Department of Health and Wellness's uh, budget, Mr. Speaker. It's important to recognize that many of the investments that we've made as government throughout this budget include targeted investments around social determinants of health, which are critical components to ensure the success uh, of, uh, in particular, mental health uh, and addictions uh, situations, which includes the investments of uh, my, in uh, the Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Department of Community Services, uh, pre-primary program, Mr. Uh, Speaker, to support those youth and, and families uh, throughout the province with the four-year-old program, the Department of Education, Early Childhood Development. 
We've made investments, not just in the Department of Health and Wellness, so the investments across government to support Nova Scotians, to help them achieve uh, the best possible outcomes uh, in their lives, is what this budget is all about. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. In October 2019, the Blueprint for Mental Health and Addictions, one of the actions outlined was uh, provide enhanced suicide risk assessment and management training for mental health and addictions clinicians, and I'll table that report. The goal of this was to arm workers in mental health and addictions with the training to identify and monitor the risk of suicide. It is stated that training is currently underway for mental health and addiction staff. My question for the Minister of Health is, uh, how many health care professionals have received suicide risk assessment intervention training? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Thank uh, the member again for the question. Uh, again, uh, having these questions about mental health uh, services uh, and priorities on the floor of the legislature does help us uh, illustrate to Nova Scotians the important uh, importance we do place uh, on uh, these programs. I don't have the exact uh, number that the member has uh, requested, but as noted, uh, the uh, work uh, within our health system to ensure those frontline health care workers have the appropriate training uh, is being uh, executed and delivered delivered uh, by our partners in the Nova Scotia Health Authority, uh, where uh, those frontline health care workers uh, are uh, operating. Um, so uh, again, the, the work is underway, as uh, uh, with a uh, number of other initiatives, uh, particularly uh, focused around uh, suicide uh, prevention. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is, welcome, uh, this is a welcome implementation uh, to serve those in the clinical setting. However, mental health training should not stop at the men with mental health workers. More frequently, we see the value in having professionals outside the clinical setting equipped with health training, such as first responders. So my question for the Minister is, what is the potential of training being adapted with other professions? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Thank uh, the member for uh, the question. Uh, indeed, uh, we recognize the uh, importance of uh, having a, a multitude of uh, entry points and supports for uh, both identifying and responding to uh, mental health uh, needs uh, within our population. That's why as the member uh, looks at the investments that we make uh, and the programs that we've uh, launched and or expanded uh, throughout uh, the province, including, uh, for example, our adolescent uh, mental health uh, outreach uh, program, uh, which is in more than 100, about 100 schools across the province now. Uh, I believe somewhere in the vicinity of 25,000 uh, visits uh, that uh, took place since launching the program a year ago. Uh, this uh, shows that uh, we are investing to provide uh, numerous opportunities for people to engage and, and uh, with mental health uh, supports uh, where they are, Mr. Uh, Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The most recent report from the Nova Scotia Health Authority reveals that the number of people who need a family doctor has risen, and I will table that document. While the trend has been going down since last August, the same can't be said for every zone. Doctors' wait lists have either remained the same, Mr. Speaker, or have been on the rise outside of Halifax. My concern is that non-Halifax Nova Scotians are being neglected and left behind. My question for the Minister of Health, why are rural Nova Scotians making no progress and even losing the doctor's promise to them. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker. I believe the uh, the latest uh, information that just came out, I'll have to double check if it's up on the, the website uh, yet, uh, but if it's not there today, it should be uh, up uh, shortly. Uh, actually shows that, again, uh, we have a reduction of about 600 people on the wait list across Nova Scotia, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that... That, Mr. Speaker, uh, builds on the success we've had, uh, particularly uh, over the last uh, 14 to 18 months, uh, Mr. Speaker, based upon the programs and initiatives that we've been uh, implementing as a province to attract, retain uh, physicians to the province, to attach uh, patients uh, from the 811 registry to primary care. We're going to continue that good work, Mr. Speaker, and there's a number of our initiatives, like the long-term programs, like residency, medical school seats, that haven't even uh, fully uh, manifest themselves within the public space, so look forward to even more success as we continue to see reap the rewards of these investments and programs. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Congratulations. I hope some of those 14,000 people in northern Nova Scotia received a doctor yesterday. 
In the doctor recruitment update, it was stated that departures are not being reported due to the challenge on reporting um, since it was transferred in 2016. And in 2016, there has been no solution to tracking the number of departures, but NSHA claimed that we were working on uh, various stakeholders. That was back in 2016. We are only seeing, Mr. Speaker, recruitments and have no indication of doctor departures and why they're leaving. My concern is that this has been worked on since 2016 with no avail, and the doctors are not just leaving because of retirement. So my question to the Minister of Health, why are Nova Scotians not getting the whole picture for doctor recruitment and retainment? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, uh, as uh, stated, uh, the progress uh, based upon programs and initiatives that we've been implementing over the last uh, number of years, uh, we've uh, seen uh, the number of Nova Scotians uh, waiting uh, and registered in need of a family uh, practice has been uh, reduced by about 20% over the last 12 to 14 months. Uh, this month, uh, in the most recent data, we see another 600 uh, fewer people registered on the 811 list compared to the month uh, previous. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that shows the success. Uh, our focus is not on, on necessarily counting uh, doctors in and of themselves, Mr. Speaker, but about the objective, which is getting the care uh, and attachment of Nova Scotians to the primary care providers. And by that measure, we're seeing success. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, I'm deeply concerned about the disconnect between the reality for frontline health care workers and top management at the Minister of Health's office and NSHA. In the fall, I contacted the Minister of Health's office and NSHA about the problem that patients are being kept in acute care beds while long-term care beds are available and sitting empty for ex extended periods of time. The Minister, and I'll table uh, that document. The Minister of Health responded saying that staff at Continuing Care provided him with data showing that in the fall there were zero vacant beds. But staff that actually work, those frontline healthcare workers, shared with me data that showed there were 15 empty long-term care beds in Cumberland County at the same time. So my question is, does the minister share my concerns that the info being fed to him is in fact accurate, and this impedes their ability to address the problems facing vacant long-term care beds? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'd like to first and foremost acknowledge the, the hard work of the many public servants uh, throughout uh, the uh, government of Nova Scotia, in particular in the Department of Health and Wellness, as well as those frontline health care workers. And I hope the member opposite is not uh, suggesting that uh, something nefarious is happening with the information uh, being uh, provided uh, to me through uh, the many hard-working public servants uh, that serve the people of Nova Scotia through the Department of Health and Wellness. I will certainly, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, dig in a little bit further if the member is alleging that there's uh, been something untoward about the information that's provided to me uh, to uh, help to uh, ascertain where the disconnect between the information she's been provided and the information that I've been provided. Uh, and again, I, I, I stand uh, to, to hope that the member is not suggesting that the staff within the department are doing something to uh, mislead me and the people of Nova Scotia and the information they provide to help make the best decisions we can for the health care of the people of Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, what I'm saying very clearly is that there is a disconnect between the reality of frontline health care workers and what this minister is being told, or at least what he's feeding back to me. And I'll share another example of this. On January 8th, I shared another problem with his office as well as NSHA CEO. In the fall, staff of Cumberland Regional Health Care Centre were instructed that four of their acute care beds were not to be used and not to have any admitted patients due to a nursing shortage. I waited two months, and during that two months, four people that normally would have had a hospital bed had to stay in an emergency room hallway. When I asked for help with the Minister of Health's office and the CEO to reopen these four beds and help to staff with nurses, I received letters from both of them stating that there were in fact never four beds closed. 
Today, and I'll table those letters, today the Minister of Health's letter also states the unit is at full nursing staffing capacity. Yet over the last week, the OB unit had to change scheduled inductions due to lack of nurses. So my question to the Minister of Health is how can we achieve, quote, best possible outcomes, end quote, when someone is feeding him misinformation of the realities of the, lo of the ground zero health care workers? Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I again uh, thank uh, the member for the question. Uh, as uh, I'd uh, restate, uh, I believe the the letter uh, illustrates uh, the circumstances uh, behind the uh, the beds that uh, she uh, referenced. Uh, as far as the uh, staffing uh, complement, uh, again uh, having a vacancy at a particular point in time, uh, I, again I think uh, timing may play a, a role in in some of the uh, concerns that uh, the member's uh, stating and where she may. Uh, observe uh, differences of information uh, when the issue was uh, brought uh, to my attention and I had it uh, looked into uh, that uh, results in the information that was provided uh, back to her at that point in time as the member herself acknowledged uh, she waited two months to bring this uh, issue and concern uh, to our attention uh, to have it looked into and, uh, and resolved and uh, as is the case uh, from time to time uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority our partners already well underway in resolving the issues and concerns uh, when uh, they come to me uh, several months after the work has already commenced the honorable member for Dermot North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. For pregnant people who are involved with children and family services, the birth alert system flags a mother's health file so that hospital staff notify social workers as soon as the baby is born. A review of this practice in Manitoba found no evidence that it increased the safety of children in any way. The final report of the National Inquiry into M Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls called upon provincial and territorial governments and child welfare services for an immediate end to the practice of birth alerts. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier agree today to end the discriminatory and racist practice of issuing birth alerts for at-risk mothers and their babies? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I uh, will uh, share the Honourable Member. I will look into the fact whether that's actually happening in our province. Uh, but I agree. I share her concerns uh, uh, as she's describing uh, this situation. And uh, I will get back to you and uh, uh, to try to determine whether it's actually happening in our province. If it is, uh, we will uh, have a further discussion. The Honourable Member for Dermot North. Mr. Speaker, thank, thank you. Thank the Premier for that answer. Uh, British Columbia and Manitoba have agreed to end the practice of birth alerts. Women's Wellness Within, a registered nonprofit in Nova Scotia, is calling on the government to invest in adequate pre, peri, and postnatal care for all new mothers, with special attention and supports being made to, available to mothers who may be younger than the average, poorer than the average, with culturally sensitive and targeted supports for Indigenous, African, Nova Scotian, or otherwise racialized families. Mr. Speaker, Will the Premier commit to providing these enhanced supports to help marginalized parents with their pregnancies, birth and parenting experiences? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's why we continue to provide wraparound services, whether it is, Mr. Speaker, through the Department of Health or uh, community services to provide supports around uh, families across this province, uh, especially those as they begin a new journey, an exciting new journey for them, uh, the birth of their first child or second child uh, or third or fourth, and if you happen to be my case, twelfth. I, I'm sure she was still excited at that point, uh, uh, but I want to tell uh, the Honourable Member uh, that's exactly why we are making these investments in pre-primary and other programs that, that takes away the socioeconomic circumstances that a child is born into and provides them with the best outcomes and best starts, the same as every child in, in our province. Uh, but I will endeavour to find out the answer to your first question, uh, and, we'll, and we as a government, I'm committed to, through Mr. Speaker, through you, to the member, uh, of making those services available to those families, and particularly those families most in need. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Uh, there are a number of properties along the, the route of the twinning of the 104 that are, are worried they're going to face difficulties accessing their, their properties because of the new, of the new twinning project. Um, a number of these driveways have directly access to have direct access to the highway. So my question for the uh, for the minister is, what is the plan to preserve access for these properties during and after the 20 of the 104? Honourable Minister of Transportation. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for the question. Uh, that's a very relevant question. In most instances, a uh, suitable access is provided. In some instances, uh, the uh, acquisition of the entire property might occur, which would uh, make the matter uh, uh, moot. But uh, the, uh, uh, we're very sensitive to the uh, uh, not to injure any of the properties that are uh, adjacent to the uh, improvement. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I understand in, in, in some cases the, the plan is to incorporate a single access, a single lane access road, and there's obviously some concerns about accessibility, particularly for uh, emergency vehicles. And residents are also unsure who would be responsible uh, for maintaining any single, ac single lane access road that may be uh, incorporated into the project going forward. So can the minister clarify who, who is responsible for maintenance of any single lane uh, access roads that are incorporated so people can access uh, property? Is it, is it his department? Is it uh, the municipality or do they become a private road? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Solutions, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, that would involve uh, the uh, building of, of an alternative route along the uh, uh, adjacent uh, twinned highway would be the responsibility of the Department. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Services. Time and time again, we hear this government tote its record on health care, housing and jobs in the province only to hear stories upon stories of Nova Scotians being left behind. We see seniors locked out of their nursing homes in Truro, northern pulp and forestry workers losing their livelihoods and now the rising rate of homelessness in Nova Scotia that left one elderly disabled woman homeless and living in her car at the Dartmouth Walmart parking lot. I met Joni Rutledge, who was at the Dartmouth General, where her specialist told her that if she didn't stop living in her car, she was possibly going to lose the rest of her foot. So I went to the hospital and I worked with her. My question to the Minister of Community Services, do you know how long your department let Joni sleep in her car in the cold parking lot after my initial call? The Honourable Minister of Community Services, I'd just like to remind the Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage to keep the questions directed through the Chair. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to remind the Honourable Member, as she well knows, we do not discuss individual cases here in this, in this House. She knows that. <laughs> what I would like to let the Honourable no Member know is that Nova Scotia made the no most improvement in combating poverty in 2018. Those are the related Statistics Canada numbers. That has happened because of a number of different investments that we've made combating poverty, Mr. Speaker, not limited to uh, introducing the standard household rate in January of this year, Mr. Speaker which was the largest single investment in income assistance in the history of this province ever. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour, Eastern Passage. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Community Services might want to not talk about what's really going on, but the, this woman certainly did. I have the, uh, the reporter's uh, articles that she did. She wanted this brought to this legislature, and that's what we're doing here on this side of the le legislature, telling people what's really going on. The truth of the matter, Mr. Speaker, is that this minister's department left a disabled partial amputee in the freezing cold for almost 30 days. 30 days after my initial phone call, the minister's department cited issues with paperwork, but it's pretty hard to have something mailed to your car in a Walmart parking lot. So let me repeat, she was living in her car in the dead of winter. She was on the priority list and it took 30 days. My question to the Minister of Community Services is why, after six years of this government being in power, the vacancy rate for apartments in Nova Scotia has dropped to 1% and the number of people waiting for low-income housing, particularly those who are disabled, has skyrocketed under this government. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for the question. While that member may be free to bring up individual cases, she knows that we are not allowed to speak about individual cases. We can talk about policy, Mr. Speaker, but we cannot speak to individual cases. What I would like to inform the Honourable Member is that this most recent budget has, it has 
uh, increased the Nova Scotia Child Benefit, Mr. Speaker, so that 10,000 more children will be covered by it, Mr. Speaker. We also, we also tripled what was the personal items allowance, which no government had had before, which we introduced. We tri nearly tripled that in this particular budget, Mr. Speaker, which will allow people who are living in temporary, temporarily in shelters and in, um, in transition houses, Mr. Speaker, so that they actually have money to spend on personal items, Mr. Speaker. We are working to combat poverty, and I would note that the poverty rate for seniors in Nova Scotia is actually lower than the national average. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Mr. Speaker, the government is quick to point out Nova Scotia's high record population uh, in 2019. What isn't addressed, though, is the bulk of those who have immigrated or migrated from other provinces settle in Sydney and Halifax. All counties except HRM reported more deaths and births between July 2018 and June 2019. Rural areas of this province not only seek new residents, we desperately need them. And the current programs like the Atlantic Immigration Pilot and Occupations in Demand Pilot lack sufficient enticements for immigrants to settle where they desperately are needed the most in rural Nova Scotia. What's the government's plan to encourage newcomers to settle in the areas where they're desperately needed in rural Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. Uh, first, let me thank the staff at the Nova Scotia Office of Immigration for the great work they're doing. I also want to thank this government and this Premier for making immigration a priority when we came into power. Uh, we, you're, uh, the member's quite right, we are uh, growing our population and we are working hard across the province, including Cape Breton and including all of the rural areas, uh, to attract newcomers. I'm very pleased with the reports of yesterday that Sydney, for the first time, it's uh, increasing its population through the international students. Very pleased, pleased with the work that we're doing and members uh, are, are also doing with the Cape Breton University and uh, all the partners uh, in that municipality. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, um, and I thank the Minister for her response, but unfortunately we're not seeing the gains that we need through the programs that are available in rural Nova Scotia and constituencies such as Cape Breton and Richmond. I applaud uh, you know, my colleagues across the floor for increasing the population in Sydney, but that is an urban environment. In fact, population decline was the fastest in Guysborough County, followed by Shelburne, Queens, Victoria, Cumberland, Digby, Inverness, Pictou and Richmond. We need to reverse this. Uh, Mr. Speaker. So again, what is the government doing in rural Nova Scotia communities to make certain that those newcomers that are here and people who are migrating from other provinces not only are placed in those communities, but they stay and they settle uh, for on a long term? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again for that question. Let me remind the member and all colleagues that 10 out of 18 counties have increased their population this past year. Let me also remind everybody that we also have the Atlantic Immigration Pilot and through that program alone, 40% that are using it of employers are outside the Halifax <laughs> municipality. Uh, Thirdly, with the time that I have, I want to also remind everybody that last March 20th, we launched the Francophone Immigration Action Plan. And through the work of that plan, we are increasing our Francophone population in the province. And I'm happy to report that uh, people are going throughout the entire province. We will continue to work with our employers, with our businesses, with our settlement partners, and, and with all municipalities to increase our population and grow our communities throughout the entire province. Province. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, uh, my question is to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Mr. Speaker, the saga of the English Down Ferry continues. As a result, the ferry has been out of service since December and we're into March. Many community members are wondering when this ferry will be operational again. A common occurrence. We know that the ferry is sitting in dry dock for repairs. Residents will now have to wait for that work to be complete. After that, residents will have to wait for the right weather because the ferry needs to be towed back. 
And finally, the residents will have to wait for federal inspectors <coughs> to give the ferry the green light once the work is complete and the ferry ready to sail. And soon, the drift ice will be in, causing further interruptions. So my question for the minister is, will the minister give the House an update as to when the public can once again travel on the English Town Ferry? The Honourable yeah. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I uh, thank the member opposite for the uh, question. I'm very familiar with the uh, English Town Ferry uh, and the challenging environment that it operates in. Uh, we uh, do everything we can to make sure that it meets all the standards that have to be done, uh, that it has to meet. Uh, some of which are, of course, federal because of the nature of the crossing that's there. Uh, the drift ice is something that I have to say ex uh, exceeds my grasp. I'm uh, not quite able to uh, uh, give you any guarantees around uh, the drift ice, but let me tell you that I'm certainly appreciative of the inconvenience that it causes uh, for the for folks north of Smoky, and we will do everything we can to get it back in, uh, in operation as quickly and expediently as we possibly can. The Honourable Member for Victoria and the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I realize that the Minister can't control when the drift ice might be coming, but it's coming. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, having the ferry closed has inconvenienced both res residents and businesses and has caused emergency providers delays when responding to emergency calls. The loss of the ferry service again is unfortunate for the area and delays hurt both residents and businesses. So much so that residents are once again talk, asking for a fixed link. The department should show these constituents that they realized what this disruption has caused. So my question to the minister, for the short term, will the minister rise today and commit that all those who have purchased passes will receive a refund? And for the long term, will he once again open discussions on the possibility of a fixed link. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I would uh, draw the member's attention to the full name of our department, which is Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. And I'm very, very happy to stand here today and talk about the infrastructure renewal that this government is undertaking across this province. Huge, huge investment in our road budget, the highest ever. In our capital budget, the highest in history. It is uh, amazing. And also, one possible uh, silver lining for the cloud is that we rebuilt the Tarbert Road a couple of years ago, and it's in very good condition. Thank you. The Honourable Member for sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I recently met with a constituent whose parents both died of cancer, lung cancer. She was inquiring about whether or not there are any plans to have a lung cancer screening test in place to detect the disease earlier? An excellent question. According to her, Japan offers annual screenings by way of x-rays and blood work. With breast cancer screening and colon screening here in Nova Scotia offered, is, I was wondering if there was any possibility to add lung cancer screening, and that was a Order, reasonable please. ask. Time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. Just before we move on to government business, the Honourable Member for Preston Dartmouth on an introduction. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In the East Gallery is uh, my nephew, Jason Balcom. He's a school teacher here in uh, the regional municipality, and wonderful to see him here today. And it's his first visit to the legislature. The Honourable Member for Fairview, Clayton Park, on an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to bring members' attention to your gallery, where we are joined today by maybe arguably the best Liberal MP from Nova Scotia, uh, the former member of uh, the House of Assembly for 10 years in Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River, um, and now our MP for Cumberland, Colchester, Lenore Zan. We'll now move on to government business. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that you do now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into a committee of the whole House on bills. The House will now recess for... The House will now recess for a few minutes while it resolves itself into the committee of the whole House on bills.
Order. The Committee of the Whole House on Bills will come to order. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 220, the Labour Standards Code, respecting leave? I call Bill 220, the Labour Standards Code, respecting leave. I recognize the clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 220 was referred to the House by the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains six clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Carry. Shall Clause 2, I recognize the Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, page 1, Clause 2, please strike out and replace with the following. Clause 59, 3A of Chapter 246, as enacted by Chapter 14 of the Acts of 1991, is amended by striking out one week after in the first and second lines. This is a housekeeping amendment relating to pregnancy leave. The current legislation allows an employee to commence pregnancy leave as early as 16 weeks before the employee's due date. In order to align with changes that we made last year, the bill initially table provided pregnancy leave would commence no earlier than 15 weeks and allow one week after the due date of the baby. What we're doing is we're allowing the full 16 weeks to happen before and this provides more flexibility. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Does the amendment for CWHB Gov 1 carry? Carry. The amendment is carry. Shall, shall clauses three through six carry? carry? Shall the title carry? carry. Shall the bill carry? carry? The bill is carry. Nothing? Oh, okay. Good. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 221, the Labour Standards Code? The Clerk. Oh, I call Bill Number 221, Labour Standards Code. Uh, the Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 221 was referred to the House by the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains <coughs> nine clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Carry. Shall the remaining clauses carry? Carry. Shall the title carry? Carry. Shall the bill carry? Carry. The bill is carried.
I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 223, University Foundations Act. I call Bill Number 223, the University Foundations Act. I recognize the Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 223 was referred to the House by the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains five clauses. Shall subclause 1 1 carry? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Uh, Madam Chair, I have an amendment to move in respect to Clause 12. Um, amendment CWHB Gov 1, uh, page 1, subclause 1. A, read letter clauses A and B as B and C, and B, add immediately before clause B the following clause. Striking out first day of October in the first line and substituting 30th day of June. Uh, Madam Chair, currently all universities report to us their financial statements on the 30th of June, and this will bring the foundations in line with that same reporting. Thank you. Okay. Does the amendment carry? Carry. The amendment is carried. Shall the clause carry? Yeah. No. Shall sub clause 1, 2, and 1, 3 carry? Yeah. Carry. The amendment is. No, I recognize. Okay. Do clauses two through five carry? Yeah. Does the title carry? Yeah. Does the bill carry? Yeah. The bill is carried. Can I confirm that members in the chamber have two change sheets, CWHB PC1 
and CWHB NDP1. Yes? They're different by a couple words. One. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 225, the Elections Act? I call Bill Number 225, the Elections Act, an act to amend. I recognize the Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 225 was referred to the House by the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains 67 clauses. Shall clause, I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm pleased to rise and speak to title for a moment uh, on this bill amending the Elections Act. Uh, as we said at second reading, we're pleased to see uh, many of these changes come through. Uh, we were uh, gratified to meet with the um, Chief Electoral Officer, discuss with him many of these changes, uh, and very happy to see um, that the government has accepted most of them. In particular, uh, we are happy to see that uh, child care and disability expenses relating to campaigning um, will be reimbursed. We have a lot of questions about how that reimbursement will work, and we certainly hope uh, that um, Elections Nova Scotia will continue to solicit advice uh, from the folks affected by those changes. Um, and while the Elections Act is open, our caucus feels strongly that it is time for Nova Scotia to join the rest of Confederation once again and uh, institute fixed election dates, and we will speak to that amendment shortly. Okay. Shall clause one carry? No, no. Pardon? Yes. This is your bill. Yes. Okay. Is this the amendment? This isn't. She spoke to the title. There, excuse me. There, that was speaking to the title. That was not an amendment. Shall does clause one carry? carry. Shall clause two and three carry? carry. I recognize the honor. Uh, recognize the member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm rising today to uh, introduce an amendment to the legislation for Bill Number 225, the Elections Act, as amended. Uh, these are changes recommended to the Committee of the Whole House on Bills. Yeah, you just passed. Yeah, and three passed. This is Clause Four, right? Okay, I'll carry on. Uh, so I'm going to read the, uh, the amendment as uh, the changes as recommended by the PC caucus. So page two, adding the following clause immediately after clause three. Four, chapter five is further amended by adding immediately after section 29 the following section. 29A, section one, nothing in this section affects the powers of the lieutenant governor, including the power to dissolve the House of Assembly at the lieutenant governor's dis direction, discretion. Number two, sub subject to section three and four, the powers of the lieutenant governor referred to in subsection one, notwithstanding any other enactment, a general election must be held on the first Tuesday of June in the fourth calendar year following ordinary polling day for the most recent general election. Number three, where the chief electoral officer is of the opinion that a Tuesday that would otherwise be an ordinary polling day is not suitable for that purpose, including by reason of it being in conflict with a day of cultural or religious significance or a federal or municipal election, the chief electoral officer shall choose another day in accordance with subsection four and recommend to the governor and council that ordinary polling day be that other day and the governor and council may make an order to that effect. Subsection four, for the purpose of subsection three, the chief electoral officer may choose as an alternative ordinary polling day one of the seven days following the Tuesday that would be ordinary polling day. Subsection 5, in the case of general election under subsection 2, an order must not be made under subsection 3 after April 1st in the year in which the general election is to be held. Pages 2 to 20, clauses 4 to 67, renumbered as 5 to 68. Uh, Madam Chair, I just want to take this opportunity, I've already spoken to this. 
One of the things that the public wants us to do as elected officials is to not waste their taxpayers' money. And as I referenced before, in the last election, the government paid people to be trained as pollsters and as people to work in the polling stations not once but twice. And they did that because they may have wanted to call an election in the fall, so they paid people to be trained. They decided not to do that, so at their own discretion, they then paid people twice. Fixed election dates would avoid that unnecessary cost. The other thing is we want as diverse a group running for elected office, but there are barriers when you have no idea when an election might be coming. There are people who work for business owners who are not able to allow them to take an unlimited amount of time off to campaign. So fixed election dates would help every employer in the province who has to let a candidate leave for the 30 days or before. Madam Chair, this is also appropriate for those who are family members who have to make important decisions as to whether they will go back to work to support a candidate who has taken leave to run in an election. There are important decisions that are made in terms of family matters. All of those who want to run for office deserve the best opportunity we can afford them as Nova Scotians. And as a previous member stated, we are one of the only provinces that has not already moved to this. If the government is not going to support this amendment, I would hope that someone on, on the, op, the uh, government side would speak to why on earth we would not want to give people every opportunity to put their name forward. So Madam Chair, with those few remarks, I'll look forward to further debate on this issue and the votes that will be held. Thank you. We will be voting on change sheet CWHB PC1 on the amendment. Does the amendment carry? Oh. The amendment is defeated. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we were pleased to hear the PCs introduce our amendment, but just for the benefit of the Chamber, we will introduce it ourselves. This is the same amendment we introduced yesterday at Law Amendments. But we do quibble over whether it's the first Tuesday in June or the second. They chose the first, we chose the second. We're open. Um, but, uh, but we do feel that it is long since time uh, that we have fixed election dates. We acknowledge that those dates won't always be followed in our system, but it does provide some certainty. Um, it also helps to even the playing field. Uh, it, you know, we've talked a lot about evening the, evening the playing field lately in this legislature. Um, if we know when an election is coming, we can plan for it. Uh, Excuse you can, me, yeah? you should do the amendment before you I speak you to it. I thought you said to point out the difference. Do you want me to read it again? Do you want me to read the whole thing and then point out the difference? Yes. Okay, I'll draw your attention to CWHB NDP-1, uh, page two, this will sound familiar. Add the following clause immediately after clause three. Uh, four, chapter five is further amended by adding immediately after section 29 the following section. 29A sub one, nothing in this section affects the powers of lieutenant governor, including the power to dissolve the House of Assembly at the lieutenant governor's discretion. Sub two, subject to subsections three and four, the powers of the lieutenant governor referred to in subsection one, notwithstanding any other enactment, a general election must be held on the second Tuesday of June, that's the difference between ours and the previous one, in the fourth calendar year following ordinary polling day for the most recent general election. Subsection three, where the chief electoral officer is of the opinion that a Tuesday would otherwise be ordinary polling day is not suitable for that purpose, including by reason of it being in conflict with a day of cultural or religious significance or a federal or municipal election, the chief electoral officer shall choose another day in accordance with subsection four and recommend to the governor and council that ordinary polling day be that other day. And the governor and council may make an order to that effect. 
Subsection 4, for the purpose of subsection 3, the chief electoral officer may choose as an alternative ordinary polling day one of the seven days following the Tuesday that would be ordinary polling day. Subsection 5, in the case of a general election under subsection 2, an order must not be made under subsection 3 after April 1st in the year in which the general election is to be held. Pages 2 through 20, clauses 4 to 67, renumber as 5 to 68. Thank you for your patience. So, um, as I was saying, uh, this allows for some certainty, not entirely certain. Um, it allows candidates to plan for disruptions in employment or caregiving. There are many people who cannot stand for elections in our province because they can't put their life on hold for three, six, nine, 12 months until at such time as a general election is called when we don't know if it will be called at all. Um, and and quite frankly, it's just time that we do this. Um, and so we saw the amendment by our colleagues voted down. Um, we are hopeful that this, by changing the Tuesday in June, that everyone will have a complete change of heart and decide that in fact, now that we're talking about a different Tuesday, it is time for fixed elections. Um, and so with those few words, I will urge uh, my government colleagues to make this change, which is can only be described as sensible. Um, and I will take my seat. Thank you. To be clear, we are voting on change sheet CWHB NDP 1. Does the amendment care? Oh. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Madam Chair, and it's a pleasure to rise again to speak uh, with regard to uh, what's now become uh, an amendment uh, by both my colleagues on the Progressive Conservative as well as with uh, the New Democrats for CWHB NDP-1. Um, you know, whether it's a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, um, you know, those are small changes. Uh, the, the, the real uh, nuts and bolts here of this amendment is the fact that it is, um, it's a change that's long overdue that is representative of really moving forward in a modern democracy. We are on the eve of coming into International Women's Day. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy in the media with regard to some things that have been going on in my own constituency. Uh, and it pains me to know that there are so many, not only women, but so many men who would not be able to put their names forward uh, as candidates to run in a provincial election simply because, you know, you ha like my colleagues have been saying, you have to negotiate that time away. You need to prepare in advance. I mean, running a campaign is an expensive, uh, is a very expensive thing to do. And really, you have to start months in advance in speaking to uh, constituents. It's only a 30-day window. So everyone in this house understands the amount of time, effort, as well as, you know, financial resources that go into campaigning and preparing for an election. So when uh, a snap election is called as opposed to a fixed election, which is being proposed here, and that I proposed as well last Friday in uh, the bill that I put forward, Bill 239, uh, you know, the content is pretty much all the same. And what's really... Uh, you know, ironic, I guess, about this situation is that the content here on the amendments, the, contact, the content in the bill that I've also tabled is identical, really, uh, with, you know, a few changes to a bill that was tabled by our own Premier. In Are you speaking to the amendment? I am speaking to the amendment. I absolutely am. May I continue, please? I absolutely am. So I'm making reference that the amendment that we currently have on the table is almost identical to legislation that's been put forth before. It's been put forth by our Premier in 2013. So it would be wonderful that once members are, are you know, have the, the fortune to move from opposition over to government, that some of these things that perhaps are not so advantageous 
uh, when you're a, a government member because it really, it does, it levels the playing field. This amendment, these bills level the playing field and it makes things more equitable for all Nova Scotians to be able to go forward and be a voice for their constituents in this house. It's a huge privilege to, to be a member of the Legislative Assembly. There's very few of us that get the privilege to be in this house and to represent thousands of people back home. I take it very serious. I would think that most people here take it very seriously as well. But what I, I, what I would like to see, and what I would like to see is a positive legacy that, you know, that I could have a part in and leaving behind would be to make certain that those people that come after me and sit in this chamber have as much of an opportunity to be able to organize themselves, to plan, to be able to make certain that their families are going to be okay and taken care of, that they have the resources that they need to be able to, just like every, every other Nova Scotian, put their name on a ballot. It is an extraordinary thing to be able to do something like that, but we need to be able to help them. I love that the amendments that uh, have been made, uh, I think that they're very positive, but in speaking with uh, a, you know, Elections Nova Scotia last week myself, this is a major amendment that's really been forward for quite some time, and it's a recommendation that's just not coming out of the blue. It's a recommendation that's been directly made by Elections Nova Scotia. There's a huge cost savings to taxpayers, by enacting uh, uh, an, an amendment like this or an overall bill. And at the end of the day as well, we have to be cognizant about where our taxpayer dollars are being spent and how they are being spent. So, you know, again, I would just ask this, uh, our government members to reconsider, especially with this week, going into International Women's Day, that I would ask them to reconsider, considering that the amendments that they put forward to help families overall with childcare and make things a little bit more accessible, that one of the aspects of accessibility and equity is making certain that people know in advance when an election is gonna be called. We're the last province, Madam Chair, the very last province in what I call the cradle of confederation that does not have fixed election dates. Our federal government has fixed election dates, Madam Chair. There is absolutely no rational argument for not having them ourselves, except that it is not advantageous to the government to do so at this time. And with those few words, Madam Chair, I will take my seat. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, to be clear, we are voting on an amendment, um, CWHB NDP 1. Does the amendment carry? No. No. There's been a call for a recorded vote. How long do you want the bells to ring? Will bells will ring till the whips are satisfied.
Are all the whips satisfied? We will now proceed with the recorded vote. Please note we are voting on change sheet CW HB NDP 1. I ask that all members remain perfectly quiet during the vote. All members shall stand and clearly indicate yea or nay. The clerk may proceed. Mr. Churchill. Nay. Mr. Fury. No. Ms. Regan. No. Mr. McClellan. No. Mr. McNeil. Absolutely. Ms. Casey. No. Mr. Wilson. No. Mr. Delory. No. Mr. Caldwell. No. Mr. Glavine. No. Mr. Kasoulis. No. Ms. Miller. No. Mr. Porter. No. Mr. Hines. No. Ms. Metledge Diab. No. Mr. Ince. No. Mr. Rankin. No. Mr. Montbriquet. No. Ms. Arab. No. Mr. Horn. No. Mr. Jessam. No. Mr. McGuire. No. Ms. DiCostanzo. No. Mr. Irving. No. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Bain. Yes. Ms. Masland. Yes. Ms. McFarlane. Yes. Mr. Houston. Yes. Mr. McMaster. Yes. Ms. Chender. Yes. Mr. Burrell. Yes. Ms. Roberts. Yes. Ms. LeBlanc. Yes. Mr. McKay. Ms. Adams. Yes. Mr. Lohr. Yes. Mr. Hallman. Yes. Mr. Rushton. Yes. Mr. Craig. Yes. Ms. Smith McCrossan. Yes. Mr. Johns. Yes. Mr. Comer. Yes. Monsieur Leblanc. Oui. Mr. Ryan. Yes. Mr. Harrison. Yes. Ms. Pawn. Yes. You ready? I recognize the clerk. Those in favor of the motion 23, those, pardon me, those in favor of the motion 22, those against the motion 23. The motion is defeated. Shall clause four through 67 carry? carry. Shall the title carry? carry? Shall the bill carry? carry. The bill is carried. Do we have any new I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill number 226, the Companies Act? I call Bill number 226, the Companies Act. I recognize the Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill number 226 was referred to the House by the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains two clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Carry. carry. Shall the remaining clauses carry? carry? Shall the title carry? carry. Shall the bill carry? carry? The bill is carried.
I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 227, the Legal Aid Act? I call Bill Number 227, the Legal Aid Act, an act to amend. I recognize the Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 227 was referred to the House by the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains 26 clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Carry. Shall Clause 2 through 25 carry? Carry. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. I draw your attention to change sheet CWHB Government 1. Madam Chair, I have an amendment to move specific to page 10, clause 6, line 1, strike out quote unquote section 3, and substitute quote unquote section 2. We are voting on the amendment for Clause 26. Does the amendment carry? Carry. Okay, so then does, does the clause as amended carry? Carry. Okay, thank you. The, cla the clause carries. The clause as amended carries. As amended is carried. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. I draw your attention to change seat, uh, sheet CWHB Government 2. Uh, I have an amendment uh, to move specific to page 10, uh, add after clause 26 the following, section 27, subsection 2.5, uh, sub Five, I'm sorry, comes into force on such day as the governor and council orders and declares by proclamation. So just to confirm, we are voting on a new clause 27 to the bill. Okay. Does the new clause carry? Carry. Carried. Does the title carry? Carry. Does the bill carry? carry? The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 228, the Housing Nova Scotia Act, an act to amend. I call Bill Number 228, Housing Nova Scotia Act, an act to amend. I recognize the Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 228 was referred to the House by the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains three clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? carry? Shall the remaining clauses carry? carry. Shall the title carry? carry? Shall the bill carry? carry? The bill is carried.
Order. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 230, the Municipal Government Act, an act to amend, and the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting ministerial approvals. I call Bill Number 230, Municipal Government Act, an act to amend, and the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting ministerial approvals. I recognize the clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 230 was referred to the House by the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains three clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Carry. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, I move the following amendment um, on, sorry, CWHB and DP1. Uh, Add immediately after clause one the following clause. Two, chapter 18 is further amended by adding immediately after section 220 the following section. 220A, one, a land use bylaw may designate any part of the municipality, including an individual parcel, building, or development, as an inclusionary housing zone. Two, a land use bylaw designating an inclusionary housing zone may A, define housing types by reference to affordability, B, require zoning or a portion of housing built in the zone to be of one or more defined types, and C, create an administrative mechanism to confirm or verify the affordability of housing. Three, a land use bylaw designating an inclusionary housing zone may provide that the municipality may accept money in lieu of an obligation arising under the bylaw. Four, where a municipality accepts money under subsection three, it must use that money for the purpose of inclusionary land use. Um, and page one, clauses two and three, renumber is three and four. So I'm going to, uh, to speak to this briefly. This is actually, um, these amendments are effectively the same as a bill on, uh, on inclusionary zoning that we uh, have put forward, um, which has not come forward for debate, but uh, which is our response to a, a plea from municipalities to have more tools in their toolbox in order to create affordable housing. Um, Inclusionary zoning has been widely used, um, particularly across the United States, but also in Canada, in Vancouver, um, in, uh, in Calgary, I believe in Toronto. Um, and right now, our municipalities do not have this tool in their toolbox. Um, it effectively allows, um, allows an intervention at the broad market um, to require that all developers um, have a certain portion of their um, new builds be, uh, be affordable to the, to the public. And, and because it's done at the level of, um, you know, it, because it applies to all builders, it actually um, results in affordable housing being built without they're always needing to be government public dollars transferring to, to private developers. It actually gets incorporated into the general expenses that developers have um, as they're looking at the calculation of whether they're going to do a project or not, and typically it reduces the land price. Um, uh, we, we, there is so much evidence of this working, um, and there is, there is so much evidence um, of, of its effectiveness and its impact across many jurisdictions. We have been making the pleas in this chamber day after day for various things that this government could be doing faced by a real housing crisis that is affecting Nova Scotians as we are being contacted by constituents who are literally being served notice of $150 to $300 rent increases. Um, there needs to be some adequate government response to this situation and this is one of the things that we could be doing as the province and in fact what it what it does is it allows municipalities to respond where they are seeing significant development hap development happening as we are seeing right now in the Halifax regional municipality um, I 
I do not anticipate that this is uh, going to pass, but I beg the government to consider to look at our legislation, which is also available for them to call as a standalone bill, and, and to recognize that, um, that there are things that government can do through regulation to, to um, intervene and to create to help create a market and a society which is actually fair and livable for the for 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 many Nova Scotians. Right now, we are seeing people not just very low-income people, but we're seeing people at like the the 10 percent, the 20 percent, the 40 percent, the 60 percent of the job market. So people who are middle incomes feeling like they are being um, really costed out of living in our communities. And that's not acceptable. And I would argue that, broadly speaking, it's not good for our economy. When someone who is currently paying 30% um, or 40% of their, their income in rent is all of a sudden faced with spending 50% of their income on rent, that means that they're not going out to restaurants. It means that they're not going out to theater. It means that they're not, they're not making those other purchases that keep all sectors of our economy afloat. We can't just be um, allowing Nova Scotians under our watch to really be impoverished by um, an unregulated and underregulated housing market. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth South. I just want to take a moment, Madam Chair, and speak in support of my colleague's amendment. Um, Order, please. The member from Dartmouth South has the floor. I'll be brief, uh, but but I will say, Madam Chair, that you know, day after day, we come in here and we t we ask about housing, we talk about housing, and we get nothing. And this is a provincial responsibility. We saw rent in we saw rent supplements, and some of those might work. As far as the folks in our offices on the front lines are telling us, and the folks that we work with, they don't work very well. We, do, we don't see very many new units. We're pleased to see the investment that flows from the federal government to the housing plan, but the reality is we need some control over this market. I was told last night, Madam Chair, that one of my oldest family friends who was raised by a single teenage mother whose mother has lived in the same apartment for 20 years, no place to live because the rents went up $100 and then they went up $200 and she's 65 and she's retired on a very limited income, no place to live. I have file after file after file like this in my office and so do all of my colleagues and I'd be surprised if many of you didn't. And so whether it's inclusionary zoning, whether it's rent control, I just want to reiterate the point that we are asking government to look beyond subsidies to the private market to help solve the major housing issues that we are seeing. And if it's not this, I hope it's something else, but I would urge my colleagues in the government to really get serious and stop feeding us talking points about rent supplements when the issue is much bigger. Thank you. I recognize the member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also just want to speak briefly to this amendment um, and provide uh, even, uh, slightly more context than what my esteemed colleagues and articulate colleagues have just uh, provided us. I will say, uh, here's the daily update from Dartmouth North. Uh, several uh, low-income apartment buildings have just changed hands again, Madam Chair, and most of the tenants in those buildings are now living in fear of rent evictions, which of course are uh, mass evictions because landlords buy up buildings and want to renovate them to improve them, but inevitably, uh, when those uh, units become available, they will not be affordable to those people currently living in them. So uh, that, in the last three weeks, that I think would probably brings the total of this exact situation up to probably six or seven buildings in my riding. As I was just texting my constituency assistant, she said that somebody new, a brand new person, had come into the office today having uh, just fa been evicted, no place to go. Madam Chair, it is a crisis. We've been talking about it since last fall fall session, there has been no action except for th however many small amounts of the new builds are. It's not enough. It's not fast enough. Uh, rent supplements will not address the situation when there, where there is no vacancy rate or zero vacancy rate. Madam Chair, 
this also, this, this uh, amendment d does not cost this government a penny. It is simply allowing municipalities the power and the jurisdiction to do something that those politicians and those folks who are hearing from th their uh, citizens are asking for. That's all this is doing. And I urge the government to, in, to, to consider this. When we hear the Premier talk about how he's working with the municipalities, this is one way he could be working with the municipalities on this very serious crisis. Thank you. To be clear, we are voting on a new Clause 2. Does the amendment carry? Oh, no. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 2 carry? Area. Shall Clause 3 carry? Area. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, because the government's uh, bill deals with both the Municipal Government Act and uh, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, I would like to move uh, immediately after the immediately after Clause 3 the following clause. Chapter 39 is further amended by adding immediately after section 235 the following section. 235A1, a land use bylaw may designate any part of the municipality, including an individual parcel, building, or development as an inclusion, inclusionary housing zone. Two, a land use bylaw designating uh, an inclusionary housing zone may A, define housing types by reference to affordability, B, require housing or a portion of housing built in the zone to be of one or more defined types, and C, create an administrative mechanism to confirm or verify the affordability of housing. Three, a land use bylaw designating an inclusionary housing zone may provide that the council may accept money in lieu of an obligation arising under the bylaw, Four, where the council accepts money under subsection three, it must use that money for the purpose of inclusionary land use. Um, Madam Chair, th this uh, this section, this this uh, amendment, is specific to the Halifax Regional Charter, um, uh, Regional Municipality Charter, and just uh, to to make the point that. Um, what we are seeing from, you know, sorry, I want to back up for a moment. When housing moved from being under the Department of Community Services to the Department of Municipal Affairs, I thought that that was potentially a really good move, and I still hope that it, I really still hope that it may be, because inevitably, tackling the complex issue of how we regulate the housing market and how we work to create affordable housing in this province inevitably involves working with municipalities. But I have to say that while, while we welcome the amendment represented by the bulk of this bill, we're also acutely aware that there have been other asks by municipalities that have potential impacts on the housing market, which the, the province has simply just ignored. And this is one of them. This is a major and very well-oiled out tool that, that in a market, like the market that we are experiencing in Halifax, can effectively uh, result in additional units without the province having to build them, without nonprofits having to build them. And then there's the potential for the government to layer on additional supports when there is someone who, uh, who needs additional supports to, to create deeply affordable units. What we have right now in Halifax are a whole bunch of nonprofit providers that effectively are supporting people who actually need deeply affordable units. Um, unit, not just units that are like 90% of the market, but maybe, mark, maybe units that are only 60% of the market and also need social supports. And they are doing that work in the most incredibly difficult context. In the wake of the budget being announced, with the new uh, additional rental supplements being announced in it, I, I had an opportunity to speak with some uh, some housing support workers and and some people working in the nonprofit housing sector, and what they explained to me is is that the rent supplements that have already rolled out 
in our housing market over the last number of years um, have effectively increased the price of deeply affordable units. We went from having, frankly, buildings that most of us would not want to live in, that where, where units cost $600 a month, to now buildings that where most of us would not want to live, that get supplements from this government, where the units now cost $900. Basically, the, the, the rent has gone from what it was previously to that rent plus the rent supplement because the landlords that are, whose business case is based on providing rent to people on income assistance, by and large, who are, who are not going to demand, um, who do not have the power to demand uh, great amenities or a new countertop, or in some cases even security, or in some cases even a, a unit that doesn't have bed bugs. Those people are, are, are now just paying the same amount, but with some additional money provided by the government. So, so I, I started to hear about this very shortly after I was elected, and, and I asked people, I'm like, are rent supplements just driving the, the increase in prices, and, and different people have given me different answers to that. But there is no question that at the, at the sector of our housing market that has been deeply affordable, that deeply affordable section of the housing market is now more expensive, and, and that is not because Nova Scotians are making more money and able to pay more, but because, but because the government has layered on you know, an, an additional, be it 250 or $300 on top of that. That is not how we are going to be able to create inclusive communities. That is not a sustainable way of, 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 of assuming the responsibility that this government has for housing. I said the other day when the NDP was having its convention that the legacy of this government is going to be just millions of dollars of co uh, in contracts with private landlords that guarantee them rent supplements. That is not a legacy. A legacy is, is, is something that we have built or something that we have facilitated to be built. So if it's not going to be units, then at least let it be legislation that enables municipalities to work with the market to, to ensure that we actually are building communities where everybody can live. I, um, we've been talking a lot about the control on short-term rentals, also something that this government could do. We've been talking a lot about rent control, something that is done in other jurisdictions. Frankly, I kind of forgot about inclusionary zoning until somebody came up to me and said, you know, this is what they really have to do. And I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 we have that on the order paper already. Um, and, and as I was preparing to speak to this amendment today, I went to a website and I can table this document from it. Uh, there is a whole website called Inclusionary Housing Canada. And this is from a document uh, which is very well developed from January 24th, 2017, What Makes an Effective Program? And under number eight, it says, recognize the importance of growth. The, 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 the Premier loves talking about our growing economy. Recognize the importance of growth. And here's just a quote from it. The programs work most readily in communities or areas facing sustained and strong growth. They work well there because the growth leads to rising land values that can be tapped to support the provision of affordable housing. Will the member that table that, please? I absolutely will table that. So if that doesn't sound like Halifax, I don't, I don't, know, uh, I don't know what would. Um, this is an opportunity. It would not add any, any additional pressure to um, this extremely capital-rich budget, but it would actually uh, result in some effective... Um, some effective tools at the hands of municipalities to uh, create homes for Nova Scotians who really badly need them. Thank you. We, we are voting on an amendment for a new number four. Does the amendment carry? Oh. The amendment is defeated. Does the title carry? Yeah. Does the bill carry? Yeah. The bill is carried.
I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 232, the Electricity Act. I call Bill Number 232, the Electricity Act, an act to amend. I recognize the Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 232 was referred to the House by the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains five clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Shall the remaining clauses carry? Oh, I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to uh, bring up a, um, uh, an idea that we heard about in law amendments on this, uh, on this bill. Um, the representative from Solar Industries Canada spoke at law amendments, uh, very articulate and uh, interesting comments that he made. Um, and he talked about in, in his comments uh, virtual net metering. And uh, while um, while I'm not going to propose an amendment or haven't proposed an amendment about this, uh, I, I would like to just sort of flag what he talked about uh, with this bill. Um, virtual net metering is essentially uh, sort of uh, an ability for people who cannot access or can, don't have access to solar or wind power uh, on their own individual homes uh, because of either, you know, they live in apartments or uh, the roofs aren't good for solar panels or they can't afford the upgrades that it would, mean, you know, take to get solar panels or wind at their home uh, to choose to sort of pay into a solar farm or, you know, um, uh, or some other kind of wind farm and that way they would be supporting uh, the, the renewable grid uh, and at the same time lowering their power bills. It's a really, I'm not explaining it perfectly well right now, but it's a really uh, great idea and so I, I'm not going to propose an amendment or um, suggest that this bill, um, you know, incorporate that because it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of bigger than the, what this bill is talking about. But I, I just want to flag it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, since the government doesn't seem to like any of our proposals about housing, uh, but I do have this small sliver of hope uh, about about uh, green energy over there. Uh, that I'm, I'm, I can see that the minister is listening to me, and I, and I think that um, it would be good for him to pay attention to. We will be paying attention to it, and maybe come forward with something, uh, some proposal around this idea in the future. Thank you, Madam Chair. Shall the title carry? carry. Shall the bill carry? carry? The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move that you do now rise and report these bills. The motion is carried. The committee will now rise and report its business to the House.
Order, please. The Chair of the Committee of the Whole House on Bills will now report. That the Committee of the Whole has met and considered the following bills. Bill number 221, 225, 226, 228, 230, 232 without amendments, and bills 220, 223, and 227 with certain amendments, and the Chairman has been instructed to recommend these bills to the favourable consideration of the House. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Ordered that these bills be read a third time on a future day. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call public bills for second reading? Now call public bills for second reading. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call bill number 233, the Smoke-Free Places Act and Tobacco Access Act? We'll now call bill number 233, the Smoke-Free Places Act and the Tobacco Access Act. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that Bill 233, Smoke-Free Places Act and Tobacco Access Act uh, be now read a uh, second time. Uh, I will uh, keep my opening uh, marks uh, brief uh, just to uh, highlight the... <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, I know my colleagues are looking forward to estimates where I can keep my uh, comments long. Um, Mr. Speaker, there's five, five key uh, amendments uh, being made uh, between these two uh, acts as part of this bill. Uh, the first one is uh, within the Tobacco Access Act, regulating, providing uh, the province with the ability to regulate the nicotine content uh, within e-cigarette products. Uh, we know uh, and have heard from many uh, uh, the uh, challenges, the uh, potency of nicotine uh, within these uh, products uh, increases the probability of um of addiction uh, to uh, nicotine, nicotine products, uh, and also uh, serves as a gateway into uh, other traditional tobacco products that contain nicotine. Uh, so this is an important uh, feature. The actual details of the uh, nicotine uh, levels would be regulated uh, in regulations, uh, and, uh, and that uh, just provides us the flexibility that should uh, national regulations uh, in this regard be established, uh, that we don't have to have duplicates uh, out there. We'll be able to make uh, uh, more uh, timely and efficient uh, changes uh, through those regulations. Um Within the uh, Act, we also brought in the definition of tobacco. Uh, this is uh, because uh, we don't want to find ourselves in a similar situation as we did with these cigarettes, uh, vaping products, where products that don't meet current legislation uh, definitions make their way into the marketplace, and government is catching up. By broadening the definition of, to, of uh, within uh, our existing legislation uh, to focus on uh, nicotine products, we stay on the forefront so we can be more responsive uh, on a go-forward basis uh, should uh, new technologies and delivery mechanisms come to market. Uh, third thing, um, this is a, a, an amendment that uh, requires individuals to assist in an investigation. Uh, so this would be in a situation where inspectors uh, evaluate uh, they uh, may uh, need the cooperation of employees within a, uh, an organization that may be selling to provide uh, pertinent information or details necessary to uh, complete uh, an order. Um, this does uh, require uh, that uh, reasonable participation to uh, take place. In the uh, and so those three changes are in the Tobacco Access Act uh, portion of the uh, changes, and then in the Smoke-Free Places Act, um, the first change uh, enables uh, peace officers to uh, confiscate and destroy uh, vaping uh, products uh, if uh, confiscated uh, by. Um, uh, a person in possession of product that's not supposed to, uh, that they can confiscate and destroy. That would be uh, similar, consistent with um, tobacco and, uh, and alcohol uh, legislation. And uh, strengthening the language, uh, this is a, a minor clarification uh, being made, to strengthen language around outdoor patio spaces. Uh, it just clarifies uh, current section within the Act. Um, we just uh, have had some uh, inquiries uh, about the uh, language and the intent, um, so this just uh, tightens up to say if there's an outdoor patio space uh, in an establishment that serves uh, food and or alcohol, uh, that it's not uh, to be uh, also uh, providing an opportunity uh, to uh, consume um, a cigarette or e-cigarette uh, tobacco products, um, even if a, the, the patio space is large enough to segregate a, um, 
an area that's not serving alcohol or food if the patio is there and it's generally being used for service. So those are the five uh, amendments being brought in. Obviously the members of the legislature know our intention here is to uh, reduce uh, the uh, amount of e-cigarettes uh, and vaping use, uh, particularly within our youth population. So I look forward to feedback from uh, other members as second reading continues. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, it gives me pleasure to rise here today uh, to uh, address some of the, uh, the thoughts that our party has in regards to uh, Bill Number 233. Um, Mr. Speaker, I want to start by saying it's somewhat ironic because I, uh, although not proud of it, uh, am probably one of the few people in this house that actually smoke and probably the only person under this roof that actually vapes. So uh, I don't know if there's anybody else, but I do vape. And uh, ironically enough, uh, ironically enough, Mr. Speaker, uh, I didn't start smoking until eight years ago when I was 42 years old. Uh, and it was a spin-off of uh, some personal issues and uh, the depression I was going through at time, at that time, and I started smoking. And I managed to actually uh, go 42 years without smoking. And prior to, uh, I always say, often say to people that uh, God has a, uh, a very funny sense of humor sometimes. And, uh, you know, I, I would say that at one point in time, I was uh, quite the snob when it came to, uh, to smoking. And people that smoked, I didn't have very much uh, time or uh, I was pretty critical of those people. And uh, now I am one of those people. So, uh, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Mr. Speaker, and I would also uh, preface my comments by saying that uh, <clears throat> although uh, 14 years ago uh, I actually uh, quit drinking, um, smoking and uh, nicotine addiction is probably one of the hardest addictions personally I've ever been able or ever tried to, uh, to quit. And uh, however, one of the things on a personal level that has helped me uh, to curb from uh, smoking is uh, my use of vaping. And so I know that uh, many people will uh, say that anecdotal uh, evidence is not uh, concrete enough. What I will say is uh, from my perspective, it is had, uh, helped me to uh, curb my smoking and, and get away from, uh, from cigarette smoke. So. I do, I am a proponent of, uh, of vaping. Now having said that, I do, uh, because of my, my own personal uh, addiction to nicotine and, and knowing uh, what I go through, I certainly do not by any means uh, support youth vaping. And uh, Mr. Speaker, one of the things I often say to my two girls is, uh, I have a, a 12 and 13 year old uh, daughters and I tell them constantly uh, not to smoke and I say it's somewhat ironic. I don't think any time in my life have I ever met a smoker who said, Brad, the best thing I ever did in my life was start smoking. Um, I've never met anybody who said that. I've met loads of people that say, man, why did I start smoking? I wished I never started smoking. It was the stupidest thing I've ever done, including myself. And so any legislation that can come forward that helps to uh, curb smoking or in this particular case uh, helps to uh, address the ap epidemic that I think is becoming in our school system around uh, vaping and youth vaping, I think uh, you know our party certainly does uh, support those. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the purpose of this legislation, of course, is to address that issue of youth vaping. And uh, although it does not meet all five recommendations that Smoke Free Nova Scotia brought forward, it does address four of those. Um, you know, studies, Mr. Mr. Speaker, many studies now, vaping has actually been around now for uh, probably the last five or six years. Uh, many studies have happened, uh, both at the federal level, uh, where there's one currently going on at Dalhousie University that I'm aware about, as well as uh, many down throughout the states and in Europe. Uh, there have been many, many studies on vaping. Uh, and those studies do show that youth, youth who typically use e-cigarettes are four times more likely to go on to smoke regular cigarettes than their peers who do not vape. 
Obviously, Mr. Speaker, something does have to be done, and it is quickly becoming an epidemic in our schools. I've met uh, with school uh, students at Millwood High, as well as uh, some junior high students. Uh, I've talked with a variety of teachers around vaping and principals, and, and it is becoming, uh, in some cases, out of hand uh, for the principals uh, trying to, to deal with these, uh, the jewels particularly, uh, which is a type of uh, vaping instrument that a lot of the kids are using now in school. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would, I would think that, well, obviously lex less toxic than a combustible cigarette. Um, E-cigarettes e e do make, uh, they do contain nicotine on most cases and uh, they still contain toxic chemicals, um, nicotine being addi addictive and also studies have shown of course that nicotine is harmful uh, to the developing adolescent brain. So I guess I, you know, and overall, as I will talk about, uh, we do uh, support this legislation. I do have some concerns in regards to where I think the legislation is somewhat weak and not hitting, uh, not hitting the mark. Um, you know, I, I believe, and, and I, I will ask some questions, and perhaps during uh, closing remarks, uh, if, the, uh, if the minister might have an opportunity, he may be able to, uh, to address some of these uh, questions that I will ask, Mr. Speaker. Um, if not, I'm sure they will come up at law amendments as well. But I'm, I'm curious to see that uh, although this legislation does look at uh, having um, retailers, manufacturers, uh, uh, point of sale, all registered. Um, I do have some concerns that it doesn't uh, regulate or restrict the sale of e-cigarettes and vaping products in convenience stores and gas stations and limit them only to specialty shops. And I guess where my concern with that is, is when it comes to youth vaping particularly, um, you know, particularly with the stealths or the jewels, which are the ones that do have a higher nicotine content, um, those are usually sold in convenience stores and, uh, and uh, gas stations and corner stores and things like that. It's, they're not typically, although also sold in uh, specialty stores, Mr. Speaker, um, when we get into some of the other diverse uh, vaping products that are out there, those are typically not sold in corner stores. It's these jewels or stealths or pearls and and uh, those ones that are being uh, sold and those are the ones that uh, the youth seem to be uh be uh, purchasing. Now there's a number of reasons uh, that they purchase them which I'll get into in a minute but those are the ones that additionally have the highest level of nicotine levels and I do know that this legislation does uh, look to limit that but uh, you know I think that that to go further to have restricted these to only specialty shops uh, would make it a little bit more difficult to get into the hands of youth and and right now I know uh, Millwood High School which is in in my constituency there's two uh, corner stores uh, convenience stores that are in walking distance of uh, of the high school I know one of them does uh, sell these products I can't say whether or not they're selling them to uh, students Students, but I know that they do sell them and thereby uh, students, you know, have a tendency of getting them. Um, according to a study that was uh, released, it's the uh, Truth Initiative, it actually showed that 74% of all youth that are currently vaping uh, are obtaining uh, jewels through uh, via corner stores and uh, so this legislation doesn't, even though it does say that they have to be behind the counter and hidden similarly to cigarettes, I think that if we were really trying to, uh, to address this issue of uh, vaping, uh, then we would uh, try to limit where those could be sold. And, you know, it is within the last year, we've actually seen an uptake in, uh, in youth uh, cigarette usage as well. I think stats are showing that now. 
Um, and uh, I have talked uh, with numerous uh, uh, shop owners, specialty shop owners. I do know that, uh, Mr. Speaker, when, when this topic uh, around uh, vaping came up at the Legislative uh, Health Committee, I do know that uh, a number of the, the members, uh, the two members that sit on this one, uh, Argyle Barrington, and I believe, uh, I forget the other number, Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. I know at that time they both uh, both members raised and requested that uh, members from the industry be able to come in and present to the House, uh, and uh, that committee decided not to do that. Um, what I would suggest, uh, you know, is is vaping and the discussions around vaping are not as black and white as what I would think that many members in this house think they are. There are many different types of uh, vapes that are out there, um, very different t terminologies and very different uh, uh, aspects to vaping that, that make it it's actually quite an interesting uh, uh, industry, but it is complex to understand it all, and it's not necessarily an industry that uh, you can swat with a fly swatter and, you know, one, one swat kills all. I think there's many aspects to it, and, uh, you know, when, it, when the legislation is coming forward under the auspices of trying to address youth vaping, then I think that that's where we need to focus, and we need to be able to focus on things that, that that, uh, deter youth from getting into vaping. So, and I have met with uh, students as well. I, I think I said at Millwood High School and others. Um, Mr. Speaker, I do see that in uh, in the uh, in the budget highlights re uh, report that we were given on page five. Uh, it does say that uh, one of these things is an introduction of a tax on vaping products that will begin in September 2020 to support the efforts to decrease youth vaping. Nova Scotia is one of the first provinces to do this. Um, I do recognize that uh, that that is the auspices, but I do have questions. It's estimated that the revenue that will be generated under the tax on vaping materials, both on e-juice, on uh, bricks, and and uh, the materials that are used as well, that they will generate about uh, three point or two point three million uh, in the 2021 year, with a future future annual estimated revenue of four point three million. So one of the questions that I am curious to know is specifically how much of that revenue that's going to be generated the, uh, this year and in ongoing years is actually going to be assigned to programs, uh, dedicated to programs to educate uh, and deter youth from vaping in our schools. And I think that considering that youth vaping is the reason for this new tax, that uh, we should actually be able to see uh, exactly what money is going into vaping and, and per, uh, preventative education towards vaping. And uh, I do also feel that that should be a percentage amount and not a dollar amount because, uh, of course, it will fluctuate the income that's com or the amount of income coming in, and uh, so that should be a percentage amount. I don't really see that. That may be in. Uh, that may be uh, able to see that in uh, what the Minister of Finance uh, uh, brought forward today. I, I'm assuming that uh, there are the, the amounts of fines and some of these things will be in there, so I'll look at that when I have an opportunity. But I, uh, I am curious to know exactly what the percentage is of the new revenue generated that will be going specifically to uh, education. Um, just for... Uh, members uh, for the education of members, um, the impact, what I'm figuring out the impact of this new tax means, on average a bottle of uh, e-juice, and there's different e-juices the same way that there's different bottles of wine, and the same way that there's different types of beer, and there's the same way, so there's a variety of e-juices out there, um, but a typical average bottle of e-juice currently runs about 20 bucks a bottle. Um, with the new tax that's going on, this I see it uh, more than tripling to probably about an average of fifty dollars a bottle, and uh, I say that here ho with the hopes that uh, the vapors that are out there that don't realize uh, where this is going recognize uh, what that impact is going to be. 
uh, financially and uh, it's a pretty significant impact. So I'd like to see how much money is actually going into education. Mr. Speaker, nicotine, of course, is one of the top five most ag addictive substances on the earth. As I've already said, unfortunately, uh, I've become addicted to that substance. Um, it is only behind heroin, cocaine, alcohol, and of course, cocaine would be crack or molly or whatever. Um, Many adults have chosen vaping as a long-term alternative for cigarettes or a method to gradually reduce nicotine consumption, which eventually will lead to total quitting. Similar to other nicotine uh, replacement substances that exist currently, other therapies like gums, patches, there's lozenges, medications, anybody who smokes or knows somebody who smokes knows what they are. Studies have shown that vapes and e-cigarettes do improve the quitting from typical tobacco cigarettes. And, and uh, I did raise today, Mr. Speaker, in our caucus that uh, there are places in Europe now where they are actually looking at, uh, with the uh, prescription of a doctor, that you'll actually be able to get a prescription to get a vape to help you get off of smoking, similar to how you'd have to get a, a, a prescription to get Champex or different types of medications that we have now. For me, it seems somewhat counterproductive. Unless most of the money that is going to be generated on this tax is going into education and preventative measures, it seems somewhat counterproductive to me that there be a tax put on something that is there to help people to quit smoking. I think that uh, any smoker or uh, anybody who wants to quit smoking and they're using vaping as a, as a method to do that, it seems uh, somewhat uh, counterproductive to me. That is until I looked in our budget to see how much money we currently make on smoking. And I discovered that uh, this year the projected revenues on tobacco products are $196 million. $196 million is what the province of Nova Scotia has in their budget leading from, from traditional tobacco products. I now kind of understand why we want to keep people smoking and we don't want to encourage or provide opportunities or things to have people stop smoking because we're making $196 million a year on smokers. So I, you know, once again, we are, if we are looking at taxing, uh, taxing vaping products, which have been proven to be a, a method for people to quit smoking, um, it would be, it's too bad that some of that money couldn't go back into other alternatives to try to help people reduce the cost of, of uh, if people don't want you to use vaping to quit smoking, then to go to help offset the cost of medications, lozenges, patches, or any of the other things that I currently sp spoke about. But uh, when I see $196 million in a budget, uh, I do recognize why we want everybody who smokes to keep smoking. Uh, I'm not saying that there's no harm to vaping. And, uh, you know, I, I know that studies have said that there are uh, chemicals that are still in vapes, and I know that uh, current evidence is there that shows it. However, what I will speak about for a minute is my personal experience in regard to vaping. I don't wake up coughing and hacking. I breathe better. I don't. I. I. I, I don't smell terrible like smoke. I, I. I. just feel better when I vape, and so therefore, uh, you know, I. I recognize once again, as I said earlier, I. I know that's my personal experience, but other people I've talked to uh, have said the same things, and I'm not saying that that uh, there's no downsides to vaping. But I will say, I do fundamentally believe, and studies have shown that, vaping is less harmful than smoking. And I've often said to somebody, I'd much rather be slapped in the face than punched in the face. And uh, that's kind of how I feel when it comes to uh, vaping versus cigarettes. I know that they're both going to hurt, but one hurts a little bit less. Obviously, uh, 
Obviously, uh, Mr. Speaker, the best thing people can do for their health is to quit, vac or quit smoking and, and don't do anything. However, uh, completely uh, replacing uh, tobacco cigarettes with uh, e-cigarettes or vapes will certainly reduce the number of uh, toxic cancer-causing harmful chemicals that are found in tobacco that aren't found in vape products. Uh, Mr. Speaker, one of the other parts that I totally uh, do like about this legislation, we do support, is the ability to provide uh, regulatory authorities the uh, ability to uh, confiscate uh, restricted nicotine, uh, e-juices, e-cigarettes and other products uh, from people that uh, are from underage uh, users. We certainly support that. Um, I think that that legislation, I've questioned for a number of years why that education or why that legislation was not put into place. Um, I remember when as a youth, uh, you know, we were always afraid to uh, drink underage because I think it was a $250 fine and, uh, you know, the, the police had the ability to confiscate your six pack or whatever. Um, what I will say for members of the House here, some of these products that uh, youths are using, although 75% of them are using things like the jewels and the stealths, which are very, uh, very small. I don't actually uh, use a jewel um, because of the, uh, because of the, uh, nicotine content that's in them, but uh, they're very small, they're able to be concealed well, they look like uh, a typical USB drive and uh, most people wouldn't know what they, they were, but some of these products are big and expensive and, you know, people can drop down $200, uh, $200 $250 for uh, uh, a good brick or a battery with uh, the juice in the, the container that holds the juice and so there, there some kids are investing a lot of money into these I do think that having the ability for uh, uh, regulatory authority for policing and to confiscate these that will hurt uh, hurt the pocket uh, of some of these people that are using them um, as I, as I was saying, I, I also uh, totally support and think that it's, uh, it's great that the, this legislation provides the opportunity to limit the amount of nicotine content. And uh, particularly since the two that are the two of the uh, products that are being sold currently uh, that are more... Uh, the more favorite of students are probably the two, and I mentioned one earlier, Jewel and, and Stealth. Those are the two that actually have the highest nicotine content of anything. And, uh, you know, I've, I, as I said, I, I vape. Um, I vape at, uh, I'm down now, actually, I'm down to about 18 milligram content. But uh, usually uh, the, the types of vapes that people that are getting off smoking will use are usually starting at uh, 25 milligrams and, uh, of nicotine and they go down from there. Jewels are 50. And uh, one of the things that are somewhat ironic is uh, people, Jewels do not have, you can't get zero nicotine as far as I know. It's either uh, 50 or 35, both of which, like I tried a Jewel one time and was going to pass out just from one, uh, one hit on it. So those are the things that, that the youth are using and the nicotine levels in those are like off the charts. So I think any legislation that comes forward that it gives us the ability to limit the amount of nicotine. Now in Europe they've started to do this and so Jewel turned around and they came out with a, a lesser nicotine uh, uh, pods, they came out with smaller pods, but uh, right now they're the, the highest concentration of any nicotine content um, on the market. What the legislation doesn't talk about, and, and I don't know if the ministers ever looked into this, but there's also a thing called uh, Nick Salt, or uh, Nick salts, uh, which are, uh, it's a different type of liquid that uh, is used. It's the same type of liquid, I believe, that's in the Juul. And uh, it, it uh, has a higher concentration uh, consumption level. You breathe it in and it goes into your lungs about two point uh, two and a half times faster than what a normal e-cigarette does. Um, so, uh, you know, I think being able to confiscate these things is a great thing. I think being able to, to limit the amount of uh, nicotine concentrations, we, I think that's a great thing. Um, 
I do, uh, and, and uh, just for members' knowledge, the average cigarette typically contains about 13.4 milligrams of nicotine, um, but you're not always, you don't inhale the entire cigarette, you take a couple puffs here and there. So the average uh, amount of nicotine that gets into a system is uh, roughly around two milligrams from the entire cigarette. Um, and it, even if you smoked a whole pack, uh, you're, gonna, you're only gonna be at about uh, 36 milligrams of nicotine. The nicotine found in a Juul is 50 milligrams, like it's really strong, so to be able to limit that is great. Now, one of the, qu the further questions I have is in regards to uh, section seven, I don't know where I just put that, is in regards to section seven where it's talking about the, uh, the, the ability to limit, uh, to limit nicotine, uh, oh, here we are. Uh, clause seven and clause eight, uh, they actually discuss uh, being able to restrict the nicotine concentration. And then it goes on and says, and the maximum capacity of electronic cigarettes. And so perhaps the minister would be able to let me know this, but I'm, I'm confused if that's referring to the maximum capacity of the battery, the maximum capacity of the uh, of the fluid, the maximum capacity of the tank, or the maximum uh, capacity of the burner. So I'm not quite sure in, the, in that respect. My suggestion would be is that uh, uh, it should probably identify exactly what, you know, uh, what's uh, the maximum capacity of. And I would also think that maximum capacity is somewhat uh, restricted. I would also, I would suggest that the word maximum be removed altogether because it could be a minimum that would then, uh, by, by having a minimum size, uh, and ironically, I, I keep talking about jewels, but jewels actually have the smallest pods for sale. So if it's a minimum size of the pod, what co this legislation could do is it could uh, create a market where it's a monopoly of only one seller. And, and I don't think that that's uh, what the, the intention of this legislation is. So I, it would be nice to be able to see uh, what, uh, identify what that's talking about. Um, Make sure I got everything here that I was talking about. <coughs> oh, there they are. I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, I misplaced my notes. Um, so, uh, let me see what else we got here. Uh, as I spoke earlier, I do think that uh, this doesn't uh, identify nicotine salts, uh, which are not normal e-juice that are, are sold um, and can deliver up into the blood uh, two and a half times faster than other e-cigarettes. Um, I'd also like to point out, as I, as I said earlier, this legislation does hit on four of the five things that uh, uh, that were recommendations of smoke-free Nova Scotia. I do note uh, that uh, this legislation doesn't increase the age from 19 currently, uh, although it is something that uh, I, I believe that smoke-free Nova Scotia had requested. Um, Canadian Cancer Society has actually said that they support a, uh, a federal uh, rise in smoking age, uh, minimum smoking age to 21, and uh, they've actually suggested in a study that they put out in 2015 that if it's somewhat inevitable that sooner or later provinces will eventually do this. Anyhow, ironically, uh, Prince Edward Island, as of uh, Sunday just past March the 1st, they actually were the first province in Nova Scotia that actually did this and raised the uh, the minimum age uh, from 19 to 21 for smoking. Um, the uh, Canadian Cancer Society, Mr. Speaker, has actually uh, suggested that by increasing the smoking age from 19 to 21, it would actually reduce smoking uh, uh, by 12 percent and uh, thus smoking related deaths would also reduce by about uh, 10 percent. 
Um, as I said earlier, I am looking forward to see what the fines are. Um, I, I do see that fines are able to be levied here, but it's unclear what the actual fine is, uh, both towards the uh, individual user as well as uh, industry or stores that are caught uh, breaking the law. And uh, and I think, Mr. Speaker, I think uh, that was a half an hour. I did pretty good. I think that's the longest I talked on anything here. Um, Mr. Speaker, so with that, uh, I do know that there will be uh, many, 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 many people coming uh, to, to law amendments. I do expect there will be many people, especially when it gets out uh, what the price of uh, juice is going to do under this particular legislation. So I would uh, encourage uh, the, uh, the host leader uh, or whoever it is that sets the uh, agenda for uh, law amendments to take that into consideration. It could be a very long, uh, a long law amendments committee, and uh, I, I certainly will be there. I look forward to hearing what uh, members of the Cancer Society, uh, members of. Uh, Canada Health, I'm sure, will be there as well as people from the industry, particularly given the fact that I don't think that the industry uh, was really consulted in regards to this legislation. What I will say in closing, Mr. Speaker, is if the industry had been consulted with the issue of youth vaping and said, how can we make this, how can we address this? I think that the industry would have come out and uh, made some suggestions to, to, uh, that would have, would have helped this. I'm, I'm sure that the, uh, the amendments and the legislation that are before us will help, but I think, uh, it, uh, you know, I, I think that there were other opportunities that could have been missed. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I'll leave it where it is and uh, wait to hear what is said in law amendments. And thank you very much, everyone, for your patience. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I would like to add a, a few brief comments about our thinking about uh, this legislation at its second reading. I'll say uh, first that there are certainly uh, components, um, key components of the government's overall uh, regulatory approach to the vaping question that uh, we, we find uh, commendable and worthy of support. Um, from, uh, I guess, not quite that brief. Uh, uh, particularly looking at the matter from a consumer protection point of view, it, it only makes sense that uh, the province should have the regulatory authority uh, to form regulations over nicotine levels in nicotine-containing products. Um, one person doesn't need to be uh, an expert either from personal experience or study to understand the basics about the, the character of the product of nicotine and to understand that it's uh, uh, its intensity, its concentration, is something that regulatory authorities ought to be able to have control over. So this, this is a, a welcome uh, component of this legislation. And the parallel component of this uh, piece of the legislation, the, the matter of broadening the definition of tobacco, uh, this also makes plain sense in this current universe of which there is such a, a wide, wide range of nicotine containing, not necessarily tobacco specific uh, products. Uh, so these are, these are things that, that make eminent sense. And, and overall, in general, certainly um, it makes sense. And this is a, a key component of the legislation uh, about vaping, which we in the NDP brought forward some time ago, uh, it makes sense that there need to be uh, thoroughgoing and serious measures, uh, uh, and we see them in this act and, uh, and we, we support them, that there need to be thoroughgoing and serious measures that will uh, continue to further discourage um, the use of vaping amongst young people. Uh, so these are all things uh, that uh, we are happy to be aligned with. At the same time, though, it's, I think it's Im also important to say 
that there are some real concerns uh, we have, as do others, with the government's general treatment of the vaping question at the moment. I guess the central fact about the vaping world uh, is the extent to which it's composed of people. Uh, my colleague, the previous speaker, uh, spoke to this at the first part of his remarks. The thing about the vaping world is the great extent to which it's composed of people who are addicted to nicotine, but people for whom vaping has proven to be the only effective means for getting off smoking. We know there are many, many such people. Uh, and from this point of view, it is awfully difficult for us to understand what is the public health purpose that's being served by the measures that we have before this house that will make vaping, in effect, more expensive than consuming combustible tobacco. So this is, a, this is an area of concern. Secondly, in the uh, proposed legislation on the subject, which was put forward by our, from our party, at the core of it are provisions that would uh, limit the availability of vaping products to specialized uh, nicotine product related stores. Um, at the time we brought that legislation forward, we thought it was uh, key to the kind of intelligent regulatory regime that the province needs to have uh, for vaping. We continue to think that this would be key uh, to a constructive regulatory regime uh, for vaping and that it is the right path forward. And we're sorry to see that uh, this provision doesn't have any place within uh, the overall orbit of the legislation that the government is putting here, uh, putting forward here. But these, uh, Mr. Speaker, are the comments I would like to make at second reading. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health, it will be for second reading of Bill Number 233, the Smoke-Free Places Act and the Tobacco Access Act. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate uh, the uh, comments and, and feedback uh, from uh, uh, my colleagues uh, opposite um, for, uh, I guess, a, a couple of points uh, uh, just of, of clarity for the members on the floor. Uh, to be clear, this legislation uh, as tabled, this bill, uh, affects amendments to two acts. Uh, the Smoke-Free Places Act and the Tobacco Access Act only. The five amendments uh, that uh, I noted in my opening remarks, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, remains the, the scope of this uh, particular bill. Uh, much of the uh, commentary did delve into questions about taxation. Uh, that is something regulated and governed uh, uh, by the uh, Department of Finance. Uh, that is um, responding consistent uh, with the uh, existing regulatory regime for uh, traditional tobacco products. Uh, so for those that may be wondering uh, why the Department of Finance has the, the portion of our response uh, for e-cigarettes uh, relating to licensing and uh, taxation and, and fines, uh, it is because that is where the traditional tobacco uh, structure uh, that we've uh, inherited uh, lie. And for simplicity of maintaining the administrative structure in place uh, for that licensing regime uh, they would maintain. So those discussions around taxation and so on, uh, I would uh, advise my colleagues uh, that uh, those discussions will be had, I think, in, in more detail uh, when the FMA uh, bill, Financial Measures Act, uh, moves through uh, debate. Uh, as it relates to this particular bill, uh, again, I think um, the question about uh, max capacity, that is uh, broadly talking about capacity of the devices to, uh, with liquids, juices, uh, whether it's the container or the pods or, or what have you, is, is broadly what we're looking at there. So how much capacity can one, um, I'll, I'll say serving in, 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 a, um, in the refill or the pod uh, that's being uh, utilized in a device. Um, so it's so again about how much uh, content can be delivered uh, in one, um, it, in one device is, is the uh, area we're looking at uh, that, but it, maintaining uh, a little bit more uh, broad language in the act gives us that flexibility to assess at the regulatory stage as we're building that uh, to ensure that we have um, 
regulations that can respond. So if there are other uh, ways to interpret or apply that uh, make uh, good public health sense, uh, that's why uh, providing the enabling um, uh, legislation to build that in, in the regulations allows us to respond. Uh, I'd remind uh, members, I know there's some suggestions about uh, some other uh, features that uh, they may like to see. Uh, the first uh, phase and, and step, uh, again, is not in this act as it relates to licensing, um, but that is a, a stage that we're taking about the uh, avenues for procuring these products. Uh, again, a different piece of legislation is addressing that. Uh, and um, uh, that uh, work is, is being done through the Department of Finance. Uh, we believe that these acts, though, Mr. Speaker, will, will uh, move us forward. And I'd remind members that uh, as a government, uh, we uh, this is the second or third time we've uh, opened these pieces of legislation in the last six years. Um, so the ability to respond to the needs uh, of Nova Scotians to help continue our uh, leadership as uh, pursuing a tobacco-free uh, province uh, is uh, consistent, and not just for this government. It's been amended over the years by all governments uh, in response to the very real health challenges we have. So uh, I think uh, this is very important to be able to move these uh, changes forward in a timely manner uh, and uh, there's always opportunity to uh, pursue and, and look at other amendments in the future. So with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank everyone's uh, comments and advice and uh, look forward to uh, the progress of this bill through the remaining sta stages and with that, move to close uh, second reading on Bill 233. Motion is for second reading of Bill Number 233, the Smoke-Free Places Act and the Tobacco Access Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill Number 233, an act to amend Chapter 12 of the Acts of 2002, the Smoke-Free Places Act, and Chapter 14 of the Acts of 1993, the Tobacco Access Act. Ordered that this bill be referred to the Committee on Law Amendments. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill Number 234, the House of Assembly Act. We'll now call Bill Number 234, the House of Assembly Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move that Bill 234, an act to amend Chapter 1, 1992 Supplement of the Revised Statutes 1989, the House of Assembly Act, be now read a second time. Mr. Speaker, through this bill, we are introducing amendments to the House of Assembly Act, which will help ensure the ongoing safety and security of the Legislature. The Sergeant at Arms is responsible for the crucial role of safety and security here in the Legislature. The position is responsible for developing and implementing security policies and procedures, advising the Speaker and Clerk on issues of security, and ensuring the safety and security of members, legislative staff, the press gallery, and visitors. The Sergeant at Arms is also responsible for supervising security personnel and acting as liaison with elected officials, legislative staff, police and government departments. Ensuring that this role, including its accountabilities and responsibilities, is clearly defined in legislation is essential. It is also imperative that the Sergeant at Arms has the proper resources and authorities to do his job. Mr. Speaker, this bill includes four changes. First, the Sergeant at Arms will be granted the powers, authority, privileges, rights and immunities of a peace officer under common law, the criminal code and other federal and provincial legislation in province house or in fresh pursuit. This includes the legislative authority to possess and use a firearm or other weapon that police are authorized to use in Nova Scotia. The current Sergeant at Arms David Frazier was made a special constable when he was hired in 2016. As a special constable to the legislature, he is permitted to possess, carry and use a firearm to fulfill his security role and responsibilities. With these changes, we are ensuring that this government and authority is clearly outlined in the legislation. The second change will give the Sergeant at Arms the authority in the event of an incident to pursue persons that leave the premises when required and when appropriate. This will be a new authority granted to the position. Third, the Sergeant at Arms position will be required to have the same training and certification that police officers must have in Nova Scotia to possess and use a firearm and other weapon used by police. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Frazier is a former RCMP officer and has the training and license to carry and use a firearm. 
The legislation, however, has never stipulated that the Sergeant at Arms, whoever holds this position, must undergo the same training and certification as police officers in Nova Scotia. The final change, Mr. Speaker, will give you, the Speaker of the House, the authority to appoint the Sergeant at Arms and the Governor and Council the authority to determine the salary. Currently, the salary is set in legislation. This means a legislative process must be undertaken to adjust the salary. Mr. Speaker, these changes ensure that the legislation better aligns with the safety and security role of the Sergeant at Arms and clearly sets out the required authorities and powers of the position. Mr. Speaker, the legislature is one of the cornerstones of our democracy. The work that takes place here by members of the legislature, staff and the press gallery is the foundation of our democracy. Mr. Speaker, we must always be vigilant and prepared to ensure that this democratic institution and the people who work and visit here upholding our democratic values and processes are safe and secure and that they are free from any concerns about their personal safety. That is why these changes are necessary to ensure that the person accountable and responsible for our safety and security is properly equipped to prevent and respond to threats and that the legislation supporting the role is clear. Mr. Speaker, my hope is that we will never experience a threat or incident here. However, in my 30 years of policing experience, it has taught me that the best way to prevent an incident from happening is by having robust and thorough plans, policies and protocols in place. Mr. Speaker, in closing, I want to thank the people who work here at Province House to ensure that we are safe and secure every day. The commissioners, the members of Halifax Regional Police and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and our Sergeant at Arms, Mr. David Fraser, who is doing an exemplary job in his role. Here, here. With those comments, Mr. Speaker, I look forward to comments of my colleagues opposite. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to rise to uh, speak to second reading of Bill 234, House of Assembly Act. Mr. Speaker, the position of Sergeant at Arms was established at the Nova Scotia Legislature in 1790. Our province and our world have undergone enormous changes and advancements in the last 230 years. Similarly, the role of the Sergeant of Arms uh, has changed just as security at Province House has changed. I'm thinking of the addition of metal detectors not so long ago. While I'm sure we regret some of these measures included in this bill are necessary, we in the PC Caucus support giving the Sergeant at Arms the authority and the equipment he or she needs to protect visitors, MLAs and staff at Province House, the People's House. I know I am not alone in this house when I say how appreciative we are for the work of our current Sergeant at Arms. <laughs> Absolutely. There is a sense of safety while doing our jobs each day in this house under his watch and all the commissioners and staff who assist him. This bill gives us the opportunity to commend and thank the current Sergeant at Arms and all the past Sergeant at Arms. Mr. Speaker, all who have had the privilege to serve in this historic place in recent years benefited from the service and friendship of the late Dalmore Buddy Day, Doug Giles, the late Noel Knockwood, and the late Kenneth Greenham. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the PC Caucus supports this modernization of the House of Assembly Act that reflects the needs of modern society. We have the utmost respect for the position of Sergeant at Arms and the service they have provided and continue to provide to our province, and we are happy to support the measures that help them at that task. I thank the Minister and his department for bringing forward this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm to recognize the Honourable House Leader for the new Democratic Party. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise and say a couple of words uh, to the Act to amend the House of Assembly Act. I would join in the comments of my colleagues in recognizing the service of the current Sergeant at Arms and past Sergeant at Arms and all the staff here at Province House who keep us safe. Um, I think in increasingly um, there are times when all of us um, 
really personally appreciate that and, and have challenges and that's the nature of the work that the decisions we make won't always be popular and people might respond to the, those decisions in all different kinds of ways um, and it does offer some measure of security that we can do the work we need to do in this chamber um, with without fear for our personal safety. Um, beyond that, I would say that you know, we as MLAs have been aware, as as the minister pointed out, that this particular sergeant at arms has had has has had um, this training and and does uh, carry a firearm. Um, and so, while this is a change to the act, it's not a change to the circumstance here in the chamber. Um, and so, we're pleased to support this bill. If I recognize the Honourable Minister of Justice, it will be for a second reading of Bill Number 234, the House of Assembly Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'll take this opportunity to thank my colleagues for their supporting comments. Mr. Speaker, I rise to close debate on Bill uh, 234, the House of Assembly Act. Motion is for a second reading of Bill Number 234, the House of Assembly Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill number 234, an act to amend Chapter 1, 1992 supplement of the revised statutes 1989, the House of Assembly Act. Ordered that this bill be referred to the Committee on Law Amendments. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill number 236, the Railways Act. We'll now call Bill number 236, the Railways Act. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Speaker, I move that Bill 236, the Railways Act, be read a second time. It is a pleasure to speak to this legislation today. These amendments, Mr. Speaker, will improve government's oversight of the province's provincially regulated railways. It will also provide clarity to railway companies of their obligations and duties under the Act. Rail transportation is important to our economy, Mr. Speaker. Therefore, it is important that it is well regulated and that there is appropriate oversight. There are currently a number of gaps and deficiencies in our legislation, <clears throat> which make it challenging for government to ensure that railway companies maintain and repair their infrastructure. The amendments before the House today will make clear the public safety and maintenance obligations for discontinued, abandoned, non-operational, or unlicensed railroads in the province. These changes will increase the obligations on railway owners to, make more to take more responsibility for their rail infrastructure. This bill will ensure rail companies governed by this act keep their rail lines, bridges and crossings maintained to a safe standard, even when they are no longer operational. The legislation will require the Nova Scotia sh that Nova Scotia short line railway companies to have their infrastructure inspected by a qualified inspector every five years to ensure that any rail assets <clears throat> don't become public safety issues. The Provincial Railways Act governs short line railways. The Federal Railway Safety Act governs interprovincial and international railways like CN. Mr. Speaker, in Nova Scotia, we have three short line railways the Sydney Coal Railway, the Windsor Hansport Railway, and the Cape Breton and Central Nova Scotia Railway. The Sydney Coal Railway is owned by Nova Scotia Power. It was fe federally regulated until 2018 when Nova Scotia hired a new operator. At that time, the Canadian Transport Agency determined that the railway was no longer under its federal authority. Because of the nature of its operation, it is now considered an industrial railway and therefore outside of the provincial authority as well. <clears throat> As a result, it has been operating without direct regulatory oversight, although it continues to follow the federal rules. We have no concerns with the operations currently. However, the line has 42 crossings in CBRM, so it is important that it be regulated for reasons of public safety. The <clears throat> amendments we are proposing to the Act will extend legislative and regulatory oversight to the Sydney Coal Railway. CBCNS is a long-established railway company in Nova Scotia. In 2015, it discontinued its St. Peter's to Sydney portion of its Truro to Sydney, leaving several bridges, including large structures at Grand Narrows and Ottawa Brook crossings, and a number of culverts 
as potential liabilities. It is important that our legislation provide clarity on the obligation it has for that section of discontinued line. The Windsor Hansport Rail Company ceased operations in 2011 with the closure of Fundy Gypsum Mine, its only customer. Regrettably, the Halfway River Abateau failed in 2017, causing a threat to local public infrastructure upriver. The company would not take responsibility for the structure, which forced the province to step in and initiate repairs at public expense. The incident involving the Abateau is just one example of a deficiency in our legislation and highlights that the Act isn't as strong as it needs to be to protect the public interest of Nova Scotians. The Railway Act currently does not give clear authority to intervene and repair rail railway infrastructure even when public safety is put at risk. That will change under this bill, Mr. Speaker. The proposed amendments will address this deficiency. In the future, if an owner fails to act, this legislation will give the province the authority to step in to recover costs when government has to make repairs in the interests of public safety. I would also point out, Mr. Speaker, that this bill will further clarify the roles and responsibilities of the Utility and Review Board, which is the licensing body under the Railways Act. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I look forward to hearing from my colleagues across the aisle. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um make a few comments in Bill 236, the Railways Act. And again, when you look, look at the Act, Mr. Speaker, there's certainly gaps and deficiencies uh, in the Act, which is neglecting the, uh, to protect the uh, public interest. It appears that the uh, Railway Act requires amendments uh, to ensure safe operations of short lines under uh, provincial jurisdiction in the province. To have a licensed railway that is not operating trains and not subject to the acts and regulations fails to address safe, safe operations in all aspects of the railway, Mr. Speaker. A couple concerns mentioned to me was uh, the amendments to the Railway Act were not uh, made public until the last, uh, I think, I believe last Friday afternoon. So perhaps the minister could comment on the, uh, the process that occurred in his closing remarks and second reading. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, we're looking forward to uh, submissions made in uh, law amendments. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yes, uh, happy to stand and speak to this bill. Um, it's important that our railway infrastructure across the province continues to be maintained, and of course, public safety is a uh, top priority. And um, I look forward to hearing from stakeholders at law amendments. I have nothing else to say at this time. Thank you. If I am to recognize the Honourable Minister of Transportation, it will be for second reading of Bill Number 236, the Railways Act. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate those comments. I rise to close debate on Bill 236. Motion is for second reading of Bill Number 236, the Railways Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill Number 236, an act to amend Chapter 11 of the Acts of 1993, the Railways Act. Ordered that this bill be referred to the Committee on Law Amendments. The Honourable Deputy Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill Number 238, the Insurance Act? We'll now call Bill Number 238, the Insurance Act. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that Bill 238, the Insurance Act, be now read a second time. I rise today to speak to the amendments uh, to that Act in order to protect Nova Scotians. For clarity, Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotians can be, vul can be vulnerable to third-party financial schemes that target their life insurance policies. We need to protect protect those consumers while insurance companies are able to continue to fulfill their purpose of providing financial protection for individuals. That is why we have listened uh, to the concerns from the industry and are making changes to protect both the consumer and the insurance company. Amendments to the Act will ensure that insurance companies have legal grounds to refuse to transfer ownership of life insurance policies to third parties. They will also prevent the transfer of large sums of money into side accounts 
to take advantage of fixed interest rates. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, seniors and critically ill Nova Scotians could typically be the most vulnerable to these predatory tactics. Third parties are potentially able to buy those life insurance policies at a fraction of the face value. The policy owner gives up all rights under their policy to a third party in exchange for a cash payment, which, Mr. Speaker, is often less than the full value of the policy. Going forward, policy owners cannot sign over their rights to a third party in exchange for that cash payment. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased with these amendments uh, and our third party companies will no longer be able to buy life insurance policies from vulnerable Nova Scotians. This will eliminate the risk to consumers and to the insurance company. Mr. Speaker, we need to protect both. The Honourable Member for Northside Westbound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I look, I'm thankful for the opportunity to speak to this bill. Uh, our seniors are some of our most treasured individuals. Um, I believe that personally. I just spoke to my, of my father last, late last week. Uh, this bill protects our seniors and those that are ill who have taken out these insurance policies to benefit their families who's left, who they leave behind. The fact that we are protecting them and providing this opportunity, there's, it's win-win. If there is anything that I can say about this bill is Nova Scotia and Quebec are the only provinces that don't have something on the table, so it's good that we're joining the majority in the country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's, I'm happy to say a couple of words about this bill. Uh, I would join in the comments of my colleague that this appears to be a proactive change uh, that closes a loophole that could certainly negatively affect seniors and vulnerable folks, and so we're glad to see that happening, to see our legislation being kept current, uh, and we'll look forward to hearing from stakeholders at law amendments. Thank you very much. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. It will be for second reading of Bill Number 238, the Insurance Act. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the support from the opposition members. I think everyone in this House recognizes that we have to protect those most vulnerable. It's sad to think that we have predatory tactics out there uh, and we have to put the legislation in place, but we believe that we are proactive in doing this and, as has been stated, we have joined other provinces to make sure that this province does not become a target when the predators are blocked out of other provinces. So, look forward to law amendments. <laughs> the motion is for a second reading of Bill Number 238, the Insurance Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. Bill number 238, an act to amend chapter 231 of the revised statutes 1989, the Insurance Act. Ordered that this bill be referred to the Committee on Law Amendments. The Honourable Deputy Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call now Bill number 240, an act respecting life partners in long-term care. We'll now call Bill number 240, an act respecting life partners in long-term care. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that Bill Number 240, Life Partners and Long-Term Care Act, be now read a second time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the goal of this bill is, is uh, quite simple, about uh, providing a, uh, a means to keep couples together as they enter into uh, long-term care uh, facilities. Uh, we know, uh, Mr. Speaker, that um, our partners uh, have uh, work uh, at times when possible to uh, keep couples together in their facilities, uh, but uh, the system has uh, been designed initially in a way to um, focus on uh, the care needs in a uh, clinical context. Um, and that leaves times when uh, the care needs of the two partners uh, may be different, uh, requiring different levels of care uh, that are provided at different uh, facilities. What this act does 
is enables uh, a pathway for our partners in the long-term care sector to keep those couples together, providing the care to the uh, based upon the the higher uh, needs uh, facility uh, of the two uh, partners. So that, Mr. Speaker, uh, again, uh, to make good positive legislative changes does not always need to be complex. Uh, this is an example of uh, making uh, good legislation uh, to support uh, those uh, in need and uh, look forward to uh, hearing from my colleagues uh, as this bill uh, proceeds through second reading. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am pleased to rise today to uh, speak to um, this bill about um, placing family members together. One of the things that we know is that long-term care is the final resting place for many people after a lifetime of being together and the thought of being separated um, brings great sadness to many people. And I know that the members of the PC caucus are of course in support of this legislation, uh, so much so that in uh, October 13, 2017, uh, the Honourable Jamie Bailey introduced this into the legislation as well. Um, so I'm glad to see that the government is finally uh, ready to uh, bring this into legislation. But one of the things that I am aware of is that the Homes for Special Care Act itself needs to be revised completely. Um, it is quite an old act and there are an awful lot of changes that need to be brought forward. However, this is certainly a start. So in terms of the Life Partners in Long-Term Care Act, uh, for those who aren't aware, there are three levels of priority to get into a long-term care facility. The first is someone who is at risk. So someone who's in adult protection gets highest priority. The next priority already in this province is to have spouses be united in the long-term care facilities. So that's already in place. So this legislation, um, uh, although well-meaning, that has already been the practice for quite a number of years in this province and the continuing care social workers and staff um, are already asked to unite partners in long-term care facilities. The third level of priority is everyone else. That also includes people who are in an acute care bed, so there's 700 people approximately. Uh, we haven't had an update lately. Um, there are 700 people waiting for acute care beds to get into long-term care. They're actually a lower priority than uniting of spouses. So we already have this, so this is, this is great. Um, those who are waiting from home for a long-term care bed are also a lower priority than uniting spouses in long-term care. So when it says here where an individual and the individual's life partner have both been assessed and deemed eligible by the Provincial Health Authority as defined by the Health Authority Act for placement in a facility, the individual and the individual's life partner have the right to be placed in the same facility. Well, that, Mr. Speaker, that is in fact current practice. So if this legislation is simply to enshrine a current practice, um, then there is no difficulty with it. However, we have brought to this legislature, and it has been discussion perhaps over the last 10 years, that this does not, unless I stand corrected, include those spouses of veterans. And there are quite a number of veterans in our community. As you know, Nova Scotia makes up 25% of the Canadian Armed Forces, and I certainly have uh, a large contingency in my constituency. But right now, if you're a veteran living in the Veterans Memorial Building, you cannot have your spouse move in with you. Even though many of the beds in that long-term care facility are waiting for a long-term care bed to another facility. There are overflow beds in the Veterans Memorial Building that are being used by people from the acute care hospital beds. So the only people not allowed into the Veterans Memorial Building are the spouses of veterans. Mr. Speaker, I have said this before and I'll continue to say it until it is changed, that veterans and their spouses deserve to be together just as much as everybody else in this province. So this legislation, although it's the, the theory and the concept are great, it is already current practice. What I was hoping was that this would add additional um, improvements so that we could unite veterans with their spouses or partners 
and I know that the PC caucus that we intend to introduce this um, during law amendments as an amendment because we think that veterans and their spouses deserve to be together. One of the things, just to remind everyone, although the veterans themselves, their care is funded by the federal government, the Veterans Memorial Building is a provincial asset. And in discussions with them and with other uh, Department of Health and Wellness uh, members, what is needed is for us to change the designation of the Veterans Memorial Hospital to have them go through the accreditation process that would make it a long-term care facility designation for the province of Nova Scotia. I have been advised this. Um, there are a lot of people who are asking for this. There are ministers at the provincial and federal levels who have been talking about this for years. It has been in the newspaper. So I was extremely disappointed to see that this bill, if we're going to talk about life partners, did not go that final step to make sure that those who have served their country have the right to be with their spouses at their final resting post. So Mr. Speaker, I look forward to seeing the comments of those in law amendments and uh, we'll have more comments coming up um, during uh, Committee of the Whole. Thank you very much. Heinrich, oh, the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are, uh, in this short bill, uh, a couple of things about uh, wording that, I'm, uh, that I, I find especially welcome. Uh, the first is that uh, very sensible formulation, as it's put here, I'll quote from the bill, that the individual and the individual's life partner have the right to be placed in the same facility. That's a... I, I think that's a pretty important construction. Have the right. Uh, not, not that it will be a, a priority of policy uh, uh, at such times as it can be accommodated uh, or according to availability of, of space, uh, but that we, we will regard this as a matter of such priority that the laws of our province will uh, speak of it as a right. I think that's what it ought to be spoken of. It hasn't been uh, all policies uh, aside. Over the years, it's not been an unheard of thing, um, particularly in rural areas where the supply of um, spaces in long-term care is more limited that you might have a couple, one of whom requires uh, long-term care at the highest level of intensity, and, uh, and there is a, a place at that, uh, at that level in, in perhaps the, the nearby home. Uh, and it's something that's required today, that it's on, it's on an urgent basis, and so that member of the couple moves there. And the other member of the couple also needs uh, long-term care, um, but is not at that same, uh, that same level. Um, and the level that they're in, there isn't a spot just now uh, in the local facility, but there is a, a one at a, at a place away. And I think everyone who works in placement in continuing care uh, understands this is not a bit ideal and that when it has to happen, uh, everything that can be moved has to be moved in order to get that couple together. And yet, it's not unheard of over the years that this can go on for some weeks uh, or some months. Um, and so I think it's, it, is a, it is a helpful thing to say that we don't look on this as a matter of um, policy or priority, we say of this that this, uh, this couple have in this province, they have this right. Uh, so I think these are important words to have uh, in the legislation. You know, when, uh, whenever this happens in a family and the, you know, families and friends uh, organize themselves to become, get busy and, and bring people back and forth between the two institutions, You'll often hear people you know, speak about my heavens. So this is a this is a, 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 a case of the rules and the bureaucracy given being given more priority than uh, common sense and, and care. And I think that's right. Uh, 
So I welcome first, uh, I want to say a, a word in favor of this formulation in the bill that uh, that members of a couple should be should be together in long-term care facilities in Nova Scotia. This is something that we will regard in future as a right. Secondly, I think that the the definition of a life partner that the legislation provides, um, which is a definition that encompasses a a broad range of uh, committed life partnerships, is a very helpful definition. Sometimes when people speak about the great variety and diversity of committed life relationships there can be in the world, um, they tend a little bit to speak about this as though it were something that were confined to uh, middle-aged or younger people. Uh, in fact, this is, uh, this is not the case at all. Uh, so I'm, I think this is, it, this is a useful thing that in this legislation that speaks about um, uh, this being a right of uh, lifelong partners, that there should be um, a definition of lifelong partner which is um, uh, leaving in the dust the old definition that was so prominent for so many years and which only accorded uh, this kind of uh, respect to um, people in married relationships. I, in my own family, I had a, a, a great uncle who, uh, while living in a long-term care facility, uh, fell in love with another resident in the facility. Um, and uh, he and uh, the person with uh, whom he had established the relationship uh, were not at that time, this is years ago, were not able to live in the same quarters because they weren't married. Uh, this is hard for us to imagine now. Uh, but uh, thankfully the world has changed on this front. But it's a useful thing uh, to see that the definition we have of a lifelong partnership for these purposes uh, reflects these changes in, the, in, in this bill. So these are things that I'm uh, happy to speak in favor of. Of course, I'm, I'm not uh, in favor of the overall current situation in Nova Scotia in which uh, whenever we think about our nursing homes, we can't avoid the fact that the government has not opened a single new facility since coming to power. And this is the re has the result that up to a fifth in some parts of the province of our hospital beds are taken up by people who are not hospital patients, but people who are going through the very difficult wait of living in alternate level of care arrangements uh, while they uh, wait to be placed in a nursing home, uh, which can take, according to where you live in the province, a long, long time. Uh, we can, uh, I don't think it's fair to, to it's, it's good to speak about uh, nursing homes and changes about nursing home rules in Nova Scotia without bringing this into view. We're also not in favor of the current situation in Nova Scotia where that expert panel about which the minister has been speaking in budget estimates, where it was quite clear, uh, the expert panel on long-term care in the province, that uh, the number of people we have on the floors of our nursing home facilities in the province is not today adequate to provide the kind of care that residents have every right to be able to expect. Uh, and then yet, despite that being the case, uh, the government has not made an initiative uh, to implement, uh, as has been recommended to them, an updated system of staff-resident ratios that would reflect contemporary levels of acuity uh, for residents of long-term care. And I'm also not in favour of the fact that there are two successive budget years uh, in the work of this current government when there were cuts made in our province's nursing homes to the budgets that support a diet and staffing and recreational programming, uh, with the result that there have been a lot of negative consequences reported by residents and families and advocates and frontline nursing home employees across the province over the last couple of years. So I, I don't uh, wish for us to open the file of long-term care in Nova Scotia uh, for a debate in the House without um, these matters, uh, which we uh, are matters for us of deep concern, uh, being brought to the fore. Um, we think of these matters as the context 
for evaluating the government's overall uh, effort to this point in long-term care, which in my judgment is uh, an effort that has been disappointing. But there are also the, over this overall effort, this overall, this is also a context in which I want to say about the present bill before us that I think it is a welcome initiative, that it is uh, well worded uh, and, uh, and well pictured and that we are pleased to support it. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. I'm just stretching oh. my legs. The Honourable <laughs> Member for Cape Breton Richmond. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was worried there that I uh, that I had moved without knowing. Um, so good to know I'm still Cape Breton, Richmond. Uh, I, it's my pleasure today to stand up to speak uh, again on Bill 240, Life Partners in Long-Term Care Act, uh, second reading. Um, may I first say, uh, you know, I commend uh, the government in putting forward uh, this legislation. I will say, however, that it's, it saddens me deeply that we even have to put forward a bill such as this, uh, a bill uh, that seems that would be really common sense that we would try our best to make certain that couples are, are placed uh, in the same facility uh, for long-term care. I know, obviously, and I want this, uh, these comments to be brief, uh, one of the issues, obviously, with long-term care, uh, especially in rural Nova Scotia, and my constituency is, is no different, is that, in fact, we just have a, a difficult time accessing uh, long-term uh, care beds when they are needed. So as much as it's wonderful to see that this legislation is being put in place and to echo uh, the minister's words to enable pathways uh, for couples to stay together, uh, you know, I worry uh, that uh, some of the kind of the basics are not being uh, kind of looked at and invested in, which is really to increase the amount of long-term care beds that are available to rural Nova Scotians. I think one of the, uh, and one of the first things that I remember uh, working on as a file uh, when I first became an MLA was uh, a woman who was traveling, she was an elderly lady, she was traveling great distances to go and uh, visit her husband every single day. Uh, he had been placed in a facility, as we know, sometimes we don't get our first choice uh, if, uh, you know, if we have to place our loved ones in, in a facility. And she was traveling extraordinary distances every day, sometimes in the winter months. Um, and I couldn't believe how long that uh, her husband had been on a waiting list to have him transferred to a facility that would have been closer to home. I was really happy to be able to assist in, uh, in any way that I could. And, and within a, a couple of months, he was uh, transferred to the villa. Um, and that gentleman just passed away uh, very recently. So, uh, you know, it's, it feels good as an MLA to be able to assist with sometimes, uh, you think the smallest things, but that have the biggest impact in people's lives. And I really think that this piece of legislation is one of them. I would uh, like to say as well, uh, and echoing some of the comments from uh, the, my colleague on the NDP caucus, that uh, it's worrisome when we have seen cuts to some of the most basic um, uh, elements of providing care in these long-term care facilities. Uh, and it's very uh, worrying as well that it just seems that there's staff shortages that continue. Um, and you know, staff are, are run ragged at these facilities. They do an extraordinary job. Um, I know many of them. Many of them are my friends at both uh, the Richmond Villa at, uh, and at the St. Anne's Centre. Um, we're so fortunate to have these facilities. They're very community-oriented facilities. Um, and you know, I want to commend the staff that are working there. I just wish that they had more assistance. We, know we need more help, we need more bodies on the floor to be able to assist uh, those care workers that, uh, that are in these facilities. So I would like to just put that forward uh, for uh, Mr. Speaker, for the Minister to, uh, to perhaps comment on, um, and also to, uh, there's a couple of things as well, if I may just mention this, um, that just popped into my mind. 
I remember, wa I remember watching my parents when uh, my dad was in palliative care, and you'll see how this is related to where I'm going with long-term care. Um, my parents were married for a very long time, and I've seen people coming into my office that, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna try and say this without getting emotional. I, I never thought this would happen to people, that there's a couple, you know, there are a couple that, like my parents, who have committed themselves to one another for 50, 60 years, and they're having to come to me and say, you know, I don't know what to do. I'm having to legally separate from my spouse in order to be able for me to stay in my home and to afford the household expenses on my own now that I have to put my wife or my husband in a home. And it breaks my heart to know that people who have committed themselves to community, who have paid their taxes their entire lives, who have been, you know, Nova Scotians through and through, some of them are people that I know personally. It's very difficult to accept that we would put people in these positions, loving couples in these positions that would have to separate legally from one another in the end stages of their life after making a life commitment to one another like that. So if I could just perhaps present that, uh, Mr. Speaker, to the minister for some reflection, if there's something there that perhaps we could do to, um, to try and, and counter what is happening in a lot of rural communities, and mine in particular, I've had three different uh, constituency files uh, with the exact same situation, uh, and it, it was a real eye-opener for me when residents come to me um, and they're asking for help for something for which I really uh, am unable at the moment to do anything about. So with those few words, Mr. Speaker, and in, in the hope that we can enact some positive change with both this legislation, but also uh, with uh, issues that are arise and that we're honest and open about talking about here, I'm hoping that we can uh, make decisions in this house that, uh, that are good for all of Nova Scotians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Find to recognize the Honourable Minister of Health be for second reading of Bill Number 240, an act respecting life partners in long-term care. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Appreciate uh, the comments of my colleagues. Uh, opposite, uh, very quickly, uh, high level, uh, most of the, the key points I think that were brought up uh, to the PC caucus, uh, first and, and foremost. Uh, in fact, uh, with this uh, bill, uh, it is does not explicitly state about veterans, uh, but our intention is to uh, work with the federal government to have that uh, incorporated, that uh, we do believe this uh, in terms of all Nova Scotians. In fact, uh, earlier today I had a conversation uh, with the Parliamentary Secretary uh, for uh, Veterans Affairs uh, on this very topic uh, about how we can uh, continue to move this forward uh, in, in partnership. I think he uh, feels uh, pretty uh, optimistic that we can uh, establish an appropriate uh, framework to uh, allow that uh, to uh, work out. The other thing is about the difference between uh, what uh, currently is in place and, and what uh, this enables as well uh, is that um, uh, the member uh, opposite was uh, speaking about uh, long-term care. Uh, this bill actually goes beyond that. It's within the continuing care uh, space, so it takes into account uh, residential care facilities as well. Um, so when you're at a different level of, of care, um, so while when, when people are at the same level of care, it's a priority for a, a connection in the current uh, model, uh, it doesn't uh, always, uh, and, and this is where you see those news stories from time to time uh, where it's uh, not happening, uh, it's because, uh, Mr. Chair, they're at uh, different care needs, uh, and this is just making it abundantly clear uh, that uh, within the system, as the, the member from the NDP caucus has highlighted, uh, we, we view this as the right of those uh, individuals so they come to that point in their life uh, for care. Uh, much of, uh, and many of the comments, I think, uh, seem to be supportive of the, the bill itself, uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, just a couple of technical clarifications. The wait list is about 190, not 700 uh, people in acute care beds uh, as of February 19th. That represents about 8% uh, 
percent, not 20 percent of the uh, acute care beds, and, and certainly not uh, the 700 uh, beds that the member uh, from the NDP caucus uh, cited. Um, again, uh, we continue to work uh, to address those uh, wait times uh, and uh, the wait lists, and that's uh, beyond the scope of this particular bill. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Speaker, I move uh, to close uh, second reading on Bill one, uh, Bill 240, Life Partners and Long-Term Care Act. Thank you. Motion is for second reading of Bill number 240, an act respecting life partners in long-term care. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill number 240, an act respecting life partners in long-term care. Order that this bill be referred to the Committee on Law Amendments. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that you do now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into a Committee of the Hall House on Supply. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am uh, grateful to have an opportunity to once again address uh, the members of the Nova Scotia Legislature. We're in the middle of budget debate. And so there's been quite an opportunity to ask um, the government how our money is being spent. And oftentimes we, we get answers that are a bit um, brief in, in, in response. And so I just want to take an opportunity to just put back on the record some of the actual facts because I think it's important as we're getting close to the end of budget debate to actually discuss what the government itself is saying are the actual numbers. So one of the things that I want to talk about is the fact that our, government, our party, the PC party, has been asking for years as to how many physicians have come into the province and been hired and how many have retired, retired died, moved away or simply stopped practicing. The other day during budget debate, we asked the Minister of Health how many people in this province who are attached to a family practice are attached to a family practice by way of a doctor as their primary care provider or by way of a clinical nurse practitioner. Because there is a difference between the two. And we were advised that we have no idea how many are attached to one or the other. I asked the Minister of Health because last summer all physicians were asked to roster their clients, we should have an exact number of how many people in the province actually have a family doctor. And I was advised that only 60% of physicians actually filled out the roster. So once again, we still have no idea how many people in this province actually have a family doctor. So I think it's important for all of us to say you're attached to a family doctor or you're a fact attached to a clinical nurse practitioner, but they are not interchangeable and Nova Scotians deserve to know exactly how many doctors we have in the province, how much they're practicing, because as someone mentioned during budget debate last night, it was a Minister of Seniors, you have a physician who had 4,000 people on his roster retiring and a new physician comes on board and they're only prepared to take up to 1,500. The fact that you have brought in one physician does not replace the fact that one physician may have left. You might need two or three physicians, or three or four or five clinical nurse practitioners to take the same place of one physician. The other thing that we have not been able to get a handle on, because I don't know if it's tracked, is how long people are now waiting to get in to see their family doctor. Because if you have pressured physicians to take on more people than they are actually capable of seeing in the run of a day, what you end up with is people waiting four to five to six weeks to get in to see their family doctor or their clinical nurse practitioner. And we're not getting those numbers as to how long people are actually waiting. We do know that when a physician sees you, there is often the tendency to use one patient, one issue, one visit. Meaning that if you've taken time away from work to go to your family doctor with your mother, you are often or sometimes told that you can raise one issue at a time and that you will have to leave call back, reschedule, to come in to talk about the second visit. 
issue. So, Mr. Speaker, that issue has not been addressed. When we try to ask about that, we're not getting any answers. One of the things that I have raised in the House is there is a time when the government will always respond with the answer, we are continuing to make investments. As a healthcare professional and as a researcher, continuing to invest in something doesn't necessarily mean that you have better outcomes. It doesn't mean that you're meeting the indicators that were established by the Nova Scotia Health Authority. And continuing to invest money is not a true measure of whether we have improved health outcomes in Nova Scotia. So where we don't have those actual numbers, we have to go by the numbers that the Nova Scotia Health Authority provides us under the Nova Scotia Health Authority by the numbers report that comes out once a year. So I'm going to reference a couple of those numbers because I think transparency is an important feature of government. Under emergency visits, in 2017-18, there were 600,095 emergency room visits. The very next year, it went down to 585,026 visits. There is no one here, and I've mentioned this before when our party was discussing and debating our bill on having a health ombudsman, that no one actually believes that we have fewer emergency room visits because there are fewer emergencies. The number of emergency rooms that are closed across this province have escalated dramatically under this government. So when you tell Nova Scotians that you are continuing to invest in health care and they show up at the door of the emergency room and it is shut, they don't feel that investment. When we talk about mental health, during health committee, debate on mental health, the government talked about how wait times in a couple of places had improved. What they didn't mention is that the majority of wait times in the majority of centres around the province had increased. One of the speakers at the health committee mentioned that the wait times for non-urgent care had increased from around 60 some odd days up to 120. It had doubled. We're not hearing government mention those numbers. So I want to mention again, for the record, that the number of patients who received outpatient visits for mental health services last year went down from 44,300 to 42,998. So if we are continuing to invest in mental health services, the people who are calling my office, who have attempted to take their own lives and showed up in emergent, got sent home in less than 24 hours, are not feeling those investments. The seven and a half people in Nova Scotia every day who attempt to take their own lives are not feeling those investments. If we go down to continuing care, this government is very fond of saying we are continuing to invest in home care. So we'll look at what that actually looks like. In 2017-18, the number of home care clients was nearly 30,000. 29,676. Last year, it went up a little to 31,688. So you would think, well, we're continuing to invest, so more people are getting more care. No, more people are getting less care. I'm going to say that again. More people are getting less home care by according to this government's numbers. So just to make it clear what that means, if you have a loved one who needs home care in this province, in 2016-17, the average number of home care hours per person was 107 hours per year. Last year, it went down to 104 hours. Just this past 2018-19, it went down to 97 hours. That's the equivalent of four hours of home care per year we can't keep everybody home. Everybody, of course, wants to stay home. My own mother wants to stay home. But there is a point at which they cannot stay there. And Dr. Ken Rockwood, 
who has quoted the frailty scale because he created it, and those of us who are health professionals know that when you reach a certain point of frailty, you cannot stay at home. And I'm sorry, but I can tell you that 96.7 hours of care isn't going to keep very many people at home. So continuing to invest is not what's being felt by those who are getting home care because it's a different home care worker who shows up almost every single day. The home care companies who have those service contracts are taking on more clients than they can actually provide care to. So I don't know what the actual percentage of cancellations is, but I have estimated based on what I'm hearing, it's somewhere between 10 to 15% of all of those visits, no one simply shows up. And when you call the service providers, they say, we just don't have the staff. So we have been waiting for this government to take action on the staffing issues for home care and long-term care. The long-term care report came out. There were supposed to be actions taken on the continuing care assistant program. We need approximately 4,000 CCAs. The government gave a grant for 150. My mother had a CCA come to her home to help her with bathing, ironically, because I need to be here. So I couldn't do it at the time. The care worker showed up for 20 minutes and then left. My mother paid for the full hour. This government paid for the full hour. I don't fault that care worker. She's got a whole lot of people she needs to get to and she doesn't like having to cancel them. But we have a system in home care that is not sustaining people at home, which is why there are so many people waiting from home for long-term care beds. Mr. Speaker, when we talk about the number of visits for mental health services, we actually saw a reverse trend. We saw fewer people getting mental health care, but one extra visit. So we invested in mental health services over the past year. The government has said so. What we have, though, is fewer people who got mental health outpatient services last year but those who did get it got one more visit. So when we say we're investing in mental health, or we're investing in long-term care, and we're investing in home care, and we're investing in income assistance, the bottom line question is, do the people who are receiving those investments feel like things have gotten any better? As a critic, formerly for community services, people are not telling me that they feel like they're getting improved access to food, housing, clothing, medication. The investments that community services have put in to raising the income assistance is dramatic. It doesn't add up to much more than 50 to to $100, but because this particular government has not increased those amounts for so long that any increase is welcome, but I would ask anybody in this legislature to find any one of those constituents who comes through my door to find an apartment that you would be willing to live in because they're certainly not able to find housing. And earlier today, I talked during question period about a homeless woman who reached out for help. Actually, it was her brother who reached out for help and said, my sister is living in the Walmart parking lot can you help? We started the ball rolling. I immediately went to the hospital where she had an outpatient visit with a specialist who said, stop sleeping in your car. I offered to bring her into my home temporarily, assuming that community services would find her a host within a few days, but she couldn't do stairs, so my home wasn't an option. It took over 30 days for community services to take action for someone who was homeless, living in their car in the Walmart parking lot. So when this government says they are continuing to make investments, they're not feeling it. All of those who show up at my office who have lost their housing because of a breakup, that I have driven to homeless shelters knowing full well that they're gonna get one night's care and then they'll be back out on the street back into my office again the next day, they're not feeling this. Home care workers, health care workers, 
teachers, all of the people that we have been talking about on this side of the house are not feeling those investments. What you read about in the paper and what we're quoting here is what they're telling us. So although we are critics, we are responsible for shining the light on what is really happening and taking a look at what those numbers really mean. So if we really want to get serious about health care and home care and long-term care and teachers and whether our students are better prepared when they graduate than when they entered the school system, we need to actually be listening to the frontline workers who have the solutions that we have been listening to, that we have put forward in resolutions and amendments and bills, that this government ironically has taken some of them, the breast density bill that I put in place, the human trafficking bill, the bill by the member from Picto East on e-cigarette flavors. We're so grateful that some of our recommendations have been followed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Motion carried. The House will now recess for a couple of minutes while it resolves itself into the Committee of the Whole House on Bills.
I recognize order. I recognize the Honourable Deputy House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, would you please call the estimates for the Minister of the Department of Health and Wellness Resolutions E11? I call the Minister of Health and Wellness, and I recognize the member for Halifax, Shabakdil. Uh, and uh, w welcome again. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have about three quarters of an hour uh, to uh, for us to think together, and there's a a range of. Uh, of things that I wanted to, to touch on. Uh, the, the first of them has to do with uh, the provision of uh, equipment to do with severe allergy treatments, something about, about EpiPens. Uh, we know that um, this is a life-saving uh, uh, emergency personal medical device uh, and that it's not at all without expense, that they're uh, around $200 each. Uh, and everybody who needs one, uh, who of course absolutely needs one, has to have a couple of them a year and that once you've got them, they don't last forever, that they, they come with an expiry date and that's around about a year. And obviously therefore, for people who, with severe allergies, particularly who are in um, lower or lower middle income uh, situations, uh, this is a this is a significant difficulty and challenge, and we're not speaking about a small number of people. We know that uh, that there it's it's in the range of 10% of the population who um, are living with real life-threatening allergies. Uh, so I, I'm wondering if the provision of EpiPens on a public basis is something that is within the department's uh, consideration at all. Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd have to uh, double check uh, specifically. Um, there are a, a variety of um, means by which Nova Scotians obtain uh, health services, which includes, in some cases, uh, medication or um, equipment. Uh, those include the uh, MSI, the medical uh, insured services that we uh, provide, um, but there are other means uh, as well, uh, including our various pharmacare programs, seniors pharmacare, family pharmacare, the program uh, being run uh, by the Department of Community Services for those uh, low-income Nova Scotians uh, that uh, would be uh, part of, of their program. We have uh, within those ins those uh, medical insurance programs uh, that do take into account um, uh, people's ability to pay for that insurance, uh, Madam uh, Chair, which is over and above our, our MSI uh, insured services coverage, uh, provide a, a variety of, of services and, and features. Uh, and I do know uh, to the member's uh, specific question that the EpiPen uh, is uh, included as part of that formulary. So we do, uh, through a provincial uh, insurance uh, program, uh, provide uh, that uh, coverage uh, as well under our, our PharmaCares. Thank you. Minister for, um, member for Halifax, Shabakdil. Uh, well, also minister, that's all right. You are uh, a minister. <laughs> uh, yeah, Larry and I are the only real ones here, Madam Chair. Thank you uh, uh, for, that, for that explanation. Now, I wanted to, to ask about something else that is a... Uh, a real continuing uh, concern for people of uh, middle or lower incomes related to health, and that's hearing aids uh, and uh, and hearing aid repairs. We 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 hear repeatedly amongst our constituents um, what a real uh, weight and and life diminishment for a lot of people their inability to afford uh, hearing aids is. I I think about. Uh, one person in particular uh, who uh, 
didn't have a great many financial resources who explained that how she'd purchased a hearing aid around five years ago, but that now it needed repairs and the manufacturer didn't repair them anymore, and so she'd have to get a new one, and it was going to be over $8,000, which was just, it might as well have been $800,000 in terms of accessibility. Now, I, I know that there are uh, excellent programs for young people in hearing aids. Um, and that there are some um, fairly minor subsidies for older people. And, and uh, we all, I think, are familiar with the charities that provide financial support for hearing aid repairs and, uh, and for hearing aid acquisition. Um, but I, I want to know, I want to ask the minister if there's any um, thinking within the department um, that, uh, that, that we need to, to open up the door on this and get serious uh, within our health care funding of Nova Scotia in the provision uh, of uh, hearing aids uh, so that uh, everyone in Nova Scotia will be, will be able to hear whether they can afford to do that through the private sector or not. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and again, I thank uh, the member uh, for the, the question. Uh, the range of uh, hearing and speech uh, programs and services uh, that uh, are provided, uh, in particular uh, through uh, Nova Scotia Hearing and Speech, uh, is uh, the main uh, area and avenue uh, by which we, we provide uh, supports. Um, the um, relationship there uh, from uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority is that's uh, an operational uh, delivery of, of health services uh, avenue. Uh, the member is uh, correct uh, that uh, you know, there are uh, only uh, in some very limited uh, avenues, uh, I believe some might, might be related to workers' compensation, I believe, uh, for uh, hearing loss uh, of actual uh, devices uh, being uh, covered. Uh, in uh, this year's uh, budget, uh, we do not have a, a program uh, or expansion uh, allocated uh, to, uh, to cover uh, those uh, services, and that is the hearing aid equipment uh, that the member has inquired about. Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you. Uh, does the department have um, within its planning horizon any uh, programming that might uh, extend to repairs of hearing aids? Um, the minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, again, at, at this point, uh, I don't believe we have uh, anything allocated uh, uh, specifically uh, for a program such as that uh, in uh, this year's uh, budget. Um, I do take uh, the member's uh, point uh, on uh, programming uh, in this uh, space, uh, and I appreciate uh, bringing that forward. Uh, again, uh, as we've uh, established our, our budget uh, going ahead for the various programs with the health system uh, for the year, which relates to the uh, program and the funding uh, in the budget uh, as tabled by the Minister of Finance uh, last week. Uh, I um, certainly in, in this year it's, it's unlikely to see uh, progress there but uh, again as uh, we note opportunities to advance uh, uh, and then as we go through the budgeting process obviously uh, there is a, an aspect of uh, focusing in on, on uh, programs and, and uh, you know, whether they be for expansions or uh, new program opportunities. That's what we do uh, each uh, year through uh, through the budgeting uh, exercise, uh, and uh, and that's what leads to the budgets that get tabled here. So again, in, in this budget, uh, we don't have uh, that I'm aware of. I don't recall uh, any um, programs uh, specifically for hearing aid devices or uh, hearing aid device repairs. The member for Halifax Shabakdel. Uh, thank you. Um, then under the Minister's continuing leadership, can he see uh, this area, both the acquisition of devices and funding for repairs for lower middle and lower income people, can he see this as uh, an emerging priority for future budgets? Minister. 
Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, I, I would say that uh, certainly uh, um, each year, um, whatever the uh, form, uh, whether it's here on the floor of the legislature uh, or uh, through uh, interactions uh, that uh, we have uh, as individuals within the department, myself as ministers, uh, or, or our colleagues uh, on any side of the legislature uh, with uh, constituents that uh, identify opportunities to strengthen our, our health care program uh, and services. Uh, that uh, that does uh, all come into the department. We take a look at uh, and evaluate and, and prioritize. Um, so um, uh, again, I can't make any uh, uh, firm uh, commitments as to uh, outcomes, but I'll certainly uh, um, commit to, to the member to go back uh, within the Department of Health and Wellness uh, to. Uh, um, ascertain and uh, what uh, research and, and work has been done in the past or to date uh, in terms of evaluating um, this uh, particular uh, possibility. Again, there are always um, uh, pressures and challenges to expand uh, the insured services uh, provisions uh, within the programming of the department. Um, it, it continues to be a, a fast rising uh, area of uh, expense that is health uh, broadly. Uh, so uh, we do uh, always unfortunately have to make um, uh, decisions each, each year that we come forward, but I'll certainly endeavour to uh, pull the information we currently have to see if there's uh, adequate information um, to um, consider uh, the proposal brought forward uh, uh, going into uh, next year perhaps, uh, or if uh, it's a situation where further uh, research uh, delving into uh, that as a priority amongst the many other competing uh, health priorities that we have. So uh, duly noted and, and we'll take that uh, recommendation, suggest uh, forward uh, again uh, for uh, uh, future budgets. The member for Halifax, Shabakto. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, could I then j just uh, ask the minister if we could give some explanation about the, the thinking uh, behind the fact that this has not been enough of a priority for the department for this to be included in this budget? Minister? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, as uh, you'd be aware, uh, we uh, have been uh, very clear as to uh, the broad uh, stroke uh, categories of, of priorities that we have. Uh, in particular, uh, we know the uh, the challenges uh, that uh, we have with uh, within primary care. Uh, we know how those uh, challenges um, affect other areas within our healthcare system, including uh, increased pressures within our or emergency departments, uh, Madam Chair, those uh, emergency departments uh, where uh, by volume uh, many of the uh, visitors are deemed to have lower acuity, um, less urgent uh, care needs than uh, is needed uh, to be seen in an emergency department. Uh, Phrased another way, Madam Chair, uh, what I mean to say is that uh, many of the uh, visits to emergency departments across the province by volume uh, with a lower acuity could be uh, or could have been seen in a primary care setting. Um, so as we strengthen our primary care uh, throughout the province, as we see in the uh, most recent uh, updated uh, 811 Need a Family Registry numbers, uh, which I believe were just re released uh, earlier today or maybe online uh, tomorrow if they're not already there, uh, we see that, uh, again, we continue to see a reduction in the number of Nova Scotians registered seeking a um, primary care provider. Uh, so uh, work uh, can still continues. We have more work to do and that's uh, been a, a major uh, focus and priority uh, of investments uh, that we're making uh, in uh, this year's budget. The member for Halifax, Shabakta. Uh, thank you and thank you for those answers about that question. Um, I'd like to ask a couple of questions about the new organ donation program. Uh, about the new uh, uh, the new framework that we're about to enter into, um, which uh, you know, in our party we we are enthusiastic about uh, supporting, um, and yet uh, I think everybody who has I've ever heard speak about it speaks about the enormous administrative challenges uh, that it's going to pose uh, in its um, implementation in the province. Um, and that there are administrative challenges too that go along with uh, setting up an opting out program and, and operating it. And the, this, this overall big uh, change <coughs> that we're about to be going through with its 
inevitable, um, I would say, uh, very major increase in, uh, in the number of people uh, making organ and tissue donations and the number of transplant operations. Um, so we, given that that's going to be the case, a person would naturally assume that uh, uh, there's going to be additional training uh, for uh, healthcare providers, particularly uh, new physicians. Uh, as more and more physicians are going to be involved, uh, it would stand to reason with this higher volume of, of donations, um, and that there will, there will also need to be a new new policies regimes that will need to be developed and implemented, and that all these things surely will have a, a financial impact uh, on, the, on the budget of the department. So could I ask the minister first about this? Does, does the present budget include any comprehensive education plan uh, for current or future health care professionals related to our, uh, uh, our new organ donation uh, anticipated regime? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, what we have in, in place uh, for uh, this uh, uh, Human Organ and Tissue Donation Act uh, is, uh, from a budget perspective, uh, an increase uh, investment in this fiscal year of about a $2 million increase, uh, bringing the total uh, investment of around uh, organ tissue donation to $3.2 million. Uh, and again, that's an increase this fiscal year of about $2 million. Uh, that increase, uh, where we expect to uh, have this uh, legislation in, uh, in place and uh, actually um, uh, proclaimed within uh, and, and into effect in the fall of uh, this year in 2020. Uh, we uh, obviously some of that increase goes towards the expected increase in organ and tissue donations that would be uh, completed uh, during the uh, latter half of the, the fiscal year. Uh, but uh, the other funding uh, goes towards uh, those uh, very costs that uh, the member has uh, referenced, those costs that relate to initial setup of the uh, program. Uh, two key areas are the administrative function, uh, which uh, by and large uh, are administered uh, and will be uh, affiliated with our MSI card registration, which is a, an existing administrative process uh, for where uh, or Organ uh, donation in our current model of opt-in is administered and managed uh, in relation to our Nova Scotia health cards. Uh, we um, so we will continue to rely on the existing infrastructure uh, with some modifications uh, to uh, enable that uh, system that tracks the information uh, to uh, enable that opt-out option. Uh, so it is with some technological uh, adjustments there. Uh, we're actually uh, engaging. Um, the public uh, now on um, some input on the exact uh, phrasing of what the uh, updated Nova Scotia health card will look like, exactly how do we want to uh, identify one's uh, donor status um, on the uh, donor card. Uh, if you pull out your, your MSI card, you'll see that there's currently a, a flag uh, identified. Uh, so there, there are some discussions and consultation ongoing uh, to uh, determine what Nova Scotians uh, would like to see there. Um, so on the administrative side, some of the costs are, are covering those system updates and uh, changes. And then uh, the last part of the member's question, Madam Chair, uh, was about education. Uh, obviously when we uh, introduced and brought forward this piece of legislation, uh, there was a recognition of the need to uh, hire additional staff, uh, specialists, nephrologists and surgeon plant surgeons um, to um manage additional cases that, that would need to be done, but it also recognized that to successfully achieve the outcomes uh, that we are all striving towards here, uh, which is more lives saved, uh, it does require uh, engagement and education, particularly uh, in our, our more rural uh, settings uh, where um, 
the number of um, instances uh, where um, a, a donor may be um, um, a donor situation may arise. Uh, those are still sensitive, very sensitive conversations to be had, and, and there is uh, a certain amount of uh, training and education to help uh, support those frontline healthcare workers who have to lead those conversations. Uh, earlier this this evening, uh, the member uh, noted uh, his his former role, or, or I don't know, might even be current role as minister, um, but um, I'm sure in, in his. Uh, um, a role as a minister, uh, he's had to have some some of those those challenging conversations, um, and uh, so we have heard from uh, those in, involved in uh, transplant uh, and organ and tissue donation that. Um, providing that support and that education. So uh, again, part of that $2 million increase uh, goes towards that. I believe they've already hired uh, the leads uh, within the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, and uh, IWK to uh, the lead to uh, go out and support and lead that education in both the Nova Scotia Health Authority and the IWK. Um, and uh, there will also be uh, information and investments in the educational regime uh, to promote and, and, and market to advise Nova Scotians once the technical um, configuration system is complete uh, uh, that uh, Nova Scotians who may choose to opt out uh, can register their uh, desire um, and we will have that uh, up and running before the actual implementation date. So we do expect to have that uh, up and running um, in the, in, uh, the not-too-distant future um, so that there is lead time for those Nova Scotians who may choose to opt out um, that, uh, Madam Chair, they would be able to do so in the system. We would be tracking that information so when it goes into effect, those wishes uh, can be respected right from that moment in time. Member for Halifax, Shabakdo. Well, th thank you. Those, uh, that kind of educational programming is just exactly what I had in mind, that, uh, that this is not a, a kind of a, a box on a, on a form to tick that, you know, conversation's been had, uh, uh, but it requires an extraordinary sensitivity. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm thinking then, could the, could the minister characterize out of this 2 million of the 3.2, that is the, the budgetary increase for the new program, um, what part of that uh, is allocated to education and is there an educational component in addition to the part that he's just spoken about? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I don't have the uh, specific breakdown. Uh, as I'd noted, uh, uh, what we've done is we've, we've really taken the lead uh, from the uh, team, uh, Dr. Bede and, and others, uh, that uh, are, are you know, the, the leads within our uh, organ uh, uh, transplant uh, and donation um, program, organ and tissue uh, program, uh, to um, and we rely on them to design and, and deliver uh, those uh, programs um, within the system. Uh, so uh, this uh, increase uh, is an increase that trans uh, transfers over to uh, the multi-organ transplant program uh, administered uh, and led by the Nova Scotia Health Authority, uh, and then they uh, ensure that the, uh, the funding gets uh, redistributed and allocated. Uh, as far as uh, the educational uh, specifics uh, of the program, I think, again, um, really those two main streams, um, how much further those streams might be broken down, and those two, uh, I, I, I don't have the full details uh, with me, but again, the two main streams being uh, provider, uh, healthcare, uh, frontline uh, training uh, support, uh, and then the, um, and, and in terms of how to identify 
uh, and how to have those conversations uh, with uh, families uh, when uh, uh, or if uh, circumstances uh, arise, um, but also then the education of the general population um, so that they understand their rights. Uh, within this uh, legislative uh, framework uh, and the legislation governing uh, an opt-out uh, provision um, because we do uh, respect uh, all Nova Scotians and their, their rights to, to choose um, and this legislation maintains that right to choose um, not to have uh, your uh, the the uh, be a participant in the donor program um, so it does respect that right uh, but we want to make sure that uh, part of that education goes out is to ensure Nova Scotians are aware of the changes so that they can exercise that right and, and part Part of that does require an education campaign. So those are the two main streams. Um, the details, though, I've, I've really left to the the, uh, the experts in the in the field, particularly on the uh, transplant uh, clinical side. Member for Halifax, Shabakto. Um, I'm thinking then about the um, uh, the overall three uh, three point two million and the and the cost that must surely going to be. Um, Required to administer an opt-out system. Uh, I mean, when a person thinks about it, it's a pretty major administrative undertaking. Uh, the uh, uh, can the minister characterize the financial uh, implications of setting up an, an opt-out system, and and how much of that overall budget uh, is allocated towards it? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, I don't think, um, I guess in, in, in principle to some degree, um, I, I can appreciate um, the members' uh, characterization of the administrative uh, framework as, as I believe uh, the language was complex. Um, and it's certainly important um, in, in terms of the need, but not necessarily complex. Uh, I don't know that I would necessarily describe it as, as a complex system. Uh, recognizing in the first instance that we already have a, a, an administrative system in place uh, which uh, tracks um, citizens' organ donation preferences uh, in an opt-in uh, framework. Uh, so our uh, design approach is not to uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater, but rather to leverage the administrative system we have in place and enhance it so that it does provide that opportunity for opt-out. That does require some technical uh, changes on the, the back end of um, the, the systems that do the tracking, which is uh, that uh, MSI system that tracks our, our health information, our, our health um, uh, insurance uh, information, which is where the current uh, opt-in uh, donor uh, preferences are uh, recognized. Um, and, uh, and so that is administered by our, our third uh, party that uh, administers uh, our MSI uh, insurance, including the cards. Uh, those cards and the back-end computer system will have that uh, information uh, that uh, is uh, part of the, um, uh, the system. Um, it will... Um, lead to uh, changes on the front of the health cards, as I've mentioned in, in my previous response, um, which currently uh, identifies an opt-in portion, uh, but um, uh, which is the current model. It'll be changing the way that that flag is represented. Uh, but within the health system, uh, when a health card is, is presented uh, or, or made available uh, and uh, that provision is, uh, is made aware of the uh, health care providers um, in an individual uh, circumstance, they, they would see visibly on the card, um, but also if they have the uh, MSI number for the individual, when they log into the computer system, they would see it as well. In addition, uh, part of our efforts with uh, this um, opt-out provision is actually to enhance um, and streamline our administrative burden for Nova Scotians themselves. 
uh, and uh, that includes uh, efforts that are underway uh, to provide online options. Uh, and the advantage of this is that that uh, uh, you know ideally uh, we will be able to leverage that for uh, online uh, MSI card uh, renewals uh, as well. So uh, there's work uh, looking at and evaluating how we can uh, leverage uh, technology to reduce the overall administrative burden, even though there's some upfront technical um, and, and just restructuring costs associated with it. So uh, I, I, again, I, I just I wouldn't classify it as overly complex. Um, very important, of course, um, but uh, we don't see it as, as being overly uh, burdensome on the system. The member for Halifax, Shabakdil. Th thank you. Uh, then thinking again about the 3.2 million uh, allocated for the project um, uh, or for the area, are there other budgetary costs associated with the organ and tissue donation program uh, that are elsewhere in the budget in addition to that 3.2 or is that a pretty well an exhaustive figure? Minister. Thank you. Um, there would be costs, and they're not costs that uh, can really easily be teased out. Um, as uh, noted, uh, the uh, transplant uh, program uh, and uh, the investments there are, are really part of the overarching program that manages the entire um, organ donation. Uh, we would have additional costs in the uh, uh, physician and services uh, budget uh, for uh, physicians who may not be part of the program, but in a given um a given instance, uh, Madam Chair, they may uh, be part of the team and be providing health care services. Um, so, you know, depending on what level of detail one breaks it down, so there would be costs incurred, um, but we see those and, and, and they would be captured in the broad overarching health care delivery um, and, and they wouldn't be necessarily mapped back into the overarching uh, because it would be the specialists that are captured and, and their services and work there. Um, so uh, really this is the, the big thing. I think there's also um, some uh, within the NSA Legacy of Life um, uh, programming and uh, investments, but I believe that's uh, administered and managed over at the uh, NSHA uh, and the work uh, that they do there. The member for Halifax, Shabakdo. Thank you. Uh, does then, does the department have um, uh, projections about the anticipated trajectory of donations over the coming years and then with that uh, associated uh, increases in necessary funding? Minister? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, we certainly uh, have uh, data with respect to our, our expectations this year, uh, recognizing that uh, this uh, is expected to come on stream uh, in the latter half of this fiscal year, in the fall of 2020. Um, uh, the estimated is uh, for an increase of uh, about uh, 10 additional uh, organ donors and about 130 additional uh, tissue uh, donations uh, being made uh, within the system. Uh, so, um, you know, if we were to, to force, forecast that out on a, on a full year basis, you could probably uh, double that uh, donation uh, to about 20. Over time, uh, as, as again, uh, the uh, familiarity, the education, and 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 the experience uh, of our frontline healthcare uh, professionals, but also as a society, um, um, mature, I, I guess would be an, an appropriate uh, phrase. Uh, we we may see further growth uh, beyond that. Um, and uh, in terms of the uh, the pressure and and and, uh, and so on, um, we would uh, factor that for the future years based upon uh, again if we see that the estimates from this year. Uh, uh, how they materialize, uh, and that will help inform um, the uh, budgeting process and the planning uh, for uh, the future years. Um, we do uh, recognize again that uh, the delivery and to achieve uh, these outcomes um, do include um, uh, 
hiring uh, up to uh, 27 people as part of this uh, uh, program and, and service. Um, that's uh, people within the uh, Legacy of Life uh, program, uh, the Regional uh, Tissue Bank, uh, and the Multi-Organ uh, Transplant uh, Program. Uh, so a number of, of clinical and, and administrative uh, support to personnel that were identified as needed to ensure that um, the um, actual um, delivery of, of care and, and again, uh, maximizing of, of value of the delivery and the uh, lives uh, that are saved and uh, transformed based upon uh, the availability of uh, increased uh, donations um, through uh, these programs. The member for Halifax, Shabakto. Uh, thank you. So thinking about um, the projections the department's working under, um, looking towards the inevitable increase in donations that there will be. Did I understand uh, correctly uh, that the thinking at the moment is to take that first year of operation and to see what kind of a change happens and then uh, build planning from there? Or, or are there any other longer term, let's say five year, 10 year pictures uh, working in the department besides that at the moment? Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, not, not exactly. Uh, uh, from a, a budgeting uh, perspective, I guess what I was uh, attempting to articulate there w in my previous response was that uh, we are in the current uh, budget year. We have uh, forecasted, uh, which is a little bit uh, different than uh, a normal year. Anytime you're in your first year of your setup, because you're, you're, you're breaking down your costs with the actual setup and, and, and kind of one-time uh, initiatives, and then you have your uh, operational piece that you're expected to see some increase. Increases. Uh, we've noted what the expected increase on the operational side would be, um, and as I said, that's uh, based upon you know roughly a half a year this fall uh, implementation, or a little bit less than half a year. Uh, so you'd be, see something in, in doubling that as a, a rough rule of thumb. Uh, I, I'm, I'm almost certain, Madam Chair, that uh, when uh, we uh, tabled this legislation, we did have uh, some, some broad estimates as to what that, that longer term. Uh, unfortunately, I don't recall what the uh, numbers uh, were off the top of my head, and I don't want to, to misspeak, uh, but I'm almost certain that if we go back uh, to the uh, announcement of this legislation uh, last year, about this time last year, uh, we would uh, see exactly what those numbers were. And uh, again, when we're building the, uh, the budget uh, with our partners, partners uh, on the operational side, they, they provide the input each year as what they're anticipating and forecasting. So that's where when I was trying to be a little more exact, saying that yes, next year as part of the budgeting, uh, we will get uh, advice uh, and information from the Nova Scotia Health Authority, which would uh, be collecting from their various uh, operational units, which includes uh, the organ and uh, tissue uh, donation uh, and transplant uh, programs uh, to help inform the, the budget needs uh, that we would anticipate, which of course, is driven uh, in many cases by utilization and demand. So um, that's uh, why I was referring to it. It's not that we're, we're just kind of twiddling our thumbs, I guess, and, and waiting to see what happens, uh, but rather that, um, uh, again, the projections are, are just that right now, broad level projections, and the percentage, I just don't recall off the top of my head, we don't seem to have it uh, here, but I think we, uh, we did uh, have it, I, I'm almost certain, when we tabled the legislation and had those discussions last year. The member for Halifax, Shabakdo. Uh, yes, thank you. What I was really uh, wondering about was the the rough sense of a potential trajectory of increase for the for budgets, not so much the operational side. But are we are we looking at over the in the next uh, years as we move from our present situation into the new regime uh, at a, a steady escalation in the budgetary allotment to the program? Let us say over the next, for example, five years. Minister. Uh, I, I believe um, if we're talking on a, on a financial uh, scope, uh, and again, uh, these would be um, you know, preliminary as part of that, uh, as the member would say, uh, forecasting uh, exercises, uh, I think uh, more of a, a 
projections out, uh, seeing the program's uh, operational uh, budget and, and investments uh, potentially growing to about four and a half million dollars. Um, so um, again, this year not quite being comparable because we do have the setups and, and so on. So in the uh, early years, we would have, uh, you know, if we assumed the same budget, um, but money's not going to those new administrative uh, investments at the front end, that, that same budget amount next year would actually allow for and account for uh, increased um, uh, operational uh, services and supports uh, for the same total budget amount. So even though we may see uh, more uh, in next fiscal year, we may not necessarily see a corresponding budget increase, um, recognizing that this year's budget is again uh, allocated on the basis of um, uh, of, of some setup costs, um, but uh, for future year projections, I believe uh, there, there has been uh, a, a broad stroke estimate of uh, possibly uh, a four and a half million dollar program that it could grow into. Uh, again, until we see how exactly the program uh, plays out, uh, you know, the degree of certainty as to that is the actual uh, outcome. Um, but the advantage is um, with that number, um, you know, would come several more uh, organ tissue uh, transplant uh, donations, uh, which means. Uh, again, transformative, uh, life-saving uh, delivery. So I, I think a very good investment. Um, but uh, that's that's the ballpark that we've uh, been looking at in this, and that uh, what is the kind of permanent or, or steady state that we would expect out of this program. The member for Halifax, Shabakdo. Uh Well, thank you, and I I certainly agree that it's not only a, a good investment; it's a it's a very fine initiative. Uh, and uh, something that I think the government must surely be proud of. Uh, it's, uh, it's, going to, it's going to do an awful lot of good for an awful lot of people, in, including those who are uh, uh, having to uh, deal with loss. Uh, and uh, so I thank the minister for uh, uh, attending to some details about uh, how the program is going to be set up. Uh, I'd like to uh, switch gears a little. Uh, and, and ask a couple of questions about a subject that has uh, come on our screen publicly in a way that it really hadn't before, and that's the subject of vaccinations. Um, we, uh, we know that the, the public health bottom line about this is uh, beyond debate. There aren't, there aren't any dissenting voices amongst major international health organizations about both the uh, importance of vaccinations. Uh, if we had a grocery cart here full of credible peer-reviewed studies, they'd all say the same thing. Um, uh, so I, I wonder if we could begin thinking about this, uh, thinking about this sometimes uh, oddly contentious subject. Uh, what part of the budget, what extent of the budget, what is the framework of the budget related to vaccinations? Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we're just uh, continuing to consult uh, with the uh, the budget documents here uh, for the, the bottom line the members uh, looking for, but uh, two quick comments uh, while we're pulling that information together. The first on, on the previous line of, of questioning, I, I just want to acknowledge and thank uh, the member. And, and again, I recall when this legislation moved through, really, I think there was unanimous support uh, within the legislature on the hot uh, the legislation. Uh, and I would just like to put on the record uh, that uh, from the government side, 
um, the leadership that the, the Premier has, has taken, uh, much like the leader of the NDP who just commented uh, about uh, how uh, significant this legislation is. Uh, again, this, uh, this particular uh, path, uh, uh, the Premier uh, took a, a very keen uh, interest, uh, as uh, did uh, s several other uh, government members. Uh, and again, when the ta legislation actually got tabled here, uh, I think all members of the legislature uh, took a very keen uh, interest and a supportive uh, role with the legislation. So again, I thank the member for, for bringing it to the floor again uh, here this evening. Uh, as it relates to uh, viruses, uh, sorry, <laughs> vaccines, sorry, not viruses, uh, something else on my, head, on my mind. Uh, with vaccinations, uh, we are uh, looking at, um, in uh, this fiscal year, uh, just over $10 million, I believe, um, going uh, towards uh, that um, service. That uh, you would see uh, reflected in the communicable Oh, uh, actually, just one second here. Uh, that's the communicable disease and prevention. So 10.2 is what we see for the entire uh, communicable disease and prevention uh, programming. Um, I believe vaccinations uh, are roughly 20% uh, uh, um, of that. Uh, so that includes uh, some other uh, treatments, uh, including biologicals, uh, I believe, in that uh, line item. Uh, so vaccines is uh, about just under $2 million. Um, we do have uh, an increased uh, investment um, uh, in um, vaccination uh, that we announced uh, that took effect in January of uh, 2020, uh, and that is the introduction of the rotavirus uh, vaccination uh, for uh, youth. Uh, so um, again, the vaccination program, like many health uh, programs, uh, continues to evolve. Uh, and that uh, evolution uh, of uh, the program. Uh, I believe the year prior, we introduced um, for the first time the high dose flu vaccination uh, within Nova Scotia, um, uh, targeted towards um, our, our senior population in uh, uh, long term care uh, or continued care settings, uh, um, institutional uh, living, and, and that was identified uh, by public health officials as the highest risk areas where people are, are living uh, in close. Uh, Proximity, um, so we did. Uh, you know, we, we do continue to evolve our, our vaccine and vaccination program, um, and we've done so again. Just those are two examples in just the last uh, couple of years, while continuing to provide the programming um, of, of uh, the vaccination schedule uh, as um, as covered in our programming. Member for Halifax, Shabakto, you have a few minutes. Hey, thank you. Um, well, thank you. The, uh, in addition to the addition of the rotavirus uh, funding, uh, could the minister then characterize the, the pattern of increase in vaccination funding over the past few years, let us say the past five years? Are we looking at a steady pattern of increase or minus rotavirus more or less the same? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chair. I think uh, roughly, and, and, and I want to just uh, clarify, there was a little bit of confusion on the uh, financial numbers from the, the previous uh, line, um, or in my previous response, so, so if you scratch that. Uh, the 10.2 million, uh, which uh, falls under communicable uh, disease uh, and prevention, is all vaccines. Uh, there are there are multiple types of vaccines. Those where uh, some of our, our uh, confusion in, in reporting the financial numbers uh, came from. Uh, so we do have a breakdown here. Um, Minister. So, 
uh, that uh, that broke broke down uh, to um, again. There's th three different um, CDP program deliveries: Utonix and Biologicals. Um, and again, that uh, comes out to about ten, uh, just over a ten uh, million dollar uh, budget. Uh, so they do all uh, fall under the vaccine uh, space. Um, by and large, again, I increases a, a significant part of increases are the new vaccines we bring on stream uh, for the delivery of, of those uh, services and the vaccines. Uh, we've also seen, uh, particularly this year, an increase in uh, our uh, regular flu vaccine. Uh, we invested in that and, and brought it on stream. Um, so we did uh, anticipate uh, higher demand. We don't have the utilization um, data back yet um, as uh, we're just uh, hitting kind of the peak. We're just on, the, I believe, the start of the downside of the peak uh, flu season. Um, but uh, initial response was, was very good uh, to uh, the vaccination there. Um, but the regular kind of vaccination schedule, I think, is roughly uh, consistent uh, with the uh, the trends. Uh, and so the corresponding budget would uh, align with that as well. But again, with increased awareness of flu vaccines, we'll see that. And um, coronavirus obviously does not, uh, the COVID-19 doesn't have a uh, Order. vaccine yet. Time has elapsed for the NDP. We will turn it over to the CP. Um, PC caucus, and I uh, ask. I recognize the member for Pictou East. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the current plan has the um, <clears throat> Nova Scotia Cancer Care Program moving to the infirmary site. Why are we moving these services? <clears throat> Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I thank uh, the member opposite uh, as. Uh, uh, the member would know, as we've uh, communicated, I believe, uh, throughout uh, the work for our redevelopment projects, uh, be it in, in uh, Halifax, at Cape Breton, uh, we, we made it clear we would uh, consult and engage with frontline healthcare uh, providers to uh, provide that uh, that input and advice uh, to the uh, program and the design teams. Uh, that uh, recommendation, I believe the Premier spoke to it uh, earlier today in question period, uh, had advice uh, from uh, the leads uh, within the campaign cancer care program within the province that was fed into the uh, the lead team uh, designing uh, and, and preparing the work to bring forward uh, to government. We took that advice uh, and uh, it uh, formed a part of the uh, proposal uh, and the uh, the project uh, that uh, has launched uh, in the RFP for uh, the redevelopment here in Cape Breton. Er, sorry, in, uh, in Halifax, my apologies. Thank you. Minister Porter, did you have uh, an introduction? Okay, uh, I recognize the honourable member for Pictou East. Go, go ahead. Oh, okay. I recognize Minister Porter. Oh, oh, sorry, the member. For hands Minister, west. They've got the light um, on now. Finally, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate it, and uh, thank you for the brief interruption. I just want to introduce our MP for uh, Kings Hants. Mr. Cody Blois, who uh, was elected uh, last year. Nice to see you here in the House, Cody. I'd like to ask the members to give him a warm welcome tonight. Thank you. I recognize the member for Pictou East. Nice to see Cody in the house today. Maybe he might have might have missed it this morning when Lenore Zahn was referred to as the best Liberal member of Parliament from Nova Scotia. But I won't tell you who said that, Cody. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, but, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, I'd like to ask the minister: Was the um, was the move of the Nova Scotia Cancer Program to the infirmary site, was that a recommendation of the Deloitte report? <clears throat> Minister? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, as the, the member would know, uh, the details uh, with the, the Deloitte uh, assessment uh, to support uh, the uh, planning and the uh, negotiations uh, of the uh, um, uh, the redevelopment uh, project, I believe that uh, the member is referring to, uh, is something that, uh, again, is uh, informing the negotiations uh, taking place uh, through the RFP process. Uh, that, uh, Madam Chair, and those details uh, would be uh, made uh, available uh, when uh, the uh, process is complete. The member for Pictou East. Madam Chair, I guess the, I guess the, the issue is, is that um, many of the services could, could be administered equally well at the existing site uh, without a loss of effectiveness. Um, the current site is not outdated. 
and and we could save as a province millions of dollars by not moving it. So I think it's an important question of of why are we moving these these services because we know that that those millions of dollars that could be saved by not by not moving the services could certainly be used elsewhere in this in this province. So um, I'd like to ask the minister if the if the cancer care program was to remain at its current site would there be any significant impact on uh, on ambulatory patients that are requiring radiation treatment? Would there be any impact on the actual patients for leaving it at the current site? Minister? The uh, advice and, and recommendation and request that was made of us uh, by uh, the cancer uh, care uh, team uh, did uh, flag that uh, the recommendation to, uh, in light of the ongoing redevelopment project, uh, move uh, the cancer care services as well, um, particularly uh, recognizing the um, uh, patient uh, impacts, uh, particularly for those most frail uh, patients uh, who uh, would uh, be on an, on an inpatient uh, basis uh, receiving care. Uh, the need, uh, because they would be, if, uh, if the site did not move, they would be uh, located um, at uh, the, um, the uh, QE2 uh, HI uh, site uh, and would have to be uh, transported and then transported back uh, while in uh, Vulnerable State that, that uh, in, a, in a high level uh, was a significant part of the patient safety uh, outcomes uh, case that was brought forward uh, by uh, the cancer care team to uh, support the advocacy uh, for uh, the uh, ultimately the design uh, change, Madam Chair, uh, that uh, has been uh, pursued. The member for Picto East. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, but yet, in, in places like Toronto, it's working just 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 fine, where 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 patients can be moved a very short distance. And we're, we're talking about a very short distance uh, in this situation, but we're talking about a significant add to the cost of the project. And I guess I'm just I'm just wondering um, if the minister can articulate the benefit of moving the the um, uh, moving it to the infirmary site. We know the um, we know we've all been reading the editorials. Um, from frontline workers who think this is not necessary. And I understand there's a lot more uh, people with a lot more to say on, on, on the reasons it not, it's not necessary as well, but, but they're, not, they're not able to find their voice on this for, for fear of repercussions. So um, moving, um, there's obviously impacts on the cost, but certainly moving, moving the cancer pro care program to the infirmary site will ha we'll have another impact, which we know about, and that's on the parking situation. Uh, because it will cause the, the demolition of, of um, existing parking spots. So uh, I, I guess I'd ask the minister one more time if the minister is able to articulate what are the actual benefits um, on, on, of moving it. Uh, because they're not obvious to most Nova Scotians. Um, he's, he's, raised, uh, he's raised an example of, well, moving some patients uh, might be a problem, but it's not a problem in other areas. Um, and and for, for what's at stake here, I'd just like to ask the minister again if he can, if he can articulate what is the actual benefit to patient care, uh, to patient care for moving the cancer care program to the infirmary. <clears throat> minister? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I believe uh, I answered that in, in the previous uh, question as uh, was brought uh, to us uh, by uh, those uh, representatives of the cancer care program uh, as to their belief as to uh, the uh, patient quality and, and safety um, value of making this move. Uh, not, Madam Chair, necessarily uh, something that the, they would uh, have advocated for, the absence of uh, the fact that we were developing a uh, plan for infrastructure uh, for uh, the future of uh, of uh, the province. Uh, there, uh, uh, those uh, changes that uh, were identified, uh, as uh, the members would know, uh, this is a once in a generation uh, sized uh, healthcare uh, infrastructure revitalization initiative. That means when we are evaluating and, and making the decisions about these investments we're making uh, today, 
uh, that uh, the decisions that we're making are, are looking uh, forward to the to the future um, for many many years. Uh, the opportunity to address the overarching um, healthcare uh, infrastructure challenges uh, within these sites, uh, the overarching um, consensus around the co-location uh, of uh, all of uh, these services uh, at uh, this point of a redevelopment project uh, is uh, what uh, came forward. We accepted uh, those recommendations uh, as uh, I've mentioned uh, to the member, the uh, cancer care uh, team uh, did bring forward and, and made the case uh, on uh, those grounds um, to um, flag uh, as far as the um, how that uh, clinically breaks down uh, <clears throat> how that clinically breaks down uh, on an individual kind of patient uh, impact piece. I, again, uh, defer to uh, those uh, experts uh, within uh, Cancer Care Nova Scotia uh, because that is who we rely on for advice and, and recommendations. Um, but uh, we do recognize that uh, this uh, work uh, and what this uh, investment means for Nova Scotians. Uh, this means uh, modern equipment uh, and service delivery. Uh, that uh, equipment will ensure that Nova Scotians have access to uh, the most modern cancer treatments uh, available uh, when uh, this uh, redevelopment is completed. Uh, that has uh, patient uh, outcomes. Uh, the, the member may be aware that with advances in uh, radiation uh, treatment and, and technology, uh, being made available, there are significant improvements. For example, one example uh, provided by uh, Dr. Bethune in, in conversations was um, uh, advances in uh, radiation therapy that allows for reduction from, I believe it was uh, dozens of radiation treatment uh, requirements, uh, for example, a patient uh, with uh, breast cancer, that can be reduced down to, uh, based upon the ability to target more effectively and accurately uh, the cancer uh, within having uh, fewer uh, treatments necessary uh, down from, uh, as I said, I believe uh, if I recall correctly, uh, several, uh, a couple dozen uh, treatments down to as few as five. <laughs> Uh, that uh, having fewer treatments means uh, less uh, impact uh, to the patient, less exposure to uh, radiation, uh, harmful radiation for an otherwise healthy uh, individual. Uh, by targeting, it means less uh, residual damage uh, within the uh, healthy tissue and cells uh, of the uh, individual, uh, Madam Chair. So uh, there are a, a wide variety of opportunities as well for research uh, opportunities with the, the modern equipment uh, that again uh, provides opportunity within the modern uh, health system um, that uh, ensures that the cancer care services uh, and the enhancements uh, available and afforded by this investment uh, will uh, translate to, to research and that includes uh, support for recruitment and retention of uh, the uh, uh, oncology specialists uh, necessary to ensure again that the uh, <laughs> utmost uh, top-notch quality of care uh, being provided to cancer patients uh, throughout Nova Scotia by virtue of uh, this change. So I hope that uh, addresses the member's uh, question about uh, some of the um, uh, benefits and the clinical uh, and patient safety uh, aspects that uh, have supported the advocacy uh, made by Cancer Care Nova Scotia to have this uh, change included as part of the redevelopment project on behalf of Nova Scotians. Okay. The member for Picto East. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just maybe maybe the minister can clarify. It seems like the minister is implying that we can only have this new equipment if we build a new building. Um, my understanding is we have a perfectly good building, and we're going to tear down a good building and tear down a good parking lot so we can build another building somewhere. Um, and and certainly oncologists have spoken out against this. Uh, I know the I know the. Um, I know the Premier was certainly appeared to be very dismissive of um, Dr. Bernard uh, Bradley. Um, he he, he kind of referred to him as a retired guy. Uh, but I think those, those I, I think there's uh, value to uh, people who have worked in the system. I, I, I respect their opinions possibly more than, than the Premier might. Uh, but I guess, um, is it the Minister's assertion that we can only have this new equipment if we have a new building. Is that what the minister is saying? Because I, I suspect we can have this, we could probably have more new equipment if we didn't waste money on tearing down buildings that don't need to be torn down. So is it the minister's position that we can only have this new equipment in a new building? It can't go in the existing building? 
Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, the member uh, makes reference to uh, individuals uh, that uh, are opposed to uh, this redevelopment, uh, this part of the redevelopment uh, project. Um, I'm not aware of any um, concerns <coughs> being raised. Uh, this project uh, was originally announced in, in, in uh, several, I uh, think uh, the details even, uh, were over a year ago when uh, the details of this uh, project were announced uh, well down the uh, planning and, uh, and uh, RFP uh, process, uh, Madam Chair, um, to uh, raise those concerns. The, the development and preparation uh, for uh, this uh, project uh, were underway for a period of time um, prior to that, uh, prior to those details being announced um, when uh, the new generation uh, project uh, was officially launched. Um, that, uh, Madam Chair, uh, again, uh, both at that time and subsequently, uh, the information and, and the awareness that uh, this uh, cancer uh, program was, was changing, uh, was, was part of the, the program uh, design, uh, was noted uh, as a part of that work uh, that, uh, again, uh, I, you know, off of the top of my head, I don't recall any correspondence uh, or outreach that uh, came to my attention at the time that we made the announcement or, or <laughs> subsequently uh, that uh, would uh, indicate anybody was opposed to uh, this uh, particular course of action. In fact, uh, all of the feedback uh, that I have uh, received uh, to, to date, uh, short of uh, the members' uh, concerns being raised here, which I, I believe uh, are uh, predicated on um, some public uh, correspondence uh, to, through, um, uh, through the media, um, uh, that uh, that have uh, been uh, broaching uh, some concern with that uh, uh, from a, an, an individual. Uh, that, uh, Madam Chair, I want to reiterate uh, the amount of time and energy that uh, this project uh, has taken in the planning stages. Uh, that uh, effort and work uh, that was uh, undertaken for uh, the preliminary work um, to identify uh, what that master plan uh, for uh, the uh, transition of healthcare services uh, would look like. Uh, this uh, effort and uh, work within uh, the QE2 of redevelopment, uh, we have to uh, recognize uh, is looking forward. Uh, it is a multi-site um, uh, project where we see uh, expansions over at the Dartmouth General, uh, providing opportunities to expand uh, healthcare services and, and uh, health infrastructure at that site uh, to support the transitioning of uh, services uh, from uh, the existing uh, VG site uh, over there. Uh, while, uh, Madam Chair, we see uh, investments as well uh, in uh, uh, the Hans uh, area, uh, opening up an operating room that hadn't been operational for decades, uh, while uh, modernizing the other existing uh, room as well. Uh, so uh, again, the overarching uh, review and feedback that was provided by um, the uh, clinicians uh, that uh, were engaged as part of the um, planning uh, to identify uh, what services uh, had to move, what services were desired to be moved, uh, what the uh, clinical rationale was for advancing uh, those changes. Uh, that uh, work, Madam Chair, all preceded uh, the announcement as to what the QE2 redevelopment uh, project, uh, the new generation project, uh, was going to look like. Uh, we took that ad advice, uh, again, uh, a significant amount, if I recall correctly, there, there were over 300 clinicians throughout the, um, throughout the consultation uh, process uh, there uh, uh, to look at uh, how and, and what services needed to be moved. I know the member is uh, focused here on uh, specifically uh, the, the cancer uh, services, as I've uh, previously stated. Uh, we heard from uh, the leads within Cancer Care Nova Scotia uh, that uh, they had uh, particular concerns um, that uh, for um, patients who uh, are the most ill uh, cancer patients uh, within the province who would be um, 
receiving care and inpatient within the HI uh, site after the redevelopment was uh, completed and the VG uh, site decommissioned, that those patients would be uh, located at the new HI site uh, with the upgrades. The concern that was brought forward is that those most ill cancer patients in the province would be expected to be um, brought down, um, transported uh, to receive that care, uh, that treatment, uh, and then transported back. Uh, that was a particular concern uh, that was brought forward, that this government recognized that uh, when uh, the opportunity, again, making a uh, once-in-a-generation investment uh, to modernize not just our cancer care, health care infrastructure here, uh, but indeed uh, a significant portion of our tertiary and quaternary uh, health infrastructure uh, in uh, Halifax. Uh, that services not just the peninsula, it services not just HRM or the central zone, it services the entire province and indeed uh, much of the Maritimes and uh, in, in some instances uh, uh, people from uh, all of Atlantic Canada. Uh, so to uh, the member's uh, inquiry as to uh, whether or not this uh, particular investment uh, decision uh, to support cancer care um, enhancements uh, is something that could, uh, uh, how, how did he phrase, uh, whether equipment uh, could be updated. Uh, the member uh, equipment can be updated, of course. Uh, but uh, again, with this opportunity, the concerns that were brought forward to us and presented to us as a government uh, saw uh, additional rationale. They recognized uh, that um, with the movement of the inpatient services from the VG over to the new location at the HI uh, would create uh, harm or concern, that there would be uh, patient safety uh, concerns uh, about that um, uh, potential for negative impact uh, to those most ill um, cancer patients uh, in the province. That uh, then uh, is the beginning point of the case being made for uh, the advancement. I think the member opposite has started with the, the, the premise uh, suggesting that uh, new equipment was the starting point. That wasn't the starting point of the decision uh, here, Madam Chair. The starting point was patience. And indeed, those most ill patients uh, within the uh, province and the can under the, uh, the care of the cancer care program, uh, that was the starting point. Uh, from that uh, evolves the opportunity then um, to uh, obtain the new equipment um, as part of this uh, redevelopment. As uh, and if uh, new investment in the uh, infrastructure uh, for a cancer care program um, was to be made, uh, the, the question again, if we Let's, uh, you know, the, the member wants to, to frame in, in the hypotheticals. Uh, if one was to create uh, the, um, the uh, cancer care uh, program with new equipment, uh, would they be creating it at an alternate site or would they be co-locating it? Uh, what is the uh, design um, um, for uh, standard of care? Um, and, and target uh, objective to maximize the positive health outcomes uh, and minimize the strain uh, on uh, our sickest uh, Nova Scotians uh, in need of that care. Uh, this uh, government accepted the recommendation that was brought forward uh, to us as part of the preparatory work uh, on the uh, design uh, of a uh, redevelopment project the likes of which, from a healthcare perspective, has never been seen uh, in the province. Uh, it is a project of a scale uh, that hasn't been seen in the healthcare system, um, but also one that is long overdue. Uh, that is why we've uh, relied throughout the system here in Halifax uh, to uh, hear from those clinicians uh, who are affected by. Um, the uh, redevelopment initiative. Uh, it is a very similar uh, process uh, that uh, takes place, uh, took place in, in Cape Breton to engage uh, with frontline healthcare professionals to inform uh, the uh, design um, uh, for 
the needs, the clinical needs uh, of the uh, redevelopment project. Uh, those uh, needs uh, were the foundation of the planning uh, process uh, at e each of those sites. Uh, again, I, I, I can't imagine that the member uh, opposite is uh, suggesting, um, given how frequently uh, he and his colleagues across the aisle have been on the record uh, demanding, in particular within the healthcare space, uh, we need to listen to our healthcare providers um, as uh, part of our planning for uh, healthcare delivery. That, uh, Ms. Madam Chair, is exactly uh, what our redevelopment projects here in Halifax and Cape Breton uh, have been uh, founded upon. We uh, will uh, continue to uh, engage as the detailed work uh, within these redevelopment uh, projects uh, continue uh, down that uh, path. Um, but uh, as I've said and uh, answered uh, the member's question, uh, the foundational uh, starting point for uh, the cancer care development here in Halifax uh, being moved to the, uh, as part of the uh, QE2 redevelopment uh, was predicated on patient safety. Uh, that is the, the driving force. Uh, the member uh, was asking for information. That patient safety then uh, expands besides just the uh, scenario uh, presented uh, to the other uh, aspects of what that new uh, technology and investments uh, in equipment uh, and uh, new opportunities for uh, modern uh, cancer radiation uh, delivery, um, the uh, transfer and development of a new uh, cancer uh, centre uh, at the HI site uh, affords Nova Scotians. And again, I, I, I doubt that the members suggesting that Nova Scotians deserve uh, anything less. But uh, again, uh, the starting point, uh, as I've reiterated numerous times, but the member asked uh, multiple times, so I'm taking the time to ensure uh, that he's aware uh, that uh, the patient safety aspect was the driver here. Uh, and again, uh, the member cited uh, multiple times uh, allegations of, of concerns that uh, this is not something supported uh, by healthcare professionals. I'll reiterate, this is uh, not something that has ever been brought uh, to uh, my attention. Um, certainly uh, accessible, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, my uh, contact information is available on uh, the uh, department's uh, website uh, for uh, people to uh, reach out and express those concerns, uh, particularly healthcare professionals. Uh, the member uh, has made uh, this evening uh, a statement, uh, an allegation, which I've heard in the past uh, by members uh, opposite about uh, healthcare professionals uh, fearing uh, retribution to speak out and provide uh, criticism, and yet uh, we can look at uh, media uh, outlets over the last uh, number of years. Uh, there are many healthcare professionals on the front line who have uh, publicly uh, criticized um, aspects of uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority and or government. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, retributions uh, that have been brought forward. I don't know why uh, the member would would uh, suggest that that uh, was uh, something that uh, took place uh, or why uh, healthcare professionals may feel uh, that. Uh, again, I've never uh, advocated or advanced uh, in any case, nor have I heard or seen, uh, the, to my knowledge, uh, retribution being made for individuals who have publicly uh, criticized uh, the uh, Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, or uh, the government. Uh, and again, I, I submit uh, to the member, uh, uh, the members of this legislature, uh, you only need to look at the uh, many uh, news articles that have been tabled by the opposition over the last couple of years, um, the many uh, references that have been made to, to uh, statements by healthcare professionals uh, concerned, expressing their concern over uh, aspects of uh, changes within the health system that they, they didn't advocate or support. Uh, with the uh, work that uh, is ongoing here in the QE2 uh, and Cape Breton redevelopment uh, projects, we uh, again start uh, by recognizing and acknowledging, and I think all members of the legislature agree, uh, that uh, the VG site needs to be dealt with. Uh, that that uh, is, uh, you know, if we can start to see where we, we build consensus that site needs to be replaced. That governments of the past for far too long ignored uh, the need. They've never developed the plan or set aside uh, the, uh, the financial resources to invest in um, either maintaining or, or replacing uh, that uh, aged uh, piece of uh, healthcare infrastructure. One of the um, 
one of the major projects, obviously, that we've uh, undertaken is to um, do the work of the redevelopment. It, the work started under my, my predecessor, uh, the current uh, Minister of Community, Culture and Heritage, the former Minister of Health and, and Wellness, um, that uh, began uh, engaging the, the teams uh, within the Nova Scotia Health Authority um, to uh, and uh, transportation infrastructure renewal uh, to um, to pull together um, and uh, solicit the requirements that a redevelopment project may uh, require. That uh, work uh, continued uh, through uh, uh, the uh, the work of uh, representatives within the uh, Department of Transportation Infrastructure Renewal, our partners at the Health Authority, as well as uh, Department of uh, Health and Wellness, um, to ensure that, uh, again, voices, uh, particularly clinical uh, from the front line, have the opportunity to um, uh, provide input, uh, both on uh, the uh, absolute uh, uh, requirements and uh, the uh, desired uh, changes uh, to be made to meet the health care needs. And again, we're not looking at a redevelopment project that merely mirrors the um, mirrors the uh, existing infrastructure within uh, the VG site, uh, but rather one, uh, since uh, we have to go through uh, such a significant uh, cost, that in our redesigning, we don't just take what is there, but we uh, evaluate and say, uh, so where are we going? With our healthcare uh, system design and, and delivery, uh, and what uh, what will that look like? Uh, what uh, we uh, do there uh, again is, is take that clinical uh, advice and, and feedback uh, that informed the the master planning work uh, that framed the overarching. Uh, uh, requirements uh, that have been advanced uh, through the uh, RFP uh, process uh, to uh, have this development work done. Again, the uh, significant uh, undertaking uh, recognizes that um, uh, it was not just an opportunity uh, to build um, a replacement for VG and, and those new services right here on the peninsula, but also a recognition that this was an opportunity uh, to, again, modernize and distribute and recognize that as a single health authority delivering care to Nova Scotians, uh, be it cancer care, surgical care, uh, that those services can be provided elsewhere and that some of the uh, expanded uh, service delivery and infrastructure investment was uh, most appropriately uh, distributed to uh, other sites as well, um, including the uh, extensive uh, expansion and renovations uh, that have been uh, underway at Dartmouth General Hospital, uh, the Hans Hospital, we've got the Bears Lake uh, development uh, as well. Uh, so uh, there are many different um, aspects uh, to uh, this project. I know the member just asked uh, about the, uh, the specifically uh, on the uh, cancer uh, care side of things, uh, but as I said um, to the member's uh, point that he's uh, asked uh, multiple times this evening, uh, it was uh, when brought uh, to our attention, uh, driven by uh, clinical patient uh, safety, patient care uh, needs. Uh, there were other uh, um, circumstances that were uh, wrapped up uh, in uh, uh, the proposal, as I've uh, flagged uh, as well bef uh, previously, uh, that relate to the opportunities that the uh, new uh, technology uh, provides. Um, recognizing as well that uh, much of the, the technology uh, in the existing site uh, would be uh, coming up for uh, replacement uh, as well uh, at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, and again, we're looking at a 50 year project um, to uh, build and design and, and uh, I can uh, refer perhaps uh, the member to, uh, you know, because I can, I can predict what he would uh, suggest is, well, why don't you leave it now and, and do the, the cancer uh, care piece later. Um, you know, you see that uh, in uh, sites like uh, Dartmouth General uh, that had a, a floor on top of the building that was never utilized. It was designed and, and built there with the intention of, of expansion. It took decades uh, before a government came along willing to make the uh, infrastructure investment to leverage uh, 
uh, that space to provide the care and show the respect to the people on the Dartmouth side uh, of uh, the harbour, uh, that, that we recognise the valuable uh, healthcare contributions that they make, uh, again, not just to the citizens in and around Dartmouth, but as part of uh, the integrated Nova Scotia health uh, system. Um, that uh, that was, uh, again, a starting point for much of the work uh, that's uh, being done and, and continues to be done uh, at uh, the Dartmouth General site. Uh, so uh, again, uh, happy to uh, continue the discussion with the member opposite. Um, but uh, I believe I've answered uh, the question that he's uh, proposed about uh, the uh, equipment and, and whether uh, that equipment uh, needed to uh, be uh, moved or what the rationale uh, for uh, the, um, uh, the move of the uh, cancer centre uh, from its current location to the HI site as part of the QE2 redevelopment. Recognize the member for Pictou East. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the Minister's uh, response, and there'll be lots of time to talk about this. Um, I know I recognize that the, the Minister said that he hadn't heard any, hadn't heard any issues about this redevelopment. Perhaps he was out of province or out of country when the parkade issue was, was happening, for sure. That was certainly something that opened the door and shone the light on what was happening to a lot of Nova Scotians. And look what happened when the lights went on. There's going to be a little change, I think, around that. And I think that uh, in the fullness of time, uh, we will see that this will also happen because Nova Scotians are, are concerned this government can't get this wrong. And we look at the, the, major, um, the major capital projects from this government, maybe somebody can point to one that, that, that they got right from the beginning. Can't get this one wrong. Um, and I think when you have uh, oncologists speaking up, uh, the minister said he wasn't aware of anyone getting uh, re, uh, retribution for speaking up, and I think I, I think I, I, I informed him of a, maybe jogged his memory of at least one, uh, and there'll be a numerous other ones as well. But but the point is that we have questions being raised about this, and we have a, a, a track record of a of a government who tends to get things wrong. Um, and those are valid concerns of Nova Scotians. So, um, uh, with that, with those, with those few words, I will, I will pass uh, the remainder of my time to my colleague. Uh, uh, I recognize the member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I might get one question in. <laughs> <laughs> I want to switch things up a little bit, uh, Madam Chair, and just focus on some mental health and addiction issues in Cape Breton specifically. Um, I do have an article here from uh, 2018, it just interviews a local psychiatrist in the area. And I think at that time there was about uh, 11 psychiatrists in the Eastern Zone, Madam Chair, and there was about 120 in the Halifax and surrounding area. Uh, so I'm just wondering maybe if I could uh, ask the Minister to clarify that ratio to uh, present day and what issues are ongoing with recruitment and retention for the Eastern Zone, Madam Chair. And you'll table that? Yeah, it's right here. Okay. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, certainly, um, uh, I'm just uh, seeing if we can uh, track down the specific uh, current uh, uh, vacancy uh, numbers there that uh, the members asked for. Um, but in the meantime, I think I'll, I'll answer, I think, uh, some of the, the context or the background. Um, first and foremost, I think we'll, we'll come to agreement and, and acknowledgement uh, of uh, the fact that we, we have uh, vacancies, particularly around uh, psychiatry uh, in uh, the Cape Breton uh, region. Uh, that is, is something I uh, spent a uh, significant amount of time on. And in fact, uh, when I first got appointed uh, in 2017, um, uh, and it's one of the reasons I'm, I'm, I'm uh, 
not necessarily known as one to set people's expectations high uh, because if, if people go back and, and look at about August of, of 2017, um, uh, you know, as I was uh, getting my feet under me and, and, and proceeding with a, a tour uh, around the province, um, there was a, an announcement that went out that said there were three psychiatrists uh, that had been uh, identified and, and, and accepted uh, positions in Cape Breton. And unfortunately, I don't think a single one of those three who were publicly announced uh, as, as uh, committing to uh, joining the team at Cape Breton uh, Regional um, ended up, uh, for various reasons, um, making that uh, move um, within within their uh, and again a number of them were were personal decisions circumstances that did change um, often when physicians are committing they, they commit three six months uh, in advance and, and again life does happen uh, so um, uh, in, in this case, uh, people, I, I believe truly with their best of intentions, uh, had committed. Um, public communication had been made, expectations uh, both within the uh, community, um, but equally as concerning uh, expectations within the clinical community uh, were raised uh, at that point in time. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, uh, obviously uh, concerns when it became uh, apparent that those uh, uh, individuals were not joining the team, much uh, awaited and uh, I will acknowledge, uh, Madam Chair, the um, amazing fortitude of those frontline uh, mental health uh, clinicians, uh, including the psychiatry team at Cape Breton Regional. I've, I've met with, uh, with, with uh, members of them, uh, some formally, some informally. Um, one individual in particular, uh, Madam Chair, that I met with on, on multiple occasions to truly understand and appreciate um, the challenges being faced, but also, um, to receive recommendations and suggestions of, of steps that could be taken to try to support the team that's in place and the work that they were doing uh, while the recruitment efforts to fill the vacancies uh, could be done. Uh, I think uh, the member uh, just referenced, and again, even though I don't, don't have the number, the, the, the difference between the um, uh, number of psychiatrists in the in the uh, central region versus, uh, in particular, uh, the Cape Breton regional uh, portion of the eastern zone. Uh, that um, you know, one of those requests was essentially, how do we get more support? Uh, from the uh, those areas like the central zone that have uh, a higher uh, degree of support to come in and help us when uh, madam chair uh, to help those in in parts of the province that are are more acutely challenged which would be um, the the eastern and northern uh, zones in particular um, we took uh, essentially uh, those recommendations and included a compensation change uh, particularly targeted towards psychiatrists in those zones that were acutely um uh, vacant, had acute uh, volume of, of vacancies. Uh, it included um, changes to uh, the uh, uh, engagement uh, in other zones to have locums and other telehealth services uh, implemented to support uh, those uh, on the front line. So uh, again, uh, I don't think we've uh, I don't think I have the uh, specific number, but if the member wants to continue with some questions, if, if I do get uh, that information tracked down, I'll, I'll interject it in a, in a later response. Recognize the member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, due to some time constraints, I'm gonna switch things up, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, this, my next question is gonna be in regards to the Cape Breton uh, healthcare redevelopment, uh, which has been a significant topic of discussion in this house throughout the last a uh, number of weeks, and uh, I think the, a cornerstone belief with this health, the healthcare redevelopment is that if we build it, they will come. And uh, there's much worry in Cape Breton, uh, as I'm sure you can understand, uh, Madam Chair, that what if they don't come? And how does this conversation look in the department if there's a, a brand new building with no, no doctors, no, no uh, nurses to staff it? And uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Minister? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I think uh, the, the, the facts uh, remain that uh, the uh, redevelopment work is, is a necessary part of, of infrastructure uh, refreshing uh, within uh, the Cape Breton region, much like it is here in, uh, in the central zone uh, and that work uh, that's underway. Uh, so uh, again, the, the underlining uh, premise and motivation of the Cape Breton redevelopment is not uh, as a recruitment uh, strategy or initiative. That's a very 
expensive um, process simply motivated uh, to uh, support recruitment uh, in, in initiatives. Uh, we have certainly made reference to the fact that because the redevelopment, the acknowledgement of aged infrastructure and uh, program delivery uh, within the region, um, having the opportunity to refresh, um, certainly uh, we do believe that in combination with the many other initiatives uh, like the clerkship program that launched in Cape Breton last year, um, the uh, expansion of residency uh, seats uh, outside of uh, the urban centres uh, to uh, more rural uh, communities, um, that these types of programs and initiatives, uh, including the expansion of nursing seats at Cape Breton, uh, Cape Breton University, uh, will um, help support, um, again, recruitment uh, retention opportunities, uh, along with the infrastructure. So again, that, that's not been the driver for the infrastructure redevelopment, um, but we do believe that the infrastructure redevelopment will help uh, with those recruitment retention initiatives. And again, thinking just uh, specifically about nursing uh, staffing, uh, we recognize that we uh, announced uh, the additional uh, uh, 60 uh, seats uh, at uh, Cape Breton uh, University uh, that uh, will help ensure uh, the supply of, of nurses um, within the region um, to uh, fill existing vacancies and uh, any um, additional demand based upon um, the uh, service re restructuring within the Cape Breton redevelopment. And again, with physician recruitment, we continue that uh, throughout the province. Um, and uh, Cape Breton uh, region is, is one of those uh, areas that that uh, recruitment continues. I recognize the member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Madam Chair. There's a much shift in the structure of the health authority, I think, over the last number of years, as the minister, I'm sure, would know, uh, from a centralized model to decentralized. In the, in the last number of months, uh, there's been much uh, speculation on what this decentralized model looks like going forward. And uh, will these decentralized models, uh, for example, institute local health, health uh, community boards back in the local areas? Uh, and will these decentralized individuals uh, in the Eastern Zone have the ability to hire uh, primary care providers on the spot uh, without uh, authorization from Halifax? Thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. Minister? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess uh, in, in a couple of uh, structures. Uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, as the um, overarching entity uh, providing care is, is not changing. There, there will be one organization responsible uh, for the um, operational delivery of, of the health care services. Um, as per its, its current mandate. Uh, the legislative mandate uh, and uh, obligations of the organization are not changing. What is changing, Madam Chair, that was announced uh, in the fall uh, is uh, within the organization itself uh, that uh, they have uh, adopted or moving forward with um, a, a reorganized administrative structure within the entity itself. Um, so this isn't uh, uh, the piece that, that, that uh, we've uh, structured uh, that requires any legislative or, or structural changes. It's within uh, the entity itself. Um, the uh, details of that uh, rollout, again, are, are taking place within the Nova Scotia Health Authority. I believe some of the uh, preliminary uh, information about uh, how um, increased uh, focus on the uh, autonomy of the uh, zone VPs uh, that would be in place. Um, so that would be four uh, senior level uh, representatives. There had always been VPs with zone responsibilities. Um, but what I think uh, was uh, identified was that the challenge of them having multiple roles with a clinical role and a, uh, a zone uh, regional role uh, in place. Um, by having that, that zonal focus, and they then can build their, their team around them that uh, supports that uh, local uh, decision making. Uh, the member, uh, Madam Chair, and perhaps he, he can clarify if I, if I don't answer this, this, this question, because uh, I think I can interpret it two different ways when he made reference to local health boards. Um, community health boards uh, continue to exist uh, and continue to work in collaboration with the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, and within their, their local community communities to support um, efforts uh, really at the frontline grassroots uh, side of health uh, within within communities and supporting uh, other um, 
non-profit, uh, community-based uh, health initiatives uh, within community, uh, and they continue to exist and, and be part of that, that structure. So if, if that's the piece that the member was, was referring to about will, will community uh, health boards uh, be returned, um, they never left. Um, but if the member was referring to community health boards as in the community health districts like the former Cape Breton Regional Health Authority, um, that would not, uh, per the start of my, my response, which is that the Nova Scotia Health Authority as a single entity will continue to exist. The operations and the increased autonomy that's going out uh, to the zones uh, within the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, a structure uh, is to give them more autonomy um, uh, within uh, the decision making. Uh, he asked a very specific question about you know, a hypothetical on, on the decision making at, uh, at the ground level for, for hiring. Uh, I think uh, at this point that would be something I would defer to the Nova Scotia Health Authority um, as they uh, roll that um, administrative and, and decision making structure uh, within those zones uh, out uh, to the uh, province. The member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my next question uh, relates to public health, uh, Madam Chair. There's been very little mention in this budget to public health, uh, preventative treatment uh, in regards to chronic health conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, uh, congest congestive heart fail failure, chronic mental health conditions. Uh, I think with budgetary uh, resources, if these were ac accurately identified, they could reduce a uh, significant amount of ER visits, uh, therefore kind of resolving the backlog. And uh, I, I do think, Madam Chair, that uh, there's a significant focus on uh, hospitalized-based acute care and not too much of a focus on public health treatment uh, and proactive preventative treatment, Madam Chair. So I'm just wondering why is there no really mention uh, in the, the budget that I've seen uh, that mentions uh, preventative health care? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank uh, the member for the question. Uh, indeed, uh, within uh, health systems, it's a, a constant uh, challenge um, uh, and one that's recognized, um, I think, in, in health systems um, uh, throughout uh, much of uh, the, the Western world, uh, at least, um, at um, striking that balance of being responsive to the immediate acute uh, needs uh, of uh, our citizens, uh, while at the same time recognizing the value, um, the value of preventative in in interventions, um, where and how those uh, preventative um, uh, opportunities are. Uh, we do have funding certainly uh, within uh, the budget broken out through a, a variety of areas uh, including in our mental health and addictions uh, program uh, supports and, and uh, grants um, and uh, within uh, the public health space. Um, so we do have um, uh, a lot of work uh, in those areas. Uh, I think our <clears throat> our focus in, in mental health uh, and addictions over the last uh, number of years and expanding, particularly targeted at youth-based and community-based uh, mental health supports uh, and initiatives, were very much built upon that foundational piece of, of preventative, of early early identification, early intervention, because we know how those uh, clinical benefits, Madam Chair, um, play out over the life of the individual. Mental health uh, conditions that uh, often, uh, for those with, with chronic mental health uh, challenges, manifest themselves or first present themselves in, in adolescence and, and youth. So getting more supports and investing there, those investments uh, which are continuing in this budget um, are preventative on that mental health uh, uh, side of the, the equation. And, and uh, I think the members um, 
colleague in the um, motion to go into supply uh, cited some, some data about fewer people, uh, if I recall correctly, if not in supply than on a previous uh, day in estimates, uh, about uh, fewer people receiving mental health services. Um, uh, actually, now I'm Minister? Actually, I'll have to go back to the tape on that one. I'm now second-guessing whether it was on mental health services or if it was home services uh, that she was referring to. Uh, but the uh, the point is that these, these investments in, in early identification and intervention, particularly for our youth, are designed for exactly the, the purpose that the member had referenced, to reduce the demand upstream in our acute uh, system so that that care can be uh, supported and, and, and spread uh, further throughout, um, throughout the, the health system. Um, and um, to the, the member's previous question, I said if I got the information, um, there do continue to be um, uh, 12 uh, psychiatry vac vac vacancies in the eastern zone, 10 of which are, are in Cape Breton. Again, I think uh, my comments uh, still stand in, in recognizing the, uh, the challenge with those uh, vacancies uh, being uh, outstanding for long term, uh, but uh, I do think we've made significant strides. Uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, has uh, made uh, significant uh, strides, uh, both uh, with compensation. Uh, we've increased uh, by almost 20% um, by uh, October of 2019, psychiatry compensation, um, and uh, I believe uh, another 9% uh, increase uh, in April of 2020, uh, recognizing that uh, compensation is, as being uh, part of uh, the concern that was brought to, to us for psychiatrists um, that we're really driving uh, to fill those those vacancies uh, as, as quickly as, as possible. Um, and uh, again, I think in my previous response, I spoke in, in detail at, at length about uh, how valued the, the work of, of those psychiatrists and other uh, healthcare professionals in mental health uh, services in Cape Breton uh, are. The member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, I know recently the senior director, or I guess the former senior director for the Cape Breton uh, Redevelopment Project was hired as the deputy minister. Uh, so what, will there be a replacement for his senior leadership in that project and can we expect a timeline for that replacement? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. We certainly recognize the uh, critical importance of that, uh, of that role. Um, so uh, we do expect it to, to be replaced. Uh, we, as I've mentioned in a, a previous uh, lengthy response about the uh, complexity and the multiple uh, uh, partners involved in this, the NSHA, TIR, ourselves uh, with the Department of Health and Wellness, um, that uh, we'll be engaging to ensure that we uh, go through and, and identify the, the right uh, individual to uh, uh, replace um, the uh, incoming uh, Deputy Minister of health and wellness, and, and again, that start time will be uh, still a, a month uh, or so uh, away. The member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Has there ever been any discussion uh, within the department, uh, an idea that makes a lot of sense to myself and other individuals, I think, in post-secondary in institutions, uh, to perhaps have a satellite campus uh, for local residents at the university, such as uh, St. John of Brunswick does through Dalhousie, as I'm sure the department is aware. Uh, where you could recruit residents from the area that would stay and train in the area, uh, that, that therefore uh, kind of increasing your numbers for primary care health care providers. Uh, I just want to know if that's ever been something that's been talked about. And I think it would be an, probably an excellent idea for uh, local recruitment. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. If the, if the member's uh, referring to uh, medical school uh, programming, um, uh, not uh, an entire uh, satellite within the province of Nova Scotia, I think in, in part uh, just based upon the size of, of uh, the program and the costs associated with establishing an entire uh, educational program uh, delivery site. Uh, however, Madam Chair, uh, the principle underlining what uh, the member has, has proposed is something we share and, and, and the policy uh, and program recommendation that uh, came forward and in fact has been pursued uh, is, is the establishment of a clerkship program. What that is, Madam Chair, for the benefit of the, the members of the legislature, uh, I believe the member opposite might be aware because we launched the program in, in Cape Breton last year, uh, it is a program where the entire third year of medical school uh, is actually, uh, for, for the uh, participants, is conducted within a single community. Uh, environment. So they 
uh, normally the various modules uh, of uh, clinical um, education that takes place in the third year of studies in the medical school program at Dalhousie would normally take place in multiple locations uh, when you go out to complete your, your clinical uh, placements um, for that year of study. Uh, what we've uh, identified, two driving uh, factors. Uh, one is by rolling the clerkship out in Cape Breton and in uh, the uh, m this uh, expansion that uh, was announced just a couple of uh, weeks ago uh, in uh, the South Shore uh, region, uh, is that the, um, as the member mentioned, Having exposure to these communities, um, people are more likely, uh, those uh, medical students are more likely to um, pursue a residency and set up practice uh, at a future date uh, in, in, in those types of communities uh, outside of the, the urban centre. Uh, the other reason is, is, again, from the clinical experience, having the opportunity to spend, I believe it's a, a, about 42, 43 weeks uh, of, of programming that's uh, completed. Um, that's completing almost an entire calendar year uh, of uh, training in the same practice environment. So for example, when you have in the traditional model uh, move from community to community, you might have the opportunity to provide care uh, to, and, and I'll just use this because it, it makes sense over a providing care to an individual over a period of time uh, to a, a pregnant mother. Well, you would only see them for that two or three week period that you're within the community. In the clerkship model, you spend almost an entire calendar year within the community, you're actually able to monitor that patient uh, over that period of time and you get to see all of the developmental uh, and uh, clinical uh, changes uh, that take place. It's a, it's a very different um, and uh, we believe uh, perhaps a more rewarding uh, opportunity and experience. So uh, again, in, in principle, but as far as an actual full-fledged uh, site, um, the, uh, the satellite that was referenced in St. John, New Brunswick, uh, is, uh, is, is part of a New Brunswick government initiative where they don't have any medical, uh, a, med a university uh, medical program of their own. Uh, they, uh, they're leveraging the um, uh, accreditation um, and the delivery model uh, administered by uh, Dalhousie University for that. And I think uh, U to M in Moncton, uh, uh, not sure if they still have, but I think they had one with a uh, relationship with a French university in Quebec, uh, I believe Sherbrooke uh, at one point as well. The member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. You have a minute. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just one, one uh, last question in regards to the Cape Breton healthcare redevelopment. Just curious as to the flexibility uh, of the infrastructure plans with that, uh, with that proposed development. Uh, for example, if there's an expansion at the Cape Breton Regional uh, and it can't be staffed with physicians, will the planned uh, extension in Glace Bay uh, still happen, Ms. Uh, Madam Chair? Thank you. Minister? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I think uh, for that uh, particular project, uh, we've already shown a significant uh, amount of uh, flexibility, I think, uh, which is predicated and built upon uh, what we said from the beginning in, in 2017 uh, when we announced uh, the redevelopment project, uh, that uh, we would be going out to engage the clinicians and the frontline uh, healthcare workers to help build the functional plans that would then inform the uh, master planning work uh, that would be done uh, for each of the uh, infrastructure uh, redevelopments. Uh, Order, time has lapsed for the PC caucus. We will turn it over to the NDP caucus. Uh, the member for Halifax, Shabakto. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in order for the, our guests to celebrate the fact this is the closing shift of their uh, job on this front, uh, maybe they'd like to take two minutes to just jump up and down. And we'll just, we'll take, we'll, uh, let, let's take a little second for them to have a minute to move around. How's that? <laughs> Fair? Yeah. Yeah. Good to go? Yeah. Great. Okay. okay. Um, thank you th thank for you, your Manager. kindness. Um, I, I would like to go back uh, to uh, where we were an hour ago. We were talking about vaccinations. Um, and uh, talking about um, funding uh, for vaccinations and uh, how, how some of that uh, 10 million is allocated. I, I wonder if I could get the minister to speak, please, to um, uh, if there's any increase in the budget 
for public education related to vaccinations. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I think if the, the member is referring to a specific uh, new program uh, launched or, or expansion this year, uh, there's there's not uh, one uh, designed specifically, um, again, as a, as a new program uh, targeted. Uh, recognizing, uh, however, that uh, within our, our uh, public health uh, sphere of uh, mandate and, and work that they do uh, to uh, continue to uh, promote and, and educate uh, Nova Scotians uh, about uh, vaccines and uh, and um, and uh, in particular uh, probably uh, the time uh, of year that you see the the most aggressive uh, promotion and, and uh, uh, about this is uh, during the flu season uh, which is the most uh, I guess recurring uh, vaccination that uh, that citizens uh, would uh, receive. Uh, so again, there's not a, a specific new uh, program announcement, uh, but within the existing uh, ongoing uh, budgets, uh, certainly we have uh, mandates and, and responsibilities to uh, communicate and, and promote. And I thank the member for bringing it to the floor of the legislature. So uh, it is a reminder for each of us. And uh, again, as uh, uh, constituency uh, MLAs, uh, we have uh, our uh, newsletters that I think many of us send out to our constituents. It's a great reminder and opportunity if anyone needs uh, public health information uh, to help support uh, communicating to your constituents about the health uh, uh, value of uh, vaccination and indeed uh, the concern the member mentioned in the last hour about some some Nova Scotians, uh, some, some people uh, in the world who um, don't necessarily um, believe the uh, clinical evidence that supports uh, vaccination. Uh, we can certainly uh, help uh, in, in communicating, providing uh, links to the resources that uh, make, uh, make very clear the clinical consensus that is out there on this uh, topic. The member for Halifax, Shabakto. Thank you. Uh, well, speaking of the flu vaccination, I mean, it's, it's certainly um, uh, an important subject for us in a province where we've got about a fifth of our population receiving the old age pension, uh, and where I think the number is more or less right that we've only got about a third of the population that gets the, the flu vaccine. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, in light of that, uh, what initiatives uh, are contained in the budget for the public education around improving those flu vaccine uptake numbers? Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank uh, the member for the question. Um, as I noted, not uh, something that's separate or, or, or specifically uh, noted there. Um, we make our, our efforts uh, each and, and every year um, to uh, share information. We uh, in engage. Um, we uh, believe we've, uh, again, the final uh, information isn't uh, in yet on this year's uh, flu uh, vaccine uptake, uh, but um, preliminary information uh, suggests that um, uh, you know, we, we would anticipate uh, seeing, we, we prepared with more vaccines uh, that we ordered. Um, I believe this might have been one of the, 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 the highest doses that, uh, that uh, vo uh, by volume, the number of doses that we, we ordered in, in several years, um, based upon a bit, a bit of a trend, uh, anticipating uh, more use. Uh, and we uh, greatly bolstered our, our promotion in, in this, uh, this uh, current year. Uh, well, I guess the, the current fiscal year uh, just ending, um, so in the fall uh, of 2019. Um, and uh, we uh, work with our partners, um, including uh, the Pharmacy Association of Nova Scotia, Doctors Nova Scotia, Nurses uh, Union uh, representatives, um, to um, ensure that uh, we try not to duplicate our, our, our promotional efforts. Um, if, uh, if you have multiple organizations doing promotional uh, initiatives, uh, we would uh, not uh, necessarily want to, to, to duplicate, uh, but rather uh, maximize uh, the investments that each of the organizations are making, uh, Madam Chair, so that coordination is, is done. And uh, we, uh, we do uh, engage uh, throughout uh, throughout the province and and, and do uh, a launch that is uh, our media part well I guess I don't know. 
the media um, do uh, often provide uh, significant coverage uh, of uh, the launch of our uh, flu uh, vaccine uh, vaccination uh, programs uh, each and, and every year. Um, I think that's because uh, some of the uh, media like to see me poked in the arm with a needle. Um, um, there's a particular uh, reporter from CBC who couldn't uh, hide his glee uh, this past fall when I was poked in the arm just downstairs uh, and he was taking a photo. So uh, again, we do, we do get media um, uh, from a, a PR perspective based upon the launch of the program as well. And uh, again, I do think that uh, discussions uh, this year uh, and last year, last year about uh, various uh, vaccinations was a very timely topic uh, over the summer and, and the spring, uh, the spring and the summer, and um, that I think uh, brought it top of mind uh, for many uh, people. Uh, and I think those are, are oftentimes uh, even more effective than um, simple um, promotion activities uh, with ad traditional advertising. Is when it becomes organic, uh, when the the demand um, makes it, it makes it into the the public uh, conscience and the discussions take place at the dinner tables um, then people uh, start to 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 buy in and, and recognize so again I encourage everyone to continue those conversations that a, a organic growth in person at Tim Hortons or at home at the dinner table or on social media making sure that you again encourage people to focus on on clinical and and evidence-based uh, research and and not um, and, and refer them to public health information the World Health Organization and 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 credit um, health uh, organizations uh, rather than um you know, I'll say random um, social media posts for their, their health information. We're seeing that, um, we've seen it with vaccinations and we're seeing it even with Corona, uh, the COVID-19 situation right now. Uh, as recently as today, there was a social media post uh, that uh, drew media attention, um, suggesting that there was a case in Nova Scotia. So misinformation in social media is very easy to distribute, very hard to contain and put back in the bottle. There, there are no cases in Nova Scotia that was corrected. Uh, I do appreciate the media for recognizing in these very important uh, health situations uh, for infection uh, by not perpetuating uh, false stories, by taking the, the time to validate their information. I think that's true as well when the vaccination discussion came up that the media were doing their part to um, present, um, again, the clinical uh, efficacy and, and evidence that is, uh, uh, by and large, the consensus of the healthcare community. The member for Halifax, Shabakto. Uh, thank you. Um, but I guess when uh, we think about the public conversation around vaccines, it's not really um, the flu vaccine that's the, at the centre of it. It's, it's uh, probably more measles and mumps. Uh, and, uh, and with measles and mumps, we, we know this has really been uh, an issue and that uh, you know where there's been an impact it's been kind of focused in the in the central zone um, is the department in, increasing its funding for vaccinations or and education around vaccinations related to the measles and mumps program minister Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, again, in, in some of the uh, increase uh, that uh, we spoke about in the in the previous uh, hour conversation, um, in in the vaccine uh, budget, it actually uh, relates to anticipated increased utilization, um, specifically for measles and mumps uh, vaccination. Uh, as well. So uh, in the previous hour I just referenced a couple of examples of new initiatives, um, but there's also uh, cost allocation uh, because uh, we've seen uh, increases uh, around that and, and so I'd uh, like to hope that uh, some of the uh, effort uh, that's done by our public health officials and uh, other healthcare uh, providers uh, out there on the front line uh, educating and encouraging uh, people to uh, ensure that their, their, their children and, and themselves uh, get their uh, vaccinations and uh, a reminder for those of us that are adults um, that uh, for some of our vaccinations, we do need to get boosters as well. Uh, that means you need to get revaccinated uh, at other points in time. If you're not sure what your, your schedule is, you might want to check uh, with your uh, personal uh, health care provider. The member for Halifax, Shabakto. Uh, thank you. Uh, and continuing to think about uh, measles and mumps, are there uh, other programs in the department, um, other initiatives to, pre to prevent these kind of outbreaks? Um, is there is there spending related to prevention particularly? Minister? 
There's uh, surveillance work uh, within uh, the department. Again, these these are, are things that are often uh, focused on. Um, again, our, our, our operations uh, within our public health uh, space. Uh, we recognize, uh, again, the, uh, the vaccine's been around for a long time uh, and the vaccination program. Uh, so it's really uh, part of our, our ongoing operational uh, delivery of care and services. Um, I, I will uh, disclose uh, to the member um, that uh, I, I have had uh, and, and, and am aware um, Actually, I guess I haven't uh, fully had uh, formal discussions, but uh, I've been made aware of a, a particular uh, stakeholder um, that, that would be a nonprofit uh, in the province that uh, has a uh, potential proposal um, that um, I look forward to hearing from them more formally. Um, that wouldn't be something in, in this year's uh, budget uh, explicitly. Again, I haven't heard uh, formally from the organization, but I've heard uh, informally about uh, um, some work that's being done um, that they, they are looking to bring forward uh, to government, which is uh, seems to be at uh, first blush a, a pretty innovative uh, proposal that can actually, uh, I think, help us uh, with the uh, communication and, and education around the efficacy and, and help to counter uh, some of the, uh, as they call it, the anti-vax um, misinformation that's uh, been spreading over uh, um, the last number of years and, and uh, really in the last year or so we've been really seeing I think on a public health perspective uh, some of the um, uh, consequences of that misinformation that uh, went perhaps uh, unchecked uh, for too long. Um, so again, uh, in this budget, it's, it's operation as, as, as usual, uh, but I am aware of a, a, an interesting project. It just uh, wasn't ready to uh, proceed at this time. I look forward to hearing more about it and, and see if we can uh, uh, incorporate that in some of our uh, program delivery uh, in, in a future year. The member for Halifax, Shabukto. Well, as we continue to, uh, to face this, this challenge of uh, um, uptake levels in vaccination which are not uh, really sufficient to provide the collective immunity we need uh, across the province, I wondered, has, has the department given any uh, thought to uh, potential incentive programs uh, to augment education programs that might be uh, undertaken in order to improve our numbers? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank uh, the, the member for uh, the question. Um, the, the, the notion of, um, I guess, um, what the, if I interpret the, the question around or suggestion around um, incentive, I'm, I'm assuming financial incentive, and I'm assuming the member is referring to incentives for the uh, citizen or the patient uh, and not uh, for the service provider. Uh, that's not uh, something that uh, had been uh, has uh, ever been uh, contemplated or, or considered, to my knowledge, uh, within our public health space. I'm, I'm not aware of uh, any programs. I'm not saying that none have ever uh, don't exist in, in other jurisdictions. Uh, I've I've never, um, I'm not aware of any in, in other jurisdictions uh, either. Um, but uh, again, it's the first, first I've heard of a suggestion like that. The member for Halifax, Shabukto. Uh, uh, thank you, and uh, and thanks for the, that a series of answers to questions about vaccinations. I, I'd like to ask a few questions now about um, uh, health care provision. Uh, in particular, I'm, I want to. Uh, explore some of the minister's thinking and the department's thinking about the relationship between um, uh, health care providing through pharmacists and health care providing through physicians. Uh, so we know we've had uh, a number of pretty significant uh, changes on that front by which uh, uh, pharmacists are, are now prescribing some medications and uh, and ordering some tests that, that hadn't been the case before. Uh, and uh, we've got pharmacists now in a position able to offer prescriptions on some kinds of bladder infections and uh, uh, things to, like shingles, um, uh, birth control. And uh, we know there have been these changes about uh, 
the conditions when pharmacists are able to extend prescriptions uh, in terms of the, the length of time that they're able to do that before it requires a, a visit to a physician. That's been, uh, that's been changed from one month to, I think, half a year. So, so we're in a pretty significantly changed um, landscape as far as the role of pharmacists and the interface uh, of the role of pharmacists and physicians. Um, and although uh, I think everyone, as we uh, face all the challenges about providing primary care, I think everybody who thinks about this, part of what they think about is how can the, the scope of practice of everybody be uh, uh, raised to the maximum uh, so that we can uh, uh, serve the needs of the population to the, to the maximum capacity. Nevertheless, it's plain from the point of view of just a, uh, a non-looker from some distance that this is not altogether without some frictions. Um, and uh, th that, uh, that there are, that there, you hear um, conversation uh, from healthcare providers uh, out of those frictions between uh, the physician's scope of practice and the pharmacist's uh, scope of practice, re relating to how uh, the two are um, uh, connecting to each other in the early days of this expanded role uh, for pharmacists. Um, and, and you hear it even said sometimes that, that there are unintended consequences of uh, of the expansion of pharmacists' role, uh, which we would have envisioned to uh, decrease the load on physicians, but in terms of um, the ordering of tests and so on, uh, that uh, some people say there even there even are increases sometimes for for doctors' workload. Um, so, in light of the fact that this is a this is a new um, a, a new landscape for us uh, with potential uh, lots of potential to offer, but but not entirely without uh, some dissonance. Um, I wonder, is there any provision in the department for doing an ongoing cost-benefit analysis of, uh, of how this, this new world of uh, uh, pharmacist-physician uh, relationships is rolling out? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I thank uh, the member for uh, the question and indeed uh, for taking a, a moment to draw attention uh, to uh, this uh, notion of um, scope of practice and, and, and how it can uh, relate to the delivery of uh, health care uh, services uh, in the province, including uh, some recent uh, announcements uh, specifically uh, relating to pharmacists in the province of Nova Scotia. Um, in, in answering the question, there's, there's really two streams uh, that I think members should be uh, cognizant of. Um, so when, when one talks about the scope of practice uh, for our healthcare providers, that scope of practice is really defined by the college that governs their licensing uh, and their licensure. Um, so that's, that's not government uh, generally that uh, defines what the scope of practice uh, for our uh, clinical, uh, our various clinical professionals in the province. Uh, we uh, have uh, in many of those instances uh, self-regulated uh, professions, uh, including the, the major health professions like pharmacists, uh, the uh, uh, physicians and surgeons, uh, nurses, uh, all have um, those um, governing uh, oversight bodies um, with the clinical expertise to know what the training programs look like and, and so on. And, and their responsibilities are governed by their um, legislation and their, their governance uh, bylaws and, and so forth. Uh, so when we talk about, for example, what transpired uh, late in 2019, the college expanded the scope of practice for pharmacists uh, within the province of Nova Scotia. Um, that uh, expansion in included engagement and consultation with other healthcare uh, providers, particularly uh, college representatives uh, like the uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons to get the uh, input and, and advice about um, the appropriateness of that expanded scope in these uh, areas that uh, would uh, traditionally uh, be uh, viewed as, as physician uh, services. Um, so that work gets done. Um, 
in fact, the scope of practice, uh, although there was a lot of attention on this um, capacity within the scope of practice of pharmacists uh, in uh, December, um, as the member rightly noted, uh, the change was to expand the duration by which uh, a prescription can be issued from, from, I think it was about 30 days to to, uh, to about uh, six months to 90 days, or three, is it 180? 180 days, yeah, 180 days, the six months uh, time period. Uh, that um, was a change in the college, but uh, they already had a scope of practice to um, refill prescriptions. So they would still rely on, uh, in these instances, a clinical diagnosis uh, by a, a primary care provider, by a physician. Uh, what it would allow them to do is to assess the, the patient um, uh, and this would apply uh, often in, in uh, chronic illness where there's, there's uh, ongoing renewals of the same prescription um, to assess the patient if, if, if uh, their health variables haven't changed, uh, that they would be in a position to renew uh, the prescription on behalf of the patient um, based upon their clinical uh, education and their ability to assess um, the uh, the health situation, but the original diagnosis in, in most of those uh, instances would still remain with the primary care provider. Um, now that's what, what streams me in, and again, that pre-existed, their ability to, to uh, renew prescriptions, um, pre-existed the change, the, the college regulatory change in December. That second path, though, is the question of insured services. See, a pharmacist uh, prior to December could do a, um, a renewal of a prescription, but it would cost uh, out of pocket for patients who, uh, because it was an uninsured service. Uh, what we did as a government and announced later in December was that uh, we entered into an agreement with the Pharmacy Association of Nova Scotia, uh, a, a contract that would see some of those services be uh, recognized within uh, the um, insured services um, uh, delivery uh, of, of care to uh, patients. Uh, that means that when a citizen goes in for that renewal now to a pharmacy, Madam Chair, um, the, 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 the pharmacist can uh, bill the province uh, for that uh, fee. And, and again, the contract is what negotiated the fee rates, just like we do with Doctors Nova Scotia in the master agreement uh, for physician uh, services. Um, so again, we will certainly continue to uh, uh, evaluate. Um, as, as far as I know, um, Doctors Nova Scotia did have representatives on the steering committee uh, for work. Uh, the evaluation of changes are, are built into the contract with um, uh, PANS, the, the Pharmacy Association of Nova Scotia, um, to date, and it's a very early, really just started in the, in the new year, and there are some additional changes to come on stream uh, in, I believe, April of, of this year. Um, but uh, so far, feedback uh, from patients and, and others uh, has been uh, quite positive. Um, so we look forward uh, to, um, uh, to seeing the, the final results of, of the uh, implementation. But uh, uh, again, there's uh, an evaluation which was the essence of the member's uh, question. But I just wanted to be sure that the members of the legislature, Madam Chair, were clear. Uh, again, that notion of scope of practice is not defined by us in government, but by the regulatory body. Um, but what we brought in to help with access to care, uh, which was our intent in the negotiations with the Pharmacy Association in Nova Scotia, was to bring um, some services that were within their scope of care um, that we felt could reduce some of the pressure at emergency departments and in primary care uh, offices, or, or at least support those Nova Scotians who may not have a primary care provider. So urinary tract infection, birth control, um, and some uh, prescription renewals uh, that the member had uh, referenced in his question. Recognize the member for Halifax Shabakto. Thank you. Uh, does that mean then that there would be uh, no uh, upward budgetary pressures uh, from the expansion of scope of practice of pharmacists? Uh, one could think, for example, of when when we expand the numbers of people that are able to order tests, we're apt to have more tests. Uh, uh, but is that in fact what the minister is saying that that uh, that it's kind of budget neutral? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I guess in the first, again, to, to clarify, we wouldn't anticipate uh, a change in uh, cost for the government based upon the scope of practice in and of itself. Uh, because the scope of practice in and of itself is um, 
is governed by the regulatory body. Um, they, uh, Pharmacy Association of Nova Scotia, uh, predominantly uh, provide uninsured services, um, so they could set up their practice and provide and promote um, those services that they're um, uh, allowed to perform under their license, um, but it would cost patients, so that would not be a pressure on the government. Where there would be the, the, the increase in cost and would be seen in, in our budget uh, is uh, with the agreement we entered into with PANS, the Pharmacy Association Nova Scotia, because we will see increased uh, growth in, in um, uh, the uh, services um, uh, and the fees submitted because we agreed to pay for uh, UTI, birth control, and, and some prescription renewals, uh, things that uh, were well within the clinical scope of practice as defined by the college, and things that we uh, believed um, individuals, uh, particularly women, um, and, uh, and uh, in some cases seniors or others with chronic uh, illness, and, and again, this was about access. Um, this uh, would uh, anticipate to see some increased utilization uh, of the health system because the access, uh, and I'll just use an example, uh, uh, you know, uh, the correspondence that I receive uh, sometimes from people um, uh, complaining and expressing their concerns about long waits in emergency departments, Madam Chair, uh, often those uh, very complaints uh, make reference to, and all I needed was a prescription renewal, but I don't have a primary care provider. And, and uh, you know, I guess on, on the one hand, one of the reasons they probably had to wait so long, Madam Chair, is because our emergency department is triage based. Those with the most acute uh, health care needs that need to be seen right away, heart attacks, cardiovascular issues and, and so on, are, are, are moved through the uh, emergency department very rapidly because the, the, the expediency needed for their care. A prescription renewal, uh, a span of, of hours is not a problem. It's inconvenience and it's a challenge for, for the individual and frustrating and, and all of those uh, other things. True. Um, but it is the way that the emergency department was designed. We believed that we provide more access to care by covering the cost of the renewals. We would have to pay for the renewal of the prescription in the emergency department or a primary care environment if the individual had access uh, to a primary care provider. So the net cost to uh, government um, providing the service would not go up because the person's going to get their renewal one way or the other. Uh, what we're doing is uh, providing more access closer to, to the patient. And again, the intent was targeted towards patients that don't have um, primary care providers, so that they wouldn't feel obliged to go to emergency departments, uh, thereby reducing demand in our emergency departments for those types of, of care that could be provided by others. So uh, again, uh, where the cost would be seen would be in the um, uh, Pharmacy Association of Nova Scotia agreement uh, area, um, and uh, so we'd forecast that increase based upon anticipated uptake uh, of citizens uh, using the uh, pharmacy uh, services. Um, some may be cost neutral. Again, someone who would have been filling a prescription in an emergency department, having it filled by the pharmacy, uh, it actually uh, reduced the demand by one in the emergency department, um, and uh, it just uh, was, was then seen in, in a different environment. So I hope that clarifies for the member, Madam Chair, um, how we see the, the budget and, and this playing out and actually complementing, um, while at the same time providing better care uh, and access to services for uh, Nova Scotians. The member for Halifax, Shabakto. Yeah, thank you, and, th and thank you for that explanation. Uh, would it then be the case that uh, that there are, in fact, s budgetary savings uh, f uh, for the uh, for the department overall uh, through this new relationship of uh, uh, pharmacists to the healthcare system, Minister? I don't think we, we viewed this as a, as a uh, really from a, a, a budgetary savings uh, perspective. Uh, I think uh, we've noted uh, the anticipation, the expectation of growth in, in utilization and demand of uh, health care services. Uh, that is uh, built upon a, a, a trend that uh, we see uh, over the last number of years, um, a, a trend that I believe is seen over, over much of uh, uh, the country um, in uh, health care needs. Um, so uh, again, to, to say that you'd expect, it, it's hard to tease out then that, that piece of uh, the rate of increased utilization and demand on the system um, while we're introducing another piece. Uh, what I'm really saying is that um, 
we'd be seeing that demand in the system uh, one way or the other. Uh, we're trying to uh, respond to those uh, Nova Scotians um, to provide convenient access without having to rely on the emergency department by reducing that pressure in our emergency department again, uh, hopefully uh, reducing the pressure and frustrations for patients uh, and, and the healthcare providers working there um, with uh, some of these uh, particular conditions. Uh, it's not a, a, a wide scope, uh, but again, uh, the relationship and the dependency uh, uh, as a, a pharmacist, as a part of your, your uh, healthcare delivery team, uh, I think is an integral part. As I've mentioned, many of those prescription renewals, Madam Chair, um, do depend upon a, uh, a physician's actual diagnosis of the condition that results in the prescription in the first place. Um, so the renewal is predicated on uh, not having changing health conditions that uh, allow the renewal to take place by the, the pharmacist. So you still need that uh, dialogue and engagement uh, with the uh, physician community as well. Member for Halifax, Shabakto. Uh, that's a good, uh, a good, clear explanation. I'm glad to have it. And just one last piece of clarification on this. Then, uh, does that mean that there, there are not, in fact, any additional e expenses to the province related to uh, training for pharmacists in the context of their new expanded role? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, no, the uh, provincially uh, we are we don't uh, pay. For, and actually, uh, I'm just trying to think. Uh, I'm, n I'm not. Um, I don't recall that there's uh, any uh, provision for uh, professional development or increased uh, training. Certainly not. Uh, that is. Um, so I'll say that there's not new training um, or expanded uh, professional development training uh, related to the expanded scope of practice that uh, is part of the uh, Pharmacy Association Nova Scotia contract. Uh, what I was thinking about, Madam Chair, at the, the beginning was um, I can't recall if there was already a provision that's just being maintained or rolled forward in the new in the updated uh, contract. Um, so there might be provisions in the contract, but this contract did not see a substantive or material uh, change in that investment as a result of the these changes. Uh, what I, what uh, would be expected there, uh, Madam Chair, is that the uh, professional development, if necessary, so newer pharmacists, Madam Chair, would be coming out of their education program already having the training uh, to meet the uh, college uh, criteria. That's in part one of the variables that the colleges look at when assessing uh, what uh, an acceptable scope of practice would be, is they're looking at what is the educational component, how are, uh, and again, I I talk, we're talking about pharmacists here, but it would be a similar process with nurses or, or other uh, professionals. W what is the education system? What are they being trained uh, and certified to be able to, to perform? Um, so the newer ones, the education system has already been updated to provide this information. Now for uh, pharmacists who uh, may have graduated uh, several years ago or perhaps even a, a decade or two ago uh, that might have had a slightly different training curriculum uh, or even if they had an acceptable curriculum at the time, because they didn't have the opportunity to practice to their full scope because of those regulatory uh, restrictions, uh, they would have to uh, perhaps go through a, a re-education or, or an upgraded uh, process. But those are, again, from a scope of practice perspective, part of the self-regulation of the profession, and they would have to adhere to the College of, Physici uh, College of, of Pharmacies, Pharmacists um, guidelines and responsibilities um, to ensure that they are capable uh, and uh, properly uh, educated uh, to perform those various tasks. And so what that means, Madam Chair, is um, al although uh, all pharmacists have the potential to be able to provide these services, some may choose not to. They may have the education and just choose not to expand their services uh, because there are some requirements, including having to change um, the environment to have a, um, a um, I guess an examination room space that's not currently uh, part of a design in, in many pharmacies. So if you don't have it, you may not want to incur the cost of, of building on an exam room to provide some of these enhanced services uh, which are required as part of their scope of practice. 
um, so they may have the training and the education requirements, but not want to make the uh, capital investment to, to expand their services. Others may be later in the career and, and choose just not to, to go with the educational requirements. Um, and uh, some uh, some may be, and, and I know some that I've, I've bumped into uh, after these announcements, Madam Chair, who are very excited um, and, and have described this as transformational um, and uh, shows a lot of respect uh, for the uh, profession uh, and uh, they are, are not going to school squander the opportunity and, and really show all Nova Scotians uh, uh, that uh, they are valued uh, partners within the health system and that they will uh, respect the um, uh, confidence that uh, has been uh, placed in them to uh, fulfill their, uh, uh, I guess, um, delivery of health care to that, that full scope or the expanded scope that they have available, uh, especially in the um, insured services that we're providing as a province. The member for Halifax, Shabucto. Then just one other uh, uh, related operational question about uh, the expanded scope for pharmacists. Uh, does the minister have any concern or is there concern at all in the life of the department um, about potential uh, ethical conflicts of interest uh, with pharmacists being possibly inclined uh, in issuing prescriptions towards the products of their own stores. Uh, one can envision a situation where a pharmacist would be, have a greater interest in uh, prescribing uh, uh, products that are prominently featured on their own shelves in a way that would, a physician wouldn't have that kind of particular interest. Not that physicians are uh, immune from uh, the pressures of the pharmaceutical industry, but the pressure that is on them from the pharmaceutical industry in that way is would, be, would be certainly less direct. Uh, is, is this a concern at all uh, in the minister's view? Minister? Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, certainly uh, becoming aware of, of uh, uh, we'll say, potentially unethical um, behaviors um, that uh, is a risk, I think, of uh, many professions. Um, but uh, I think it also uh, represents, uh, by and large, um, uh, the exception rather than the norm. Uh, you know, uh, in, in many professions, um, there are uh, cases that can be pointed to where uh, individuals abuse the, um, the responsibility and, and again, uh, um, do not meet the high uh, expectations that a professional um, and those professionals are, are recognized by being part of a professional body that, that governs them. So there would be uh, standards and expectations, of course, uh, that uh, would be uh, in place uh, to ensure that unethical type of, of behavior uh, is uh, not uh, undertaken. Um, and uh, again, uh, in terms of uh, some of the actual uh, prescriptions and uh, citizens' ability to uh, fill prescriptions, obviously as a province, uh, we have uh, programs and, and uh, pharmaceutical um, and, and often the insurance companies, whether it's the provincial uh, or private insurance that individuals have when they go in to receive, um, a, again, they, they would be pursuing the, um, um, the prescription that, that, that would be covered by their insurance. If, if it's not covered, they may not be able to purchase. So there are uh, some other uh, economic uh, variables that, that also constrain uh, the potential for the scenario that the, the member had uh, noted. Uh, and again, from a provincial perspective, Mr. Chair, we, um, we do focus on uh, uh, targeting and, and, and even today, uh, as part of that, and we've seen significant savings in our pharmaceutical expenses, um, based upon programs that allow for um, generic uh, switching so that if uh, in, in the, the traditional model a, a physician prescribed a um a uh, brand name drug for which there is a generic alternative, uh, recognizing that generic drugs are uh, chemically identical to the brand name alternative, um, uh, but at a much lower cost, uh, that the pharmacist is able to um, substitute uh, the actual product um, to uh, ensure that the uh, provincial pharmaceutical program, uh, while meeting the uh, healthcare needs of the uh, citizen, uh, is done so in the most economic uh, way possible. So uh, that model and, and program is, is uh, an, and expectation and, and, and um, 
uh, behavior, I think, is already well established within our pharmaceutical uh, um, industry. Uh, and by that, I mean the pharmacist, not pharmaceutical, the pharmacist um, industry in, in the province. The member for Halifax, Shubakto. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you for those that series of explanations. I, uh, I, uh, I hope I didn't leave the misimpression that I think the expanded scope of practice for pharmacists is anything but a, a, a great idea. It is a great idea, but as with any um, real major change in the landscape of uh, the front lines, it's apt to have dissonances, and, uh, and we, we, we hear about these dissonances some, and so I wanted to ask about their reflections in the budget. Um, I also uh, would like to go back to uh, a subject that has been part of this estimates discussion uh, both uh, uh, earlier and with uh, my uh, conservative colleagues, and that, that is about the, the great Nova Scotia problem, diabetes. Um, that, uh, that report uh, from Diabetes Canada in 2019 um, with its really um, staggering figure that at 11.2 percent of the population we're, we're significantly now uh, above the Canadian average and, and it gives anyone uh, a real a pause to take in that that means a tenth of our population uh, is engaged in the struggle with diabetes and we also know that we have as the minister and I talked about last week um, very serious problems about uh, uh, regional concentrations of uh, that we have parts of the province where diabetes and diabetes related uh, health problems are a very significant part of the of the constellation of health problems that are being dealt with. We have uh, rural uh, health practices in, uh, and, and hospitals where patient after patient after patient is being treated for something that has a pretty significant relationship to diabetes and uh, as, uh, as one who spent a lot of time in hospitals in different areas, uh, you don't have to be a, a genius to notice that this is the case in the rural areas in a way that it is not the case in the city. It's a case in uh, lower income areas in the way that it's not the case in, in areas uh, of, of higher incomes. So it's a real, a real area of... Um, um, that, that calls for, for focus and energy in healthcare policy in the province. And so thinking ab uh, about this subject, um, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to ask the minister first, um, just in a general way, um, uh, if I could ask him at this late hour to reflect a little about how might our budget look different for healthcare in Nova Scotia if we had uh, an incidence of diabetes at the Canadian average. What would we be saving? Uh, and would it be, what kind of a significant change would we be looking at? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and, and I thank uh, the member for uh, this uh, very interesting uh, question. Um, and while it's, it's uh, specifically uh, focused on diabetes, uh, I think uh, really the, the essence of the question that's been brought to the floor here uh, could uh, arguably be applied to uh, many other uh, chronic illnesses, uh, um, particularly ones that may have a preventative uh, element to it. Uh, earlier this evening, a, a member from the uh, PC caucus uh, was uh, raising a similar question about um, the preventative uh, focus in, in, in the healthcare system. And I think, uh, again, although the specific question here uh, is talking about diabetes, diabetes and what kind of uh, transformative effect uh, if the um, clinical costs 
um, clinical and or societal costs of um, such a chronic illness uh, were uh, dramatically reduced uh, in the province uh, on our overarching uh, health uh, care budget. Um, again, the same could be applied to uh, other types of, of chronic uh, illnesses uh, as well, I think. Um, and so I think the, the um, while I don't have um, the uh, breakdown of all of the uh, clinical uh, costs associated with uh, diabetes uh, to then run through uh, the analysis uh, even quickly on a, on a napkin or a sticky note here to um, meet the specific of the uh, member's question. Uh, I think uh, the uh, principle or the essence of the question, uh, I, I can uh, note that I acknowledge um, what uh, the member's uh, getting at there that, um, and, and, and again, the member can, can correct me if I'm mistaken in, 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 in understanding what he's hoping to communicate over here and, and, and try to focus, uh, again, uh, uh, some efforts uh, on this preventative side that, uh, what are those steps? And, and I think some of those things uh, if we look at um, chronic conditions like diabetes, uh, the member uh, mentioned that in, in hospitals often people have or diabetes related, um, you know, you, you, you know and, and conversely you have um, people with conditions that uh, uh, can be risk factors or increase your risk factors for diabetes. So it, it's one of these challenging things with our chronic uh, illnesses that um, it is that there are, are increased health, um, negative health outcomes by having the condition. Uh, there are uh, times where you have uh, other conditions uh, that have negative health outcomes that can lead to other chronic illnesses. Um, but one thing I think that, as I understand it, in, in conversations with various uh, health professionals is the uh, role of, um, again, I mean, it's, it's, it's back to basics in, in many respects. It's, uh, it's, it's exercise and diet. Uh, as to uh, very significant uh, contributing uh, factors to uh, living a very healthy life. Um, I should note uh, on the record, uh, Madam Chair, each day uh, when uh, the member um, enters estimates, uh, he acknowledges uh, the important role of uh, exercise uh, and, and movement um, in, in health because he offers, uh, you know, uh, myself and, and, and the staff here, uh, and, and in fact encourages, not just offers, but encourages, taking that, that time, which from a health perspective is um, good, uh, proper um, behavior when sitting uh, for long periods of time to get up, stretch, um, and, and so forth. So uh, he's, he's very clearly uh, in tune with um, some of the interventions that uh, can have positive uh, health outcomes. Uh, so those things include, again, diet and, and exercise. So it then begs the question back to, I think, where we started our estimates debates uh, with the member opposite uh, uh, last week, Madam Chair, which is uh, this uh, whole question of social determinants of health. Uh, I believe that's the very first set of questions were some, some data that, that, that stemmed out of um, social determinants of health. Um, and, and so then I go back to that and say, okay, uh, what are some things that we're trying to do? Well, it's, 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 it's rolling out healthy food programs in our schools to, to, to target our youth. Um, we recognize there are two um, significant variables that are, are, are challenges. Some is financial, uh, and we've talked uh, frequently uh, in my time here when we talk about social determinants, about the programming like at DCS uh, this year for increased investments to uh, provide more funding to uh, those uh, 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 lowest income Nova Scotians uh, to help support. So that's uh, that's one area to put uh, more more money to help offset some of those uh, financial barriers to um, reaching the um, you know the desired what what people would aspire to be able to to uh, consume for the food um, versus uh, you know is there still more work to be done? Uh, of course there is. Uh, we will always I think strive as a province to improve uh, the quality of life for all of our citizens. Um, and I do stand uh, by uh, this budget uh, with my colleagues uh, that the Minister of Finance introduced uh, last week. Um, to say this uh, these investments, uh, particularly in our social programming, are good investments um, to help address some of these these areas. Um, and, and so the one is the accessibility in, in terms of financial, uh, within financial reach, and we've had uh, some of those investments done in, in my si sister departments uh, within the uh, government. The other is um, sometimes people have the financial means, 
but they don't have the, I, I guess, the, the, the education or the culture or the awareness that, you know, if you, if you didn't grow up with it, you know, people who have grown up in and around a healthy lifestyle are more apt to um, emulate and, and continue on with that healthy lifestyle uh, and those who haven't. And it's not always uh, financial means that uh, drive unhealthy uh, lifestyles. So uh, in, in, in investments and, and programs like the uh, uh, healthy uh, breakfast uh, programs being rolled out uh, in our schools across the province, um, regardless of socioeconomic, so number one, it's making sure that there's nutrition uh, available for those uh, students in a non-judgmental way, because the program is available to all students. So it's a way that that takes stigma out of the equation, um, and so those youth who, who who need access to that nutrition are, are able to get it um, because they need it. But it's also a way to introduce healthy uh, eating options to um, other youth who who may not um, otherwise. Um, choose the healthy option. Um, but uh, I think uh, clearly, uh, I've certainly seen with my children in school, um, when the healthy option is the only option being presented to them, they're hungry kids. They're going to eat uh, that uh, fruit or, or uh, vegetable. Uh, just don't put the chips on the table or they'll go there first. The member, uh, the member for Halifax, Shabukto. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that um, how we're doing on the matter of diabetes prevention is a pretty good measure of how we're doing on health care outcomes in the province as a whole. Um, and and it's a, it is a matter of great significance for us. And so I wonder if the minister could can point to uh, uh, specific prevention related measures in the budget related to diabetes since, since surely this is really where the where the advances in the war are to be made minister thank you uh, madam chair i guess if we we go uh, back to um the uh, earliest uh, stage of, of intervention. It is, uh, I think, as, as per my previous uh, response, I, I won't go into detail on those again, um, but again, those investments uh, in uh, uh, social programs uh, to provide more funding to help support uh, those uh, those uh, uh, particularly dietary uh, access points uh, for, for Nova Scotians uh, and, and with youth for influencing and informing uh, healthy uh, choices to uh, help offset some of those uh, early uh, risk factors um, that uh, would would manifest. So uh, that would be one one aspect of uh, government uh, investments uh, in uh, these types of programs. Uh, we also have, uh, Madam Chair, uh, throughout uh, the province, diabetes uh, clinics, uh, not quite uh, preventative in the in in the early stages, uh, but certainly uh, to help. Uh, offset uh, the um, and to help manage and monitor and uh, um, and and minimize uh, the harms of those uh, uh, living with diabetes. Uh, one of the things that uh, they allow uh, or or do is they do have a significant dietary component to uh, those programs uh, within the. Um, uh, within those diabetes clinics, uh, again, uh, uh, I know it's not quite uh, preventative in the way that the members uh, insinuating in terms of uh, preventing new cases of diabetes, but certainly uh, it's the type of um, preventative as opposed to acute um, interventions. Uh, again, by having those dietitians in the diabetes clinics and and, and other supports available um, to work with uh, those uh, living with diabetes um, to again. Um, Build their lifestyle and sport, so it is preventative in the in the sense of uh, preventing the more acute uh, problems associated with diabetes. Um, to uh, do what they can to uh, slow the the onset and the uh, other uh, health complications uh, that are are known to uh, potentially occur with uh, this particular disease. So uh, we do have uh, investments like that. Uh, these uh, programs, though, uh, are operational programs that uh, get run through uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority. The member for Halifax, Shibukto. Uh, thank you. Then, in, in characterizing the the uh, the government's general approach uh, to uh, diabetes, uh, would the minister say that the thrust of the department's focus is more on the treatment side or more on the prevention side? Minister. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I would I would uh, suggest that, uh, uh, as with uh, really um, the bulk of our, our healthcare system, uh, as is the case uh, in uh, much of, of the Western world, as as uh, the member uh, from. I forget which Cape Breton uh, riding. It was Sydney River uh, Myra Lewisburg uh, mentioned earlier this uh, this evening um, about uh, the the tendency of our, our healthcare system uh, to be, uh, I guess, uh, acute care system um, and treatment uh, focused. Uh, that, uh, Madam Chair, is is uh, I think an accurate uh, description. Uh, I don't think anyone could stand on this floor and uh, dispute that. Um, obvious uh, fact. Uh, it is uh, one of, I think, uh, the great challenges of a Western uh, medical uh, or health uh, program delivery uh, in, in so much as we have so much uh, investment and advancements on, on treatment um, and, and they achieve uh, many great uh, positive outcomes. They save lives, but they cost and, and draw so much of the financial resources that get put into the health system to save those lives. Um, and, and the uh, challenges, the rate of that advancement and the expectations of society uh, for governments, particularly in social, uh, in, in, in jurisdictions like Canada that have a, a socialized uh, health care uh, program or a provincial or government uh, uh, delivered uh, health uh, program, um, those uh, challenges are, are quite acute because people expect uh, our programs, Madam Chair, uh, to deliver the uh, latest and, and advanced um, um, treatments. And, and so it does often continue to focus on the acute. And, and I think the member can appreciate why, because um, you know the preventative uh, programs becomes a challenge uh, to garner the broad public support for those preventative uh, measures, um, because to, to redirect such a substantive uh, portion of, of, of the existing health budgets um, towards those um, uh, those uh, the degree of the, the, the preventative programs um, you don't see the results immediately. And this is my personal assessment, that, is that the general population doesn't accept that type of shift. In principle, they accept it. But in practice, when, when governments or organizations attempt to make that shift, um, there's always somebody who needs that acute care service delivery. And, and that shows up on the front page. And, and, and we as a caring and compassionate society uh, turn and redirect uh, our funding. I think that's a, a contributing factor for how the system has evolved and, and developed in, in, in really an acute care focus. But uh, what I can um, and, 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 and I hope um, instill some confidence in, in, in my colleagues opposite and, and indeed on this side of the legislature as well, some confidence in the fact that uh, number one, we recognize and, and, and that, that challenge and, and, and I, I submit to, to the legislature that we're up to that challenge, uh, Madam Chair, to continue uh, to make advancements to um, to recognize and invest uh, on uh, that side of the equation. Uh, as a department, uh, one of the exercises we went through uh, in uh, the uh, fiscal year just uh, coming up uh, ending uh, was an, an exercise in, in renewing our vision and mission uh, within uh, the um, department. Uh, which is an important step, uh, if sometimes overlooked uh, in uh, large organizations, Madam Chair, um, to have that vision to help guide uh, the, the, the foundation of the decisions that we make. And, and, and the vision of the department is, is about healthy Nova Scotians. And that is, is meant in the broadest uh, sense possible. And, and that is to help open and, 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 and bridge and, and open those discussions and, and focus points uh, on those areas that the member has uh, highlighted. The other reason I think that the member should have some optimism is seeing things like, and we've talked about it the last uh, number of years that I've been in uh, the uh, portfolio of health and wellness, is an area of the health system that has been uh, for far too long overlooked, and, and we've had lots of conversations here about mental health and addictions. Um, you know, the, the um, again, the healthcare system has been uh, built around physical health, um, so getting new uh, services and programs expanded, uh, you know, are always trying to, to break into that system. Well, we recognize that and we've been investing uh, significantly over the last number of years. And not just that we're investing uh, generally in, in uh, mental health and addiction services, but we, if you look at where we've really, really targeted those investments, Madam Chair, it has been in 
early a stage. It is in the, the, the youth uh, side of the equation. But we believe that that investment in youth not only pays long-term dividends as those youth are, are identified and, and, and thus once identified you can have the early interventions, you can build the, 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 the tools for them to um, manage their uh, mental health challenges which is often described as chronic illnesses much like diabetes um, to, to make those interventions and live a healthy and productive life which reduces the demand on the system in the, in the future. But not only does it reduce the demand on the system in the future as those individuals uh, as youth uh, have the tools to live a, a, a healthy uh, life uh, based upon the early identification and interventions, but also in the immediate term, Madam Chair, uh, those individuals, if they're, they're managed in, in the early stages, they don't move on to acute uh, mental health challenges, which, which reduces then the demand in the existing system. So those investment in youth are also an investment in uh, the acute system by uh, reducing the demands at, at that point. So that's that vision. So we do show, I think, in our health system a, a recognition a willingness uh, to target is just easier in new program uh, space than it is to move from an existing uh, program and so the model is very heavily focused on the acute system as I've noted uh, it's hard to shift that Time but new programs for can. For the NDP we will move on to, on to the PC caucus with uh, the member from Northside Westmount. Thank you Madam Chair. Uh, before I begin uh, they say seeing is believing. Um, Experience is everything. Up until about five years ago, I had heard many of the issues and the problems in health care, but it didn't truly resonate with me. Over the last five years, having personal experiences in relation to my elderly parents, I got to see a lot firsthand a lot of these challenges and a lot of the issues in the health care system, which really brought it into focus. Uh, Mr. Madam Chair, before I begin, I want to personally thank our medical community. The care our doctors, nurses, paramedics, and all of the support staff provide is first class. Our professionals are just that, professionals, dealing with patients and families, often when they are at their most vulnerable. And the understanding, patience, and time given is second only to the high level at which they do their jobs. Caregivers also deserve mention. They are often the unsung heroes of our elderly. Last week, Madam Chair, I thought for a moment that we were in the, president's, the presence of President Trump. In a line of questioning from my just departed colleague from Halifax, Shabukto, the minister responded that the capital plan was big investment, historic in nature. What was missing on the other, was the other side of the equation, that we have historic problems and that our health care system is in big crisis. <coughs> People want to know what this government is going to do about access, what this government is going to do about doctor shortages. Not five years from now, Nova Scotians are lining up at the door, they just can't get in. Before the, before the holidays, I had an opportunity to sit down with the Cape Breton Redevelopment Team. The plan that they laid out is an ambitious plan, indeed with six new buildings and a parking lot. There are a lot of moving parts and as a consequence, the potential for a lot of problems. The minister says that doctors want new facilities, that this will help in attracting doctors. Shortages are first with family doctors. They operate, no pun intended, primarily from their offices. As such, I wonder what bearing new health centers have to, with attracting these new family doctors. Shouldn't the family doctor issue be dealt with first? Hospitals are struggling to be staffed now in their existing buildings. If this redevelopment in the CBRM is the solution, then my question to the Minister is, why, what took so long? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank uh, the member, uh, and, and actually welcome uh, the member, I believe, to his first uh, estimates uh, debate. Uh, and and, and I, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, the uh, strong opening, uh, again, recognizing uh, the many health care professionals. Um, I, I think that's an important part of, of what we do uh, and, and the opportunity to do so. So I uh, want to just uh, make note of that uh, and uh, acknowledge uh, the appreciation I, I know that those healthcare professionals uh, have uh, when um, 
when that acknowledgement is made, and, and not just by politicians, but uh, but any Nova Scotian. And, and again, as politicians, I think we, uh, Madam Chair, have a unique uh, opportunity in a public uh, forum to make those acknowledgements, as, as the member uh, just did in, in his first uh, opportunity here, at least in, in this chamber, for uh, estimates debate. I'm not sure if he was in the other chamber uh, previously. Um, now, that said, in, in terms of the, um, the questions and, and concerns uh, that uh, he's raised, um, first of all, we, we, we do recognize uh, those uh, health care challenges. We do recognize uh, the challenges uh, in particular and the importance of having a particular focus on primary care access and, and, uh, and family physicians. Um, what is uh, the role? Well, in, in many cases, those family physicians um, in, in our communities, uh, uh, particularly in our, our um, less urban uh, populations, um, provide the inpatient care within our, our hospital uh, facilities as well, um, that they do provide a broader uh, scope of, of services and care. So um, to the members uh, comment that, that they are actually family physicians who are providing that inpatient care in our community hospitals uh, and uh, even in, in some of our, our regional hospitals that they are uh, providing, uh, uh, although some uh, of them have uh, moved on to, to uh, the specialist uh, hospitalist uh, model. But uh, again, uh, those providing inpatient care are, are family physicians as well. Um, so uh, that's that's that connection uh, through uh, the, the clinical uh, expertise. Um, the notion of you know what we do uh, and what we need to do now, uh, Madam Chair, uh, we've been doing. Uh, we've uh, we've been uh, you know in my uh, tenure, it's uh, coming up on on three years in in June uh, since I've been appointed. Uh, in, in the, this role as the Minister of Health and Wellness, um, and uh, I've. Uh, I've still got the bruises, uh, in particular of those early days, uh, about people uh, looking for uh, change and, and uh, uh, initiatives within the uh, the health uh, system. Uh, and I, I continued to, uh, on the floor of this legislature, um, in, in question period, uh, in the public and estimates debate, uh, explain exactly what our initiatives uh, were. Uh, those include uh, changes around our, our compensation uh, and incentive uh, programs uh, that uh, we take, uh, listening to frontline uh, healthcare workers to help inform uh, what those initiatives might need to be. Uh, the ones around compensation, uh, we believe, were, were really uh, early initiatives um, to uh, get uh, uh, immediate response. Uh, initiatives uh, partnering with uh, my colleague, uh, the Minister of Immigration, um, to uh, pursue uh, other avenues uh, to streamline uh, and make Nova Scotia a more attractive uh, place for international uh, recruits uh, has been uh, quite successful. I believe uh, at the last check over 54 uh, physicians have uh, come through uh, those streams in, in just uh, I think about uh, two years time from when we announced uh, that program. Um, and that's a new stream of, of physicians able to come here <coughs> and practice. Uh, and we're seeing the results of, of those uh, early stage initiatives. Uh, again, enough to address all of the uh, concerns and, and, and challenges in and of themselves, no. Um, so we, we launch uh, other programs, as I said, uh, incentive programs. Um, and we recognize, though, that really underlining much of the challenge, because it's a challenge not unique to Nova Scotia, despite what uh, we uh, would, as citizens, um, think based upon um, you know, what you would have read in the media at the time um, that uh, presented the challenges in healthcare in Nova Scotia, somehow as though it was unique. And, and that the challenges here uh, are, are a Nova Scotia bred challenge. When, when the reality is, and I think we're starting to see this, uh, more so in the media across the country. Uh, people uh, almost mocked me when I would make those comments that these challenges uh, are, are the challenges that my colleagues across the country uh, share. And that is the availability in many cases of physicians and, and other healthcare uh, professionals. So how do we, in, in, in a country or society, Western uh, world, um, respond to the demand that outstrips the supply of qualified healthcare professionals? Well, we can continue to do the things that we've been trying to do, which is recruit and draw them from other sources, and we're doing that. But the other is we have to actually increase the supply. And Nova Scotia is, to my knowledge, the only jurisdiction expanding both our medical school and our residency seats to help address that uh, particular supply challenge. The member's right. Those investments, which we uh, announced uh, in 2017 that we were going to be pursuing, um, will take 
some time to uh, establish. It took some time to actually design and get the um, support networks, the preceptors, uh, to uh, support the delivery of these programs, their partners at Dalhousie and the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Um, so it took a year or so to get that work done. Then the uh, residents have to give a year's notice for the application process uh, within the CARMS program. So that year goes by as the application process to fill those seats. But last, uh, in, in last July, July of 2019, the first uh, set of, of residents uh, joined, uh, came to the province uh, based upon that expansion of 10 family physicians, 15 uh, specialist uh, residency positions. And the second cohort uh, will be coming this July. That first cohort of family physicians will be graduating in a year's time. And we know that about 80% of residents stay uh, where they've uh, trained um, for a variety of reasons, uh, unless the, you know, I won't go into the details unless the member wants me to, uh, but the research does show that, including research that uh, has, uh, that I, I read uh, from Mardox, uh, the Maritime Association resident uh, doctors, um, that uh, makes that indication between 75-80% stay. So of those 10 family physicians, we can expect eight of them staying here in the province to provide care. And we've uh, had those uh, physicians, when we took this opportunity to expand, we expanded to the one zone that has no family residence uh, available. That's the northern zone, which also has one of the highest challenges uh, with uh, attachment of residents to uh, primary care uh, services. And take all of that, so we, we, we are confident that we will continue to see, based upon the investments and the programs and the policy that we've been designing and implementing over the last number of years, we've planted the seeds. And we are uh, reaping uh, some of the early and, and, and mid-term uh, investments uh, and programs that we've delivered. We're seeing those results. Uh, what do I point to? Uh, the member talked about people lining up. Well, fair enough, we, we accept that there are people, uh, using his analogy, uh, lining up, uh, still uh, registering on the 811 Need a Family Practice list. But over the last uh, 14 months or so, we've seen the number of Nova Scotians looking to be attached drop by about 20%. That means we're having success, a 20% improvement in our attachment rate um, based upon those uh, who, uh, who or, or a 20% reduction, reduction in those looking for primary care access. And so, uh, you know, uh, what we uh, realize as we dig into that, that information is obviously it's not been equally distributed. Um, in particular, northern and western zones uh, are, uh, have not um, equally benefited from the attachments that have been taking place over the last uh, year or so. So we've got to uh, come back, uh, re-establish some uh, focused initiatives that can help uh, offset and, and address that uh, discrepancy. I think for the northern zone, that expansion in the residency program is a good benefit that we know will be coming on stream uh, and we'll see that uh, serving that area. Um, but uh, we still have to uh, deal with and address uh, some of the challenges in the western zone um, and the northern for the short term. So again, I think, uh, I hope that answers the, the questions again uh, and concerns that were brought uh, by the member, uh, Madam Chair. Chair. The member for Northside Westmount. Madam Chair, and I thank the Minister for the answer. Um, related to the redevelopment on the north side, several of the staff have come to me over the last several months wondering what will become of them. What will happen to the support staff, be it the cleaners, kitchen staff, receptionists? They're wondering if their positions will simply travel, um, transfer over to the new facility with short-term stay beds, long-term care bed facility, and the clinic itself. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I thank the member uh, for uh, raising the question. And um, first, I would, I would certainly uh, uh, encourage uh, those, um, those employees uh, or, or acknowledge that the uh, the facility in, in Northside uh, will continue to be a Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, facility, um, and uh, so uh, the services offered uh, would continue to be offered uh, by uh, Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, employees. Um, uh, again, uh, that uh, relationship and uh, transfer from from one facility to another, I. I, I 
can't get into a, a, a lot of details, uh, mostly because uh, it is uh, governed by the uh, collective agreement between the employer, the Nova Scotia Health Authority, and the uh, unions respect uh, the unions representing those uh, various uh, specific employees. Um, but in terms of the uh, the infrastructure, it uh, will continue to be a Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, facility, um, and uh, and the and the services uh, again, uh, and and what the contractual obligations of the the health authority uh, with um, uh, when a move from one physical location to another location takes place, uh, they would have to adhere to the uh, uh, parameters of that uh, collective agreement, and, and I just don't have uh, that level of detail uh, here with me to uh, to share with the member if, if he wants to go in a little further. I, I just don't have that uh, level of detail, but again, can, can assure uh, the member that it is tied to uh, obligation the employer, Nova Scotia Health Authority, would have with the uh, unions representing those employees. The member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank the Minister for the answer. Uh, recently, I had a constituent who passed away while waiting for appropriate housing. Their existing accommodations were, shall we say, lacking. The individual required visits by continuing care. I realize that housing is not part of the Minister's portfolio, but what I'm wondering about is <coughs> Continuing care in this instance could not provide the needed services as the person's accommodation lacked a fully functioning washroom. As a result, this person's health care was compromised. While housing falls under a separate department, I'm wondering what type of communication exists between the Department of Health and housing in relation to cases like this. If there's an individual that's in some sort of precarious health situation, is there a mechanism whereby the health department, the necessary individuals, can reach out to housing to try and fast track these individuals. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank uh, the member for this uh, this truly important uh, question. It ties into um, some of the uh, one of the other, uh, probably one of the main themes that we uh, we've actually had in uh, uh, throughout estimates uh, this year, uh, which is that sort of that question of social determinants of health. Uh, as the member rightly noted, housing does not fall uh, under the Department of Health and Wellness, and yet housing uh, insecurity, uh, inadequate or, or problematic housing. Uh, uh, can have a significant impact on both the physical and mental uh, health of uh, individual um, citizens. Um, uh, I, I, one of, of the examples, and, and, and I think it's, it's relevant because it actually uh, comes from uh, Cape Breton. Uh, as the member would know, uh, one of the uh, areas in our uh, investments, particularly on to help improve attachment uh, and, and uh, primary care services, is the focus on collaborative care centers, uh, collaborative care practices, um, and establishing those collaborative care teams uh, throughout uh, the province. Uh, we now have, uh, I believe, uh, something that's in the 84 or 85 collaborative practices throughout the province. And uh, in the earlier stages, uh, uh, about two years ago in, in rolling out and having one established in Cape Breton, um, I remember receiving uh, feedback from one of the, the sites. Now, uh, I will put the, the caveat that this was uh, second or third hand. I did not hear directly uh, from, from the physician, um, but uh, second or third hand that um, they were joining the collaborative practice because that, that seemed to be the thing and to attract the, the younger physicians into into the to practice in the community it, it was what was needed, but that collaborative practice also included the nurses uh, as well as a social worker at this particular uh, practice, um, and and that again a more experienced physician was. Uh, Unsure as to what you know, what the purpose, right? Used to a traditional uh, model of, of of practice that's really been around as the the predominant uh, model of care uh, since the dawn of, of Medicare in the in the 60s. Um, but what they said was they realized there's the, a particular patient that was a recurring patient in 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 this this physician's practice with respiratory illness, and so they would come get diagnosed, get a prescription, go home, um, and three, six months, whatever the time frame, they would often be coming back with some respiratory illness, get diagnosed again, treated, and, and so on. But once they established the, the practice, they had the social worker as part of the, the program, Madam Chair, that social worker as part of that collaborative practice team uh, engaged with the patient. And 
discovered through those conversations that in fact that that citizen, that patient of this uh, physician of this collaborative practice, um, had uh, a, a leaky roof, I believe, uh, which meant that there was a lot of moisture and, and water damage on the inside. Sorry, uh, on the inside of the uh, of the uh, home, uh, that uh, particular uh, instance then led to um, air quality issues uh, that turned out to be the the challenge, uh, leading to the health issue that the uh, physician had been treating on kind of a, a recurring basis. The social worker, as part of that practice, was able to connect then with housing um, and uh, programs that were able to repair. Um, and, and get some of the upgrades that were needed to address the root cause, uh, ultimately the root cause of the environmental cause of the uh, respiratory physical illness. Um, so I, I use that as an example, um, which uh, again coincidentally happened to, uh, as it was explained to me, come from Cape Breton, um, but it ties into not the continuing care branch, uh, but to, to with the broad sense of are there means and mechanisms within the health system to tie into housing. Certainly, and in particularly through our collaborative practice investments, Madam Chair, uh, that those uh, opportunities exist, especially those ones uh, that have a, a social worker. And what I've heard from physicians uh, with the social worker is that they're able to identify and tap into those things that the physician uh, both doesn't have the, 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 the expertise to tease that out, nor do they have the time. Um, because they have to move on to the next patient. Uh, their expertise and, and, and responsibility is to um, diagnose the um, uh, health issues of the individual, um, not to try to tease out. And that's why these collaborative practices have that, that value uh, proposition. Now, um, that said, as we step back a little bit further, uh, are there other avenues? Certainly as a department, um, and I've talked about this a little bit before, we're trying to really truly, genuinely break down those silos. So social deputies uh, do meet uh, uh, on a regular basis uh, within government uh, to try to take down those. So if uh, the department is aware of, of challenges and, and the housing things um, and, 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 and it's not happening organically uh, at, the, at the front lines, um, that those connections are not being made, um, then as we become aware, uh, we're able to engage at the senior levels uh, to make sure that those connections uh, do happen. Uh, will there be times that the connections don't happen? Will you be able to find a situation where it doesn't, probably, unfortunately, um, but I encourage uh, all members here, if cases do come through your constituency office, uh, let us know. We will engage. We have, uh, uh, well, indeed, uh, the Minister responsible for housing sits right behind me here in the legislature. We turn around, have those conversations uh, uh, while we sit here in the legislature uh, from time to time as well. I recognize the member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the Minister for the answer. I'll now hand off to my colleague from Cumberland North. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm wondering if the Minister of Health would be able to give um, me a, a timeline of when the Pugwash Hospital facility is expected to be built and break ground. Minister. Madam Chair, uh, is it possible we could extend estimates into uh, a couple of weeks' time? Um, suffice to say, um, uh, we're at a, a bit of a, a critical uh, juncture point with some uh, approvals, uh, Madam Chair. So I'm not in a position to uh, disclose uh, right now. Um, but uh, I, I can, um, with all sincerity, say it's 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 getting very very close to the point where there will be uh, uh, an announcement uh, that um, uh, I think uh, the member will be pleased and her constituents uh, very pleased uh, with the announcement uh, at that time. Okay. The honourable member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the minister for that answer. I'm wondering if the minister uh, might consider. Um, looking at the funding for the Cumberland Crisis Health Care Team, that's through Cumberland uh, Mental Health Department. Currently, it's not funded 24-7. So because our regional hospital does not have acute care beds for mentally ill patients, they must be all transferred out to Truro or other regional hospitals. But we do have in place a crisis team. So if our merged, depart if our merged physician has someone that's unstable, they can call upon the crisis team 
who will come up and do an assessment and determine uh, basically to help their mental health specialist that will help to determine if that person requires an acute bed care bed in another hospital or they also sometimes will say you know they're stable enough that they we can keep them here and we will make arrangements so that they are seen by our local psychiatrist or a therapist sometimes as soon as the next day but because it's not funded 24 7 there's many gaps where someone will come into the eMERGE department and the eMERGE uh, physician and nurses do not have that crisis team support. And then if there's not an acute care bed available in another regional hospital, Madam Chair, then that person is oftentimes discharged without any supports or any community resources uh, arranged. And I'm wondering if the minister would be willing to take a look at the funding for the Cumberland crisis team and consider funding that so that we would have staff available 24-7. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, as, as the member would know, I think uh, uh, the specific operational uh, funding piece uh, does come through our partner with the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Uh, we've made uh, significant uh, operational uh, increased investment uh, this uh, year uh, for them to uh, meet uh, their operational uh, needs. Um, again, uh, I don't, uh, every uh, operational or, or specific uh, program at, at sites doesn't uh, come to my attention, um, so I'm not sure. Uh, what, uh, if any, plans they have with that particular site and that particular uh, program team. Um, but what I will uh, promise the members will we'll, uh, reach out in my next uh, conversation uh, or I'll have staff uh, reach out to have conversations about uh, what uh, that uh, proposal from the site uh, looks like, if it's within the uh, plans for this year or, or, or not, and, um, and we'll uh, certainly evaluate the business uh, uh, proposal that I'm assuming the uh, local site has already advanced uh, within the health authority. Uh, uh, the other uh, thing uh, that uh, I think uh, came up uh, briefly with the question from the member from Sydney Whitney, no, Sydney Lewisburg Myra, Myra. Sydney, Sydney Myra, River Lewis Myra Lewisburg, Sydney River Myra Lewisburg um, was uh, about the notion of uh, one of those uh, admin the ex the restructuring within the inside of the Nova Scotia Health Authority and that. Um, uh, realignment of uh, regional uh, autonomy. So uh, as they're focused on doing that and getting those pieces out, I think, uh, and the goal will be that these types of questions uh, will more smoothly uh, run through uh, the health authority system uh, at the local sites and, and, and not have to necessarily come to the floor of, uh, of the legislature to uh, chat about. The member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know it was already addressed today briefly in question period, but I, I did want to bring, I feel one of the most pressing issues in healthcare and the healthcare system in Cumberland North is at our regional hospital, we have often have a, lo a lack of nurses. And that is uh, resulting many times in bed closure. So last summer there was four step down unit beds closed for a period of time. And then most recently in the last couple of months of 2019 and early 2020, where four beds need needed to be closed and not used on our obstetric unit. So I realize in this budget there is increased funding for, for um, increases in nursing education, which is wonderful, but we're looking at the results of that not being for three to four years. I'm wondering if the Minister of Health would, um, and his department would be willing to um, allocate more resources to support uh, and a look at the nursing staff at Cumberland Regional Healthcare Centre to address why there is a shortage, how can we retain the existing nurses that we have, and maybe look at job satisfaction, what are the factors why we're losing nurses, and how can we work to retain the ones we have and attract more? Because by losing our nurses and having our shortages, we are compromising care, and, and I know that our Minister of Health is a well-researched and educated man, and I'd like to table a document that addresses, um, sorry, wrong research paper. It's an article that looks at the importance of having uh, adequate nursing staffing. So one of the qu quotes that I'll say is that nursing staffing consistently has been shown to influence outcomes. And this growing body of evidence relates higher than average levels of nursing human capital results in improved patient outcomes. So you could also take from that that a lower nursing staffing would result in worse 
uh, health outcomes, which is what obviously I'm very concerned about. I'm wondering if the minister uh, would be willing to take a look at that problem at Cumberland Regional, and I'm sure it's across the province, but I'm concerned that our lack of nursing staffing is affecting patient health outcomes negatively. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I, I thank uh, the member uh, for uh, <clears throat> the question. Uh, I believe, Madam Chair, she uh, rightly uh, acknowledged uh, two things. One is uh, um, the uh, positive uh, impact and expansion of nursing uh, education uh, will have, um, uh, and, and of course, uh, that within that uh, expansion, it does take time for that education, much like the investments in our, our medical program, which I won't go into again here, um, but uh, it, it will take time, but that time will come. Um, and, and so it is the forward-looking uh, supply piece that that is probably one of our, our best uh, initiatives um, that is not uh, being, um, uh, to my knowledge, seen in, in other jurisdictions. Uh, the other uh, piece uh, that uh, was referenced was that, uh, you know, sometimes the challenge around uh, particularly chronic uh, vacancies and in, 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 in the specific question it was on, on nurses, um, but uh, again, broadly with any health uh, profession, uh, there are certain areas uh, which have had um, more difficulty over time and, and uh, in filling uh, vacancies. So what I can tell, uh, and so that happens elsewhere, uh, so rather than committing specifically on, on the Cumberland, I can advise the member uh, that uh, within the Department of Health and Wellness, we do have a, a, a team that uh, focuses on health human resource planning. Um, that is in part what uh, led to the announcement of the, advance, uh, the, the additional nursing seats was based upon the research that they had done uh, and the various uh, methods of um, building that workforce to meet not just today's demands but the future demands, uh, recognizing the aging population and uh, of the workforce and so on, um, that, uh, that that we will continue to see some challenges there. So uh, recognizing that, uh, a recommendation came forward uh, in part. So, so the work is underway to, to do these things, to provide the, um, you know, tools wouldn't be the appropriate uh, term, but to provide these, these resources, these staffing resources uh, as a supply of, of health health human resources available so that our partners uh, at the IWK and the Nova Scotia Health Authority um, have the ability to fill the vacancies to deliver the care that we all recognize uh, Nova Scotians need and deserve. Uh, so that work is an active part of what we do. Um, some other avenues and, and uh, where particularly the nursing side comes into play to inform uh, the investments and the decisions we make is the, uh, the nursing uh, strategy and we have a, a table where um, many stakeholders actually sit including the nurses unions, the uh, college College, I believe sits there as well, uh, the employers, the health authority and the um, IWK as well as uh, the Department of Health and Wellness and, and they have a, a budget for nursing strategic investments um, and they collectively come to prioritize. Uh, that's actually a, a stream that led to the expansion of the nurse practitioner uh, funding program um, and the uh, incentive around that for uh, some of the rural communities. So uh, we have a number of avenues and approaches that we uh, delve into. Um, I, I can, um, although it may not always uh, seem that way on the ground, um, uh, I think that the, the member uh, may be aware that, uh, gosh, it might be a, about a year ago, it might even be 18 months ago, um, there were some concerns uh, raised uh, by uh, nurses in a particular uh, unit uh, at uh, that hospital. Uh, you know, I committed to going up and visiting and, 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 and hearing firsthand, and, and the conversation wasn't just about that. I, I heard broadly, so um, based on that, I, I, I hope the member uh, recognized that I do appreciate and, and have heard, and I, and I haven't forgotten that meeting or my other visits uh, to uh, that hospital and, and hearing from frontline uh, healthcare workers. Um, but as in, in that particular instance, I think um, uh, the health authority did have work underway to address the concerns that were brought forward. Um, they wouldn't have been able to move as, as, as quickly on, on the initiative if, if, if it was really just me triggering it at, at the point. Um, so uh, certainly I did trigger um, engaging in, in, in inquiring and asking questions, but there was work uh, un underway as, as well. And I think uh, it, that does happen more frequently than people may, may realize. I love to take the credit as, as, as all of the changes that, that are positive when someone raises a concern. Uh, 
um, that uh, they bring it to my attention and then shortly thereafter it's, 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 it's moving in the direction they hoped for. Um, but in those instances where it moves really quickly, the health authority and our partners are, are likely uh, already uh, well underway with the work and just weren't at a point where they could announce or deliver it. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that this would be a similar type of uh, situation. Um, but again, uh, I hope this information that I provided about our broad efforts around health human resources fits within the, the theme of, of what the, the member was asking, Madam Chair. The member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I do appreciate the, the Minister's comments and there's no question that uh, the Minister has a very significant influence when he, you know, I really appreciate when he did come to Cumberland Regional to look at the medical unit and the staffing concerns then and made a huge difference. So um, Minister must never underestimate his influence when he does get involved. Uh, people stand up and take notice and, and it really helps. So um, I'll just ask the last question before my colleague um, takes over. And I'm not sure if the minister is aware, so I will table this document. It came to my attention recently that the fluoride mouth rinse prog uh, program was stopped in at least one part of Cumberland. Um, in my constituency, some of the elementary schools have stopped due to a shortage, uh, the notice said a supply shortage of fluoride mouth rinse has left public health without enough rinse to offer fluoride programs for the school year. Therefore, it is even more important to make sure children visit their dentist, da 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 da. So they decided to stop the program and they'll start it up again in the fall but they're going to change it to a fluoride varnish program. And it also says the new program will tar target those students who will benefit the most from this treatment, which I would take to mean that not all students will receive it. So I'm wondering if the minister is aware of that and if he might be able to um, look into it. And also my question would be, will public health staff still be delivering this program or will teachers be expected to provide the fluoride varnish program? Thank you, Madam Chair. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I thank the member for uh, raising uh, that uh, point uh, on the floor. Um, in, in fact, uh, that is true, uh, and, and as the uh, communication uh, was uh, noted, um, this um, restructuring within the program is uh, related to uh, a supply issue with the product that uh, was being utilized. So uh, that has, uh, again, uh, uh, circumstances outside of anyone's control. Uh, so public health uh, has engaged to uh, find uh, other ways to uh, deliver the, the programming. Uh, it will continue to be uh, administered by public health officials. We're not looking to, uh, and so if anyone uh, has um, uh, educators, uh, teachers or staff uh, within schools that uh, are concerned uh, that somehow we would uh, be uh, moving a, a program into them. This would still uh, be run by public health officials to, to uh, meet those needs. Um, but it does, uh, in, in light of the change in product and the delivery models, we do have to evaluate uh, and that's the work that's uh, underway to uh, determine um, how to uh, deliver that new program based on the new products and, and, and the delivery mechanism that's a bit different. <coughs> The member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the minister and the staff. And we'll pass over to my colleague from Cape Breton, Richmond. Okay. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's, uh, I guess I, I'm, I've just been told that I'm the final gun on the way home here as far as the last evening. Um, I'll, try, I'll, I'll take it easy on you. I'm, I'm, um, I'd, I'd rather have just a conversation um, not throw out a whole bunch of statistics and so forth, but just kind of have a conversation in the way that my constituents have conversations with me when they come forward and they have, um, they have concerns. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're all very well aware of are the constant closures of ERs, and I'd ask the minister a question uh, with regard to this last week. This past weekend uh, was not uh, an abnormal situation, it's becoming uh, far too standardized that we see not only the, um, the straight uh, closed, our local hospital, but we also see at the same time that the St. Anne Centre is also closed too and they have an ER obviously uh, in, in their uh, facility. So 
when both uh, of these facilities are closed at the same time, and they're the only hospitals within Cape Breton Richmond, uh, that's leaving us, uh, leaving constituents at risk. Uh, we're about an hour and a half away basically from uh, St. Martha's or from the regional in Sydney. And an hour and a half is an awful long way to go uh, when you're having a heart attack or a stroke um, or any kind of healthcare crisis and you're having to be uh, taken by ambulance. Uh, in fact, I worry that something very serious is going to happen uh, one of these days. Um, and unfortunately, somebody is, is not gonna get the care that they need uh, before they need it. Could the minister please uh, comment and tell me what is being done, and I'm specifically talking about K. Breton Richmond, what's being done to try and, uh, and rectify this problem, um, it's both nursing uh, shortages at St. Anne's mostly, and it's uh, you know physician shortages at the Strait Richmond. So I'd really like to know what the minister has uh, as far as a uh, response for that. Minister? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank uh, the member uh, for the uh, question. Uh, living uh, not too uh, far away, I'm, I'm well aware of, of the, uh, the the challenges, um, uh, not just uh, in the broad sense of, of, of my scope as, as minister, but as an MLA in the Strait uh, region. So quite familiar with the uh, the sites that uh, that that are referenced. Um, Really, as the member I think would know, um, that is a, a, a common uh, challenge, is a common conversation with communities ac across uh, the province. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, you see it in, in other provinces as well, of similar size uh, rural communities. Uh, it is in a, in a, um, in an environment where the supply on uh, qualified health professionals outstrips, sorry, the demand outstrips the supply available, um, those health professionals are choosing uh, the locations that where they want to practice. And when all locations have demand, um, people readily, uh, Madam Chair, accept uh, those healthcare professionals to meet that demand uh, in those uh, communities. So um, much of what, uh, and, and I know there's only a limited amount of time, so I won't rehash uh, much of what I'd said before, um, but what we're doing is uh, investing in our compensation framework, which makes us far more competitive uh, on the regional Atlantic uh, level uh, for uh, some of our highest demands, including family physicians um, who would serve in, in these hospitals as well. We've rolled out a new uh, new compensation uh, program, particularly for inpatient services and, uh, and emergency uh, services uh, as part of the master agreement. So that agreement was just signed in the fall. So we're hopeful as part of the recruitment that the health authority is doing, having a, a stronger compensation package will support communities uh, like uh, Richmond uh, area. Um, and on the nursing side, uh, as I've uh, mentioned, uh, we have uh, expanded uh, training opportunities uh, recently in Cape Breton with the intention that having uh, close to home uh, training uh, opportunities. Um, and uh, Richmond is uh, lucky in the sense that uh, uh, they have another nursing training program on the other side, uh, which would be in Anna Kanish at St. Evacs University. Um, and um, to give uh, the members some uh, optimism as to the, the uh, effects that the uh, recruitment efforts for the NSHA do work, uh, despite uh, very long-standing uh, uh, recruitment challenges for uh, qualified uh, RN nurses at uh, in, in Canso. Uh, my understanding is that uh, uh, recently they have uh, two or three uh, new nurses that uh, have expressed interest to sign up and 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 go to uh, that uh, community. So um, uh, you know, again, uh, hopefully as, as as a problem is addressed in one community, um, you know, those those efforts uh, can continue. And and again, it does show success that the, the recruitment team. The Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, does know what they're doing, but it is at a time when um, demand outstrips supply. So we're, it's a very competitive environment, and, and we're doing everything we can as a province to um, both grow our own uh, and uh, attract others to the province in, in, in all qualified health uh, professions. The Honourable Member for Cape, for Cape Breton Re Richmond. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Minister, for your response. Um, it's, uh, you know, this has been a long-standing uh, issue. I, I recognize that, uh, um, you know, programs and initiatives probably should have been in place 20 years ago. Um, I think that uh, whether or not uh, either side of the floor really wants to, um, to agree on that, uh, that's the reality of the situation. Um, so it really has put us and uh, the people in this province in, um, in, in a really difficult uh, situation. 
one of uh, the aspects of uh, the closures that are going on right now with uh, the Strait Richmond in particular is that the doctor that they do ha have on staff for the ER during the week, I mean, he's, he's working 96 hours already, um, so he's there basically on the weekdays and, uh, you know, he, he needs some time off just like the rest of us. So the problem is that we don't have any coverage on the weekends and we're short, so short of nurses basically, um, you know, to take shifts at St. Anne's that if something goes wrong, somebody gets sick or any of those things, then, you know, there's unexpected closures that happen there as well. So going back to the straight though, that period of time on weekends when uh, a physician is not available, uh, usually what happens, as I understand, that, you know, a physician uh, can come in on, on a locum but the amount that is being offered in compensation to a physician to be on call to come in uh, for an emergency at the straight is just, I, I couldn't believe it, uh, the, the small compensation that uh, these very highly trained professionals are being offered uh, in order to assure that the emergency room uh, stays open during those periods of time. So could the minister uh, please uh, let me know, like, uh, you know, is there anything being done to try to um, improve the conditions and the compensation for those doctors that we already have in my community in Cape Breton, Richmond, so that it makes it much more, um, you know, attractive to them to be able to keep themselves uh, on call uh, during that period of time when we don't have a full-time uh, physician on staff at the hospital. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess um, the member uh, noted, and, and, and I appreciate that she, she uh, uh, noted uh, one of those challenges uh, related to uh, remuneration, compensation uh, for physicians. Uh, that is something uh, we recognized in 2018 uh, as a province, uh, based upon feedback uh, going out and listening. That's why in March of 2018, we announced an almost $40 million uh, investment uh, targeted at uh, compensation increases uh, uh, and uh, incentives. Um, that investment that was uh, announced at that time was to bridge us uh, through the negotiation period um, in the uh, updated master agreement. Um, so while we would uh, legally uh, be entitled uh, to have uh, just continued to uh, fund physicians based upon the master agreement that had been in place, uh, we recognize the, the, the challenges and the concerns and listen to those physicians and their uh, bargaining agent, Doctors Nova Scotia, and we came up with an interim uh, increased investment of almost $40 million. Uh, that bridged then into our um, uh, 2019 uh, signed in, in the fall uh, master agreement. That master agreement uh, sees uh, increases targeted at some of our, our highest uh, vacancy or, or challenged uh, uh, physicians. That includes uh, family emergency, uh, family and emergency physicians, which would be most relevant uh, to the members uh, community um, who will be uh, increased uh, compensation through this uh, new agreement uh, to be the highest paid uh, physicians in Atlantic Canada. Um, based upon uh, this uh, agreement. Uh, that uh, makes us far more uh, competitive. Uh, I think uh, in addition to that, um, as we know, we have uh, locum uh, incentives and, and others that uh, are part of the uh, negotiations that uh, took place as well. Uh, so we've provided uh, in that uh, master agreement uh, increased uh, funding and supports uh, for uh, those um, physicians who uh, would be providing emergency to Department services, even on a, a locum or an interim uh, basis. Um, so uh, again, this was all done in, in, in feedback uh, from uh, physicians and their bargaining agent, Doctors Nova Scotia. Over 90 percent. Um, the percent that agreed on that. 
It was over 90%. Uh, I'm just uh, trying to think if it was as high as 96%, um, but it was definitely over 90% uh, voted in favour of this master agreement, recognising these significant investments uh, and, and particularly targeted investments in those areas of most need, like family physicians and emergency room uh, physicians, uh, in addition to some specialists, but they, they aren't relevant to the specific questions uh, the member raised. I recognise the member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you, Minister. So just to be clear, um, you know, it's, again, it's uh, uh, very positive that obviously in the master agreement 2019 that the ER physicians were looking at, you know, better remuneration. But the real problem, again, are the family physicians that are having to bridge the gap when those, uh, that one ER physician that we have, and uh, we're so thankful to have him, but if, you know, if something were to happen to him, then we be in real trouble. So again, I'd like to ask the minister just a really um, two basic questions. One would be, what does a, a family physician in uh, my area, the straight area, what are they uh, compensated as far as a locum? So this means, you know, the doctor's at home, he gets a car, he gets a call, he has to come into the ER uh, because there's, uh, there's, you know, been a car accident or some horrible situation. So he comes in and just on that call and then, you know, needs to return home. I'd like to know what the remuneration is for that. And I would also like to know if the remuneration for those locums are equal across all of the NHA or if we are in a, uh, a different compensation um, uh, kind of zone in, uh, in the strait. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I we're just uh, looking through uh, the materials to see if we, we have that uh, breakdown, um, uh, specifically uh, in the Richmond uh, area. Um, again, uh, I guess at the highest level, I can certainly articulate uh, to the member, uh, Madam Chair, that uh, the compensation uh, is governed by the uh, master agreement or the contract that was negotiated uh, by Doctors Nova Scotia on behalf of physicians. Uh, over 90% of physicians uh, uh, accepted uh, that master agreement, uh, which is a, a fairly significant uh, vote of confidence, I think, uh, in the final product that uh, was negotiated between government and um, the, the bargaining agent on behalf of physicians throughout uh, the province uh, in Nova Scotia. Um, that uh, investment, as I uh, responded in my uh, previous uh, response, uh, was... Um, was um, was was made um, uh, based upon input uh, feedback. It will lead to uh, being highest paid uh, emergency uh, doctor uh, rates. Uh, the locum, uh, I think, uh, the member might be um, in inquiring about uh, on call. Uh, I believe the uh, updated contract uh, moves the on call uh, compensation to uh, three hundred dollars uh, for a weekday and four hundred dollars for weekend uh, coverage. Uh, um, that uh, would be uh, the weekend requirement and then um, if uh, they're a fee-for-service uh, physician they would of course get paid uh, for the services delivered uh, in between um, that uh, three uh, and four hundred dollars would be uh, whether there was any uh, activity uh, performed uh, or not so uh, the on-call uh, stipend of four hundred dollars for the weekend uh, would be um, uh, whether there, were, there was a call or not and then and then fee-for-service obviously for the services uh, provided I recognize the member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm going to kind of move focus here to um, the fact that we've gotten some un unfortunate news and known it for a little while now that um, that we're going to be lo losing another two doctors. It always seems that we're doing, you know, two steps forward, one step back. Um, two incredible young physicians uh, that are located in Lordways. Um, 
and uh, you know we were very hopeful that we would be able to keep these positions for an extended period of time that they could uh, invest in the community um, and I know that circumstances uh, being what they are there's all kinds of circumstances why perhaps physicians will leave uh, for family situations or wanting to uh, take on positions elsewhere where perhaps they're uh, better compensated so uh, the numbers and I, I don't have them here in front of me but it was approximately uh, between 450 and 500 I think uh, people in uh, the straight area that kind of encompasses uh, a portion of my constituency in Cape Breton Richmond uh, that are without a family physician now, based on what we know for approximate uh, patient load uh, per physician, this is going to put uh, the area within Cape Breton Richmond and many people, I mean, it's not just uh, constituents in Lordways that utilize these services. It's it's all the constituents. They're driving from, um, you know, Almadam sometimes to go down to Lordways to be able to access uh, primary care. So, you know, again, and I know that you do have some programs in place, but when it comes to crises situations like this, where you have physicians who make a decision to leave um, within a certain period of notice, is there anything that the department has in place to be able to kind of take immediate action in trying to fill that gap because the amount of people that are going to be left without primary care is going to affect exactly what we're talking about with putting more pressure on the ERs, um, both on Almadam and in um, uh, Lower River. And so, you know, we're, we're increasing the problem there. And then the half, you know, the other, the other portion of the problem is that sometimes it's not open. So it's a very convoluted problem. And so what I would like to ask the minister is besides the investments that we know of is there any kind of more localized or perhaps uh, uh, any kind of partnerships between uh, local government or you know local community groups and the NSHA to really kind of jump on something like that when there's an urgency and I would say that this is an urgent situation uh, to try um, uh, to try and fill that gap as immediately as possible I'd like to remind the member to address the chair, speak through the chair, okay? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and, and uh, uh, I guess, you know, uh, welcome, welcome to my world in terms of the complexity and the challenges of, of, of uh, addressing these, these, uh, these types of situations that um, present themselves as, as part of the, uh, the ongoing challenges we have in, um, in um, Recruiting and, and, and maintaining, and, and uh, as the member said, in, in some instances we may just uh, establish a new uh, healthcare uh, professionals in, in, a, in an area, and, and, and the demand introduces itself in another uh, part of uh, the province and nearby community or, or elsewhere. Um, as far as the recruitment and the uh, collaboration uh, within uh, community environments, uh, certainly uh, that's a part of the, um, the, the community uh, program to help support and encourage uh, communities uh, with programs to um, uh, help with their promotion. That's through the Community Culture and Heritage uh, Department though, not, not through uh, Health and Wellness, um, to help support uh, the program. So they've had a couple of calls, I believe, uh, in the current fiscal year for uh, those grants to support uh, communities um, in uh in, in being able to establish and, and each community was able to tailor their proposals uh, for uh, the supports. Uh, um, I know um, I, I was at the announcements in, in Truro, Picto and, and uh, Anna Kanish. Um, to, I'm not sure if, if um, if uh, the Port Hawkesbury and, and Richmond uh, areas uh, had an application that was successful or not. Again, it was in the community uh, culture and heritage uh, portfolio, but um, in terms of having communities and having a connection, that was something we really focused on in the last year uh, to try to build and we look forward to continuing to build those um, connections into communities because we know that when the recruiting team is, is busy and they bring a prospective uh, healthcare professional to a community, um, having those linkages and connections, um, I know um, and in fact, it was my colleague, uh, um, the member for Claire Digby, um, 
um, even in the years uh, before I, I was appointed to this uh, portfolio, talked about uh, the efforts that were being made in his community and region um, to build that community advocacy piece. And, and uh, so I, I did uh, establish, uh, not quite as formalized as what uh, was done there, Madam Chair, but established uh, whenever the re a, a relationship with the local recruiter and said, whenever you br the, the recruiter brings a, a physician to town, if they want to pop in, meet, we invited the uh, representatives from both the municipality of the town and the county uh, to attend. Usually the warden and mayor uh, attend on behalf of their councils uh, or they send an, an alternative and, and we're able to provide that overview and oversight and, and it's really, the feedback is overwhelmingly positive from both the municipal representatives to get to know about a, a potential but also from the prospective uh, healthcare providers in, in having that those senior people within the community take the time out of their day uh, to go and show how welcome they, they are going to be. So those types of initiatives do take place. But that, that immediate, like that, that if it was an ability to do it more quickly, uh, it would be done. Um, the fact is, uh, we are uh, tied to the availability of the supply. The recruitment efforts are ongoing. The health authority and the recruitment teams know uh, the challenges. Uh, they're making every effort uh, to uh, attract uh, uh, those uh, physicians to uh, meet those uh, vacancies. One of the things, though, not, not in those immediate kind of, um, where there's a, an immediate uh, transition, uh, that takes place, but in areas, Madam Chair, where there's a, a seen to be a more of a chronic uh, issue and, and larger scale uh, for a long period of time, uh, we know in, in they have um, access uh, centers uh, set up uh, where their clinics essentially are access clinics, I guess the, the NSHA is calling them, where they do provide primary uh, health care services for those unattached patients in the region. Um, so if there's a more of a bit of a prolonged um, vacancy and uh, in the area with a large uh, demand, um, so we do have those set up uh, to support so that while you're on the wait list, uh, Madam Chair, um, you do have a, an, an entry point. It's, it's not an attached primary care, um, but it's the next best thing uh, for the interim. And once you get attached, you move out of that uh, clinic um, and are, are a primary care clinic uh, and then into others. So there are some new uh, models and new uh, initiatives that the NSHA has been developing and rolling out in, in some communities. So, um, but it's not quite that immediate, uh, you know, again, an ability to, to turnkey solve the, the issue of a physician retiring or uh, leaving a practice. Uh, I don't believe there's really a, a means, if there was a way to do that, Madam Chair, we would have had it filled before the physician actually completed uh, their term, so there would be a continuity of care for the, the, the residents. I recognize the member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for, uh, for your response, Minister. I, I, I speak about this uh, often to uh, some, some folks at home uh, with regard to we're out there trying to recruit physicians who have obviously grown up in other areas. If, um, you know, we're always welcoming, obviously, to newcomers in our area. Um, but we have so many young, brilliant minds that are within our school systems. Uh, there are kids that I know, um, and have one in mind in particular, that uh, is, is wanting so badly, is so intelligent, is wanting so badly to be going into medicine. And you just know because that child is from a certain socioeconomic background that their chances of being able to achieve that goal is, uh, it, it's not impossible, but it's going to be very difficult. And so here you have a child who already lives in the community, whose family, maybe extended family, Order. are time in the has, community. Oh. Time has lapsed. I recognize the honorable member for Halifax, Shabukto. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd like to invite the member for Cape Breton, Richmond, to continue to direct the discussion during the rest of the NDP's time. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm trying to regain my train of thought there. So I was speaking with regard to uh, children who are keen and have uh, the smarts, basically, to be able to get through a medical program. Uh, and we already have them invested in home. 
they want to stay home, they want to return home, they want to go and get an education, they want to become a physician, Madam Chair, but the chances of them doing so without assistance is going to be very difficult. So I, I guess, you know, when you look at it this way, uh, when you have somebody who's already invested in community, uh, maybe a young person, uh, maybe uh, you know somebody who's going to have to go away and come back, obviously, after they get educated. If you have somebody who already knows the community, knows the traditions, knows the culture, uh, maybe even actually speaks, I mean, I'm, I'm in an Acadian community or partially uh, an Acadian community, someone who even speaks the language, it's tremendously valuable that you don't have to really sell the uh, the extras to that individual. You don't have to sell the concept of community and what a great place it would be to live. Now I understand this is not an immediate uh, solution to the problem, but I always wonder why it is that we don't have a program available to young people where we're actually going in and recruiting our own children within our own school systems that we know want to go into medicine but just don't have, uh, you know, have to, well, I won't say they won't have the means, they just have so many barriers in place. Why are we not offering them uh, a helping hand up and really guaranteeing ourselves, I think, right from the get-go that we would probably be investing in future physicians that would, would stay, you know, would return and they would stay in the community that they were born in. So if the minister could uh, could maybe give me a, a bit of a response on that, Madam Chair, I'd, I'd appreciate it. The minister. Thank you, uh, thank you Madam Chair. I thank uh, the member for this important question. I think um, uh, I'm pleased to be able to uh, inform um, and, and uh, provide a little more details about the fact that we've already taken those steps, uh, Madam Chair. Um, we announced uh, in the summer uh, that we were expanding the, uh, that is the summer of 2019, Madam Chair, that we were expanding the Dalhousie uh, Medis Medical School uh, program. Uh, we had the capacity uh, in 2019-20 academic year to add four seats uh, to the, the medical school uh school program, um, and an additional 12 seats are going to be added in September of 2020 for a total of 16 additional uh, Nova Scotia medical uh, student uh, seats as part of uh, Dalhousie's medical school program. The other thing, and this is the part that I think uh, many people um, forget about that announcement, is that uh, the focus of those 16 new seats are to be uh, targeted towards uh, Nova Scotia rural uh, indigenous uh, and African Nova Scotian um, students. So uh, very much in line with the uh, suggestions uh, made by the member uh, to focus uh, on uh, individuals that may not uh, or that may be underrepresented in our medical community um, that uh, this uh, particular um, investment uh, meets that, that, that need and, uh, and uh, within the Dalhousie and the recruitment uh, programs and initiatives uh, efforts are, are certainly uh, looking at being able to make those connections upstream because it's easy for us to say that these seats are targeted um, and, and, uh, and, and the selection criteria will factor in those um, characteristics of rural African Nova Scotia and, and Mi'kmaq uh, students. However, um, if the students don't apply, if they don't see themselves as uh, being, um, for whatever reason, capable of, of, of meeting the academic uh, criterion, um, then um, it, it becomes a, a, a challenge. So there are efforts to also uh, ex expand that. Uh, the other thing to note, I think there's a, in some populations a misconception as to what the current enrollment of um, of uh, students that are in the Dalhousie Medical School. Uh, there seems to be a um, perception that we do not um do not fill those seats with Nova Scotia students. Uh, in fact, the vast majority uh, of the uh, students attending Dalhousie Medical School uh, are Nova Scotia uh, residents. Um, the very large uh, number of, of those students um, that uh, we are educating our own. Uh, it is unfortunate, however, that uh, not every Nova Scotian who is interested is able to um, get a, a seat uh, every year. Uh, and that's those are the stories that you hear. So. Um, 
um, it's not that someone uh, from a different country or a different province is taking the seat um, or to the extent that, uh, you know, in particular Prince Edward Island, but they pay for some seats uh, to be delivered here in, in uh, Halifax. Minister, uh, I ask that you do your concluding remarks and then do your resolution. Uh, well, I, I, I guess uh, I don't have a, a lot of concluding remarks, uh, but, I, uh, <laughs> well. um, but, I, but I do acknowledge the, uh, the intent uh, and, and particular time period that we have to um, have the, uh, the resolution uh, read. Uh, suffice to say, I hope that uh, answered uh, the member from Cape Breton Richmond's uh, question. Uh, if she'd like uh, to learn uh, more information about uh, the Dalhousie uh, Medical School, I'm sure uh, Dalhousie uh, Med Program, or she can reach out to the department, we can fill uh, that information in, uh, Madam Chair. Um, as uh, it relates, I do want to quickly acknowledge uh, the, the, the hard work of uh, the many health professionals uh, throughout the health system. Appreciate their support in program uh, delivery each and every day on behalf of Nova Scotians. As it relates to the budget, I want to thank all staff, those here with me, uh, the Deputy Minister and CFO for the Department of Health and Wellness, uh, but also all staff uh, that have been uh, working uh, um, extended hours to support uh, our efforts to answer the questions that the members of the Legislature have brought uh, to the floor as part of the uh, 20 hours on estimates debate. Not quite as long as last year, so it must uh, clearly show the positive progress we've been making in our health care uh, program. And with that, uh, Madam uh, Chair, uh, I would uh, like to move uh, the motion uh, E11 uh, that uh, it be resolved that a sum uh, not exceeding $4,822,637,000 be granted to the Lieutenant Governor to defray expenses in respect of the Department of Health and Wellness pursuant to the estimate. And I believe that is done in the exact time I needed to have it finished. Shall, in. shall, shall, the, shall the resolution stand? The resolution is stood. Order. Time is allotted for consideration of supply today has elapsed. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Move that the committee deny rise and report progress and beg leave to sit again. The motion is carried. The committee will now rise and report its business to the House. Order, please. The Chair of the Committee of the Whole House on Bills will now report that the Committee of the Whole House on Supply has met and made considerable progress and begs leave to sit again. Thank you very much. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. That concludes the government business for today. I move that the House now rise to meet again tomorrow, Wednesday, March 4th, 2020, between the hours of 1 p.m. and 11.59 p.m. Following the daily, oh sorry, following the daily routine in QP, uh, it is obviously opposition day, so uh, momentarily I will ask the PC House leader to call his party's business. Uh, after the official opposition business, government business will include the continuation of the Committee on Supply, second reading on Bill 243, Public Bill 243, as well as Private and Local 245. Uh, and also, with time permitting, third readings for bills 220, 221, 223, 225, 226, 227, 228, 230, and 232. The Honourable House Leader for the official opposition. Mr. Speaker, for opposition day tomorrow, we'll be calling bills for second reading. Bill number 241, an act to amend respecting the protection of communities, the Change of Name Act as well as Bill number 244, an act to amend the Education Act for mental health wellness kits. Motion is for the House to adjourn to rise again tomorrow, Wednesday, March the 4th, uh, between the hours of 1 p.m. and 11.59 p.m. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. <laughs> the motion is carried. The House stands adjourned till tomorrow at 1 p.m.